Derek walked to the stern alone in a stupor. He was a mess as Scarlet's cold words echoed in his mind. Derek, you have to remember you're just a singer I rescued from obscurity. I can make you a star, and I can bring you back down to Earth. Acting like a bully in front of me won't end well for you. Do you remember what happened to Dan Walton? Dan was once a big star who worked for Star Arts Media. At the height of his popularity, fans would line up from the housing district all the way to the historic district just to get tickets to see Dan Blondie Walton. For some reason, Dan had provoked Scarlet. After that, he went from a famous celebrity to a forgotten has-been. People said that he had to mooch off of a rich woman to survive. Once, when he hit rock bottom, he even had to perform on the street. Just as Scarlet said, she could make someone a star, and she could also bring them down as she pleased. After the night's incident, Derek's career prospects were no longer looking so bright. Then he started to worry about his career going downhill. When he thought about how he could end up like Dan, he panicked and went into denial. He thought, I won't go back to singing in bars. There's no way. Derek gripped the railing as tightly as he could. His thoughts were racing. It's all that girl's fault. She caused this. If I'm not having a good time, why should she get to? Derek was going crazy. He walked toward the bow with evil intentions. At the birthday gathering, it took Amy a lot of effort to get away from her enthusiastic classmates. But before she could catch her breath, she was surrounded by performers. They weren't fools. When they had seen Scarlett's attitude toward her, they realized there was an opportunity right in front of them. Someone who Scarlett was afraid of would be valuable to have as a friend. So, one entertainer after another enthusiastically introduced themselves to Amy. But the more they pestered her, the more uncomfortable she became. She was starting to regret coming to the party in the first place. The noisy crowd quieted down and collectively looked towards someone coming from the back. Amy noticed that Derek was smiling and walking over with a glass of wine in his hand. She said indifferently, What are you still doing here? Don't misunderstand. Don't misunderstand. Derek slowly raised his wine glass and smiled apologetically. I have thought about it, and I went too far earlier. I only came to apologize. Amy relaxed a little and said, There's no need. Please, just leave us alone. Don't be like that. I just want to make it up to you. He squeezed through the crowd to get closer to her. Please give me a chance to redeem myself. An ominous look came over him as he spoke. He slammed the rim of his wine glass against the railing. With a loud shatter, the glass broke and wine splashed all over. Go to hell, he yelled. Derek had a crazed look in his eyes. He took a swing at Amy's face with the broken glass. The surrounding people were shocked. There was no time to react, and Teddy was about ten feet away. Be careful, Aunt River yelled. She pushed Amy aside just in time. The jagged glass barely touched Amy's hair, scaring her stiff. Derek continued to wave the broken wine glass at her, but people had started reacting. They screamed and pushed as the scene turned into chaos. Some tried to grab the madman to hold him back, but he was in a rage, flailing the makeshift weapon around. Everyone was frightened and took a few steps back. Nobody wanted to get cut. In the midst of this chaos, Aunt River lost her footing and was accidentally pushed over the railing by the crowd. People only heard a scream and the sound of water splashing heavily from below. Aunt! Amy's face turned pale as she leaned over the railing and looked down. In the darkness, the surface of the water was silent. Somebody, save her! My aunt doesn't know how to swim! After she cried out, the deck became even more chaotic. Teddy slapped the glass out of Derek's hand when he wasn't looking. Without his weapon, he was quickly subdued and held down by several courageous partygoers. Aunt River was rescued within minutes, but her complexion had turned dark green and she appeared to be in a coma. Scarlet didn't know what to do when she arrived at the scene. Someone, call an ambulance, she cried out. She glared at Derek and then cried out again. Call someone, someone call for help. Amy's hands trembled as she pulled out her phone. Back in the housing district, in a coffee shop near the police department, Aiden and Lena Larson, who hadn't seen each other for a long time, were sitting at a table. They were going over some materials. Lena had already settled in as the housing district supervisor. It was said that her spotless resume and fine work would make her the most popular candidate to become the next mayor of Arkland City. To put an elite security team together, Lena asked Aiden for a favor. 
to assist the police department with personal training. The deal included sending some of the officers to the Shield's headquarters for martial arts training. The police department offered Aiden a stipend to cover his costs. He saw no harm in helping out, so he readily agreed. Lena had invited him to discuss the details of training. He was going over the schedule when his phone vibrated. He glanced at the number and dropped what he was doing. The call was from Amy. He knew his sister would only bother him if there was an emergency. He had a bad feeling as he answered the call. After a few words on the phone, he stood up and said to Lena, let's go over training some other time, and left with a look of concern on his face. What happened? She asked in surprise. She had never seen him react so strongly. Someone is looking for trouble, he said without turning to look back. Lena was worried. She called for him to wait and ran to ask what was the matter. Aiden had just started driving away when he noticed Officer Larson chasing him from the rearview mirror. He stopped his car and lowered the window. I'm sorry, but I can't finish our discussion. I need to go, he said, irritated. The officer quickly explained. Let me come with you. I might be able to help. Aiden realized that she was genuinely concerned and relented. All right, get in. She quickly sat in the passenger seat. Aiden revved up the engine of his car and started to speed, flying like a silver arrow toward the beach. Luckily, the coffee shop was not far from the cruise ship. Aiden spotted the ship docked at the beach in less than five minutes as he was driving over the speed limit. The passengers also noticed the silver car coming from the shore. Many of them recognized Aiden's car and quickly guessed who was driving up so quickly to the cruise ship. As soon as he got out of the car, he heard his sister's sobbing voice. Aiden! Aiden looked up and saw Amy standing by the railing, her face covered in tears. She anxiously shouted at him. I'll get someone to put the ladder out now. When the banquet had started, the crew staff had pulled up the ladder leading to the shore to prevent interlopers from sneaking onto the ship. But this meant that they would either need to have the ladder put back down or arrange for a lifeboat to bring anyone new on board. Aiden frowned and muttered, this is taking too long. He jumped directly into the water. The people watching him cried out in surprise. Is he actually going to swim the whole distance? Someone asked, but he's so far away. He should have waited for the ladder, someone else observed. None of them could understand what Aiden was thinking. Triggered Olympian-level swimming ability. Triggered effect. Activating the Universal Pride Lore Manuscript. Triggering the ability of the beginner-level water attribute. Thankfully, it was already nighttime, so no one noticed that he was actually walking on the sea, dashing toward the ship at lightning speed. Not a single drop of water touched his body thanks to his previous studies of the Universal Pride Lore Manuscript. Officer Larson barely had time to shout in surprise before she watched Aiden's figure disappear into the night. She could only stand helplessly on the shore, frustrated at being left behind. On the other side of the cruise ship, the staff were just beginning to lower the ladder. Suddenly, a hand grabbed onto the railing next to them, scaring them all. A few of the staff members screamed as they scrambled back, but it was just Aiden. He pulled himself over the rail and jumped onto the deck. How did he get here? One of the guests asked in confusion. They couldn't understand how he had reached the boat so quickly. Even more surprising was that he seemed to be completely dry despite having just emerged from the water. The guest looked down at his feet and discovered that his shoes were dry too. But Amy was too used to her brother doing strange things to worry too much about that. She grabbed his arm and dragged him to the other side of the deck. The guests and staff members jumped out of the way to clear a path for the pair. The moment Scarlett Sullivan saw him in the crowd, she stepped forward quickly to welcome him. Her face was fixed into a fake smile, but inwardly she was very worried. Oh no, why is he here? She thought. Mr. Dale, I had no idea you were here. Scarlett did her best to look charming. I'm Scarlett Sullivan of Star Arts. Do you remember me? Most people she spoke to were dazzled by her beauty, but Aiden was an exception. I don't remember you, no, he replied quickly. He was much too worried about Amy and his Aunt River to pay any attention to Scarlet. Scarlet clenched her jaw, thrown off by his dismissal. I'm very sorry about your aunt. May I? Aiden suddenly stopped and turned to glare at her. I don't have time for games right now. Leave me alone. The icy expression on his face left Scarlet in shock. She was so scared that her whole body started shaking. All she could do was nod. Aiden ignored her and continued to walk behind Amy. After he left, Scarlet touched her fast-beating heart in fear and gasped for air. Why have I never noticed before? He can be so scary, she realized. She had met him previously under strange circumstances when he had been dealing with Anthony Kay and Arthur Wiles. 
Aiden had still seemed like a teenager back then, but now he carried himself like a man. Everyone else in the crowd noticed how intimidated Scarlet was by Aiden and became even more afraid of him. Aiden saw Aunt River lying on the deck almost straight away. Teddy was vigilantly standing guard over her, not allowing anyone else to get close. Isidore, on the other hand, was kneeling on the ground. She was very worried and kept touching Aunt River's forehead, trying to check on her condition. When the girls saw Aiden approach, they couldn't help but let out a sigh of relief. He rushed to his aunt's side, looked at her green face, and put his hand on her wrist. An invisible aura entered her body as Aiden activated his miraculous revival abilities to assess her condition. But during his assessment, he realized that River's meridians were arranged differently than everyone else in their family. Although it was not a big difference, he felt quite surprised as he noticed that her energy and blood circulated separately. Usually the two systems were combined, but in River they operated independently. This made healing her a more complex undertaking than he had anticipated. The seawater that had entered his aunt's lungs was affecting her blood flow and energy flow. But because there were two separate systems, he was able to harness her energy flow to help him with the healing process. Thanks to Aiden's ability, the seawater was quickly dissolved and removed from her system. Her face was still quite blue from lack of oxygen, but Aiden was confident that she would recover in no time. Now that she was out of immediate danger, he used his discerning ability to try to better understand her internal makeup. The proficient level discerning ability was triggered. Analysis successful. Aiden's eyes widened as he reviewed the information he had just learned about his aunt. How did I never notice this? He thought. In the past, Aiden had been able to analyze people with strange auras or abilities. Strange and powerful old masters like Billy Barton and Jesse Evans, or even people with strong wills and intellect like Governor Mo Masterson, had their own unique aura. Aunt River was nothing like those men, but something about her was still odd. As he considered this, Aiden suddenly remembered something his grandfather had told him, something related to the origin of Aunt River's name. Back then, Aiden's grandfather, Owen, was not on good terms with his father. On top of that, his eldest aunt, Charlotte, got married at a young age. Owen then lived alone in Langley. But one day, the other townspeople discovered that he had picked up a baby girl. He claimed that he had found the baby in the stream around the back of town, so he called her River. However, Owen had later shared a secret with Aiden. He explained that when he picked up the baby, she had only been wrapped in a small dress with no other clothes to protect her. But even though he had rescued her from the stream, she had not been wet, and her dress had been completely dry. When Owen picked her up, he was so surprised that he laughed. When he had first heard this story, Aiden had thought that his grandfather had made it up. But after what had just happened, it seemed that his grandfather had not been lying after all. Aunt River was indeed different from ordinary people. Aiden was very curious to know more about River's background, but he knew it wasn't the right time to poke about her body with his medical skills. He didn't want to accidentally ruin her recovery, so instead, he quietly sat and waited for her to wake up. Less than five minutes later, Aunt River opened her eyes in confusion and tried to suppress a cough. Aunt River? Amy and Aiden said while helping her sit up. Aunt River frowned in confusion. Aiden? What are you doing here? Amy let out a long sigh of relief. You scared me to death, she said, hugging her aunt tightly. I'm glad that you're feeling better, Aiden calmly said before his tone changed. But now, it's time to settle some debts. The bystanders near them felt the atmosphere change and started to shiver. Aiden turned to Amy and said in a low voice, Please explain clearly what happened here. Amy seemed to gain energy from his presence. She angrily started telling him everything Derek Wayne had done. Her retelling of the situation was slightly exaggerated and made Derek sound like the greatest villain in history. Derek Wayne, Aiden repeated in his head. He was so tense and angry that the veins on his forehead stood out. He walked back across the deck and found Scarlet. Where is he? Scarlet already knew exactly who he was looking for. My men have him under control. He's tied up there. She pointed at the corner of the deck. Aiden saw a young man tied to the railing by a rope, shouting and cursing. Let go of me! I'm the famous Derek Wayne! I want to kill her! Amy and Scarlet, I'm going to kill them! I'm a big star! I can do whatever I want! His expression was mixed with madness, pain, laughter, and tears. None of the other staff or guests dared to approach him. It was confusing and horrifying to see such a famous young man behave in such a way. They wondered if he had truly lost his mind. A pair of white shoes suddenly appeared in front of Derek. He stopped shouting and blankly stared at the young man in front of him. Who are you? 
Oh, I know, you must be here to help me get free, right? He said excited. Aiden just stared at him. Activating the proficient level mind reading ability. The target's main emotion composition is made of the following. Disguise, 92.82%. Panic, 4.3%. Rage, 1.76%. Target type, actor with poor acting skills and singer with ordinary singing skills. Target specialty, beginner level acting skills. Threat level, extremely low. Target's weakness, every part of his body is a weakness. Activating Grandmaster level medical arts ability. The target's mind is normal, with no signs of mental illness. The corner of Aiden's mouth curled into a weird smile. Judging from the series of data, Derek was pretending to be crazy to try to escape punishment. Since you want to be crazy, I'll let you experience what it means to be crazy, said Aiden. He quietly untied the rope that was binding Derek to the railing. Hey, don't do anything stupid, he's not in his right mind, some kind-hearted witnesses reminded him. What's your name, bro? I'll definitely repay you when the time comes, Derek excitedly said to Aiden. However, he suddenly realized that something was wrong with his body. Although Aiden had untied the rope from the railing, he hadn't untied Derek's hands. On top of that, Aiden had also looped the rope around his body, leaving a long trail of rope. What are you doing? Derek asked anxiously. Aiden stayed silent. People gasped as he lifted the end of the rope with one hand and swung it hard. With a cry of pain, Derek was thrown through the air into the sea. Help! Help! He screamed. It was his second plunge into the icy water that day. Although he knew how to swim, his hands and feet were tied up. He couldn't move in the water at all. Derek forgot about pretending to act crazy and started screaming for help. Aiden watched him with a wicked smile on his face. Eventually, he grabbed the rope and pulled him to the railing. What's the matter, big star? Why aren't you acting anymore? He sneered. Derek coughed the seawater out of his mouth and looked at Aiden in shock and terror. You're a demon, he yelled angrily. It doesn't feel like you've learned anything yet, Aiden observed. I guess I'd better try again. Aiden loosened his grip on the rope and let Derek fall into the sea yet again. After waiting a couple of minutes, Aiden lifted him up again. He repeated this process several times. Under the night sky, Derek's miserable screams were a continuous echo. The other people on the ship watched this in horror. They felt like they were watching a devil in action. One of the other artists from Derek's agency, Sienna Ferguson, was particularly frightened. She had a good relationship with Derek and hated to see him being hurt. She bit her lip in fear and took her phone out with shaking hands. Hello, police, someone is going to die here. Sienna whispered into her phone as she watched Aiden immerse Derek into the sea again. Her face was pale. She continued with a trembling voice. Yes, that's right. We're on the cruise ship. Please hurry or something bad is going to happen. Aiden heard the whole conversation, which made him smirk. Thanks to his advanced medical abilities, he wasn't worried that he would accidentally kill Derek. No matter how badly Derek was tortured, Aiden was confident he could save him. But this was definitely the worst punishment he had ever inflicted on someone. Repeating torture. Torture ability, plus one. Target will be on the verge of collapse. Destruction ability, plus one. Current progress, one out of ten. Current level, beginner level. When Aiden lifted Derek up for the 20th time, the people around him were paralyzed in fear. They all knew that no matter what the reason was, they should never offend him. Scarlet wiped the cold sweat from her palms as her body shook in fear. She had thought that her own methods could be quite ruthless, but clearly she was nothing compared to Aiden. It was the first time in a long time she had felt so afraid of someone. I must find out who works for him later, she thought. She didn't want to anger him in the future. Derek's face was swollen from the seawater as if he had been stung by a bee. He was almost unable to open his eyes. He asked in a weak voice, Who are you? Aiden looked indifferent and replied, You don't deserve to know. He loosened his grip on the rope again and Derek fell into the sea once more. As he fell, Derek screamed, You're evil! His screams could be heard from far away. Officer Larson, who was still on the shore, raised her eyebrows when she heard the screams. Although she couldn't see what was happening on the ship, she knew Aiden was probably responsible for the chaos. Then she heard the approaching sound of an alarm and dazzling lights lit up the night sky. The officer looked at the police car approaching from the road and frowned. On the deck, Sienna's expression changed. She rushed to the railing and waved at the police car. Other people were also attracted by all the noise coming from the shore. 
Aiden stopped and quietly looked at Scarlet, who was also in shock. She immediately waved her hand and yelled, We didn't report any incident! Derek seemed to have recovered his spirit and used his last bit of strength to shout, Save me! The police car stopped and two police officers came out it with serious expressions on their faces. They were about to run toward the cruise ship when they noticed another figure standing on the shore and came to a halt. Because Officer Larson and Aiden had been discussing official business, Officer Larson was still in uniform. When the other two officers noticed the bright metal on her chest, their expressions changed. Officer Larson? One asked. She glanced at them and waved her hand. I'm on the case. You can go back to the station. All right, then, they said respectfully. They jumped in their car and went back the way they came. Derek roared in despair as he watched the police drive away. No, please help me. Aiden grinned as he watched the police drive away. While Derek was still desperately screaming, he threw him into the sea again. Off to the side, Sienna turned pale. She didn't understand why the police had left so quickly. Maybe they went to call for backup? She wondered. She still wanted to try to stop Aiden, so she dialed 911 again. Not long after, the police came back, but this time they had two cars. However, the same thing happened again. When the officers noticed the figure standing on the shore, they all turned around and drove away without a backwards glance. Sienna finally understood that they weren't going to help. She then noticed that Aiden was staring at her. When she caught his eye, he gave her a wicked grin. This was his doing all along, she realized. A chill went through her entire body as she realized there was nothing she could do. The phone dropped from her numb fingers and fell to the floor. All she could do was listen to Derek's weakening screams as Aiden continued to punish him for attacking his sister and friends. Finally, Derek was too tired to scream anymore. Aiden swung the rope with all his strength and threw him onto the deck like a bag of garbage. Derek lay on the deck, twitching helplessly. He had learned a lesson he would never forget. Aiden was finally satisfied. He looked around and walked straight towards Scarlet. The bystanders still gathered around the scene shivered in fear and fled. Scarlet's heart was beating fast. Her lips were dry as she said, Mr. Dale, is there anything I can do? Aiden looked at her calmly, as if he hadn't just exerted himself to punish Derek. He indicated Amy and the others with his chin. They're my family. He didn't say anything else, but Scarlet knew what he meant. She clenched her jaw, took a deep breath, and announced, From today onwards, Derek Wayne, Sienna Ferguson, Jack Taylor, and Julia Black's agreements with Star Arts are immediately terminated. They're forbidden from participating in any performance related to Star Arts. The artists she had mentioned were all friends with Derek and had also harassed Amy. Scarlett's words carried extra meaning. Not only was she kicking them out of the entertainment industry, but she was also banning them for life from having careers in the arts. From now on, if any other company would dare to sign them, they would be making an enemy of Star Arts. There wasn't one single company with that kind of courage in the region. Simply put, the artist's journeys toward fame were over. When they heard the announcement, their faces turned pale. Miss Sullivan, I was wrong, please forgive me, one said. Please give me another chance, another one cried. Derek ordered us to do what we did, Jack added. They all knelt in front of Scarlet and begged her desperately for mercy. Everybody couldn't help but feel a little pity for the ruined artists, but it was also incredible to see such powerful people brought so low so quickly. Who is powerful enough to change a person's life in just a few minutes? They wondered. They looked at Aiden, proudly standing to the side, and realized they already knew the answer. No matter how much the former celebrities begged, Scarlet remained unmoved. The bodyguards had to intervene and drag them out of the cruise ship. That was Officer Larson's opportunity to finally get on the cruise ship. Scarlet was shocked when she realized that the other officers had left the scene because of Officer Larson. She hadn't realized that Aiden had such an important figure acting on his behalf. As she watched the easy way they spoke to one another, Scarlet wondered how such a friendship had developed. Because of all the chaos, Martha's birthday banquet had to end early but she didn't seem too bothered by the trouble. Instead, she looked at Aiden with curiosity. She was used to seeing her mother's ruthless attitude, but she had never seen someone give her mother orders before. On top of that, Aiden was close to her in age. She suddenly recalled that Aiden was Amy's older brother. She looked at Amy and pulled her to the side to whisper in her ear. Mr. Dale, are you satisfied with the support here? Asked Scarlet. 
She glanced at Officer Larson beside Aiden and added with a smile, If you're not satisfied, I can offer some extra assistance. Officer Larson eyed her warily. She found Scarlet's overhelpfulness highly suspicious. She wondered if there were any other illicit activities on the cruise ship that the woman might be trying to hide. Aiden was annoyed as well. He could tell Scarlet was trying to get back on his good side, but he wasn't in the mood to play games. Don't worry, we're finished here, Aiden replied. Scarlet was frustrated. She was trying to find ways to curry favor with Aiden, but he wasn't responding the way she wanted him to. But Aiden knew that most of the trouble that night had been from Derek, not Scarlet. Since he had already taken care of Derek, he wasn't interested in making trouble for anyone else. He glanced at Martha, who was still whispering to Amy on the side and throwing odd glances at him. He found he was suddenly curious. Please tell me if this is a weird question, but is Martha really your daughter? You two seem close in age. Scarlet tossed her hair back, pleased at the comment. So you're saying I look young, huh? Flatterer. Anyway, her father is out of the picture and, well, it's a long story. Aiden shrugged. All right, it's just you two look like sisters. <laughs> Officer Larson laughed abruptly. When Aiden gave her a surprised look, she couldn't help but snort. Aiden, that sounded like a pickup line out of a movie from the 80s. Aiden blushed. I didn't mean it like that. But Scarlet seemed amused. Hey, I can take a compliment. Soon it was time to leave. Aiden insisted on driving Amy and the others home himself. They piled into the back of his car, exhausted. Before he drove away, he noticed that Officer Larson had an odd look on her face. When he asked if she was all right, she sighed. I don't know. Just be careful around Scarlet. I don't know what to make of her. Although Aiden considered the matter to be finished, Scarlet seemed to be worried that there were loose ends to tie up. She kept sending him messages suggesting things she could do to help him. Finally, Aiden got annoyed and blocked her number. A week later, it was finally time to go to the National Medical Association Conference. Apart from Aiden, Anita Grayson, and Jenna Shu, Jonathan also decided to ask two other members to join. One was a middle-aged man, and the other one was a young man. The middle-aged man was called Tyson Stiller. He wore thick glasses and seemed friendly. As a more senior doctor of the Arkland City Medical Association, he had already participated in the conference many times before. Aiden figured that Jonathan was worried about him being overwhelmed leading the team for the first time, so he had arranged to have an older, more experienced doctor there to help him. The young man was called Garrett Slater. He'd only joined the team the previous month. He came from a medical family and had an extremely strong background in medicine. He was humble and eager to learn, which was very good for the team. Jonathan had specially picked him because he knew Garrett would make excellent use of the opportunity to develop. Not only did Garrett not look down on Aiden, despite being older, but he actively admired him. He kept asking him questions about medicine. Aiden quickly took a liking to him, so he patiently answered his questions. As a result, the others would often see Garrett holding a notebook and attentively listening to Aiden. The group boarded a plane from Arkland City and landed in the morning in Newark, to the west of New York City. From there, they would drive out to Abundance, New Jersey, where the conference was going to be held. Although New York City itself was a great location for a conference, Abundance was known for its wilderness, which was full of fantastic medicinal herbs. As the little town had good open access outdoor venues, everyone had agreed it would be much more pleasant to have the conference there than in the city. It was said that a famous old herbalist named Peter Eternal had found and used thousands of herbs in Abundance, New Jersey and brewed them into medical remedies. Therefore, Abundance was regarded as something like a spiritual destination for doctors who still saw the value of herbal remedies. Every year, countless of them would come to admire the glory of the old town. Fortunately, shuttles were arranged to receive the doctors of the association and the others who were participating in the meeting from the airport in New York. This saved Aiden and his colleagues the trouble of finding one. Anita looked thoughtful as she sat on the shuttle. Aiden suddenly remembered that he hadn't asked her the exact location of her hometown, he only knew that it was a very small place somewhere near Abundance. When he asked, she nodded slowly. Yes, Little Nook is close to here, and Rex must be somewhere around here too. Rex? Who is that? The other members of the group asked. They were also interested in learning more about Anita's background. She moved her lips but didn't say anything, as if she was having a hard time gathering her thoughts. However, the shuttle driver overheard them and quickly jumped in. Rex is one of those wild mountain people. There's a huge mountain behind Little Nook called the Verdant Plains. A mountain? But plains are flat, 
Jenna chimed in, confused. The driver shrugged. Some old joke, I guess. It's steep and shrouded by a gloomy green fog all year round. When people try to climb it, they can't see anything more than five meters away. A few years ago, someone said that there were wild people in the verdant plains, which attracted a lot of curious tourists. However, the folks in the Little Nook didn't like that. They made it their business to chase everyone off, saying they were going to upset Rex. Said it was bad luck or something, but I think that Rex is just a barbarian. They were probably trying to protect the tourists from getting attacked, the driver said with confidence. His last comments seemed to finally awake Anita out of her reverie. Rex is not a barbarian. He's a friend of Little Nook, she shouted. The driver looked at her in the rearview mirror and frowned. I think he's a madman, he muttered, but fine. If you say that he's your friend, then he's your friend. Anita was still sulking, but the driver's story had only made Aiden more curious. He decided he would try to ask Anita very nicely for a tour of Little Nook after the conference. While he was still lost in thought, the bus finally arrived in abundance. The entire town looked only blue and white from the outside, with blue bricks and white walls. It was very lively, with an endless stream of people coming and going. Aiden also noticed many luxurious cars parked outside the town. The previous years, a lot of famous doctors had come to the conference. Because of this, many people with severe or uncommon illnesses had traveled from miles around to conference, hoping to find a good doctor who could treat their illness. The cars presumably belonged to those seeking medical treatment, and because cars were not allowed inside the town, they had to park them on the outskirts. According to the conference's schedule, the official competition would not start until the next day. Since they had arrived earlier, everyone planned to take a stroll around the market where all the herbalists sold their wares. The streets were filled with stalls, all of them offering all kinds of medicinal herbs. Many doctors from the other associations were wandering through the streets. The entire town was filled with a faint medicinal fragrance, and the people walking through the market felt refreshed. Not long after Aiden and the others had started walking around, a group of people rushed in front of them. They were dressed in ordinary clothes and had tanned skin as if they had been exposed to the sun all year round. They held small bags and opened them in front of Aiden and his colleagues. Hello, guys. Do you want to take a look at our white thistle? One asked. We have the best licorice root in town, and ours is the best price. Look at mine, another one shouted. Tyson quietly sighed and explained to the others. It's always like this. These are the herbalists. Tyson explained the origin of the herbalist to everyone. They made a living by planting and picking herbs. They sold what they cultivated to doctors who came to visit Abundance. There are three different kinds of herbalists around here. The first type includes those who have a fixed livelihood thanks to their shops. They sell ordinary medicinal herbs, which are slightly expensive. However, they are guaranteed to be authentic, so what you're paying for there is quality. The second type includes the ones in front of us. These herbalists usually go out into the wild to pick wild herbs, so the product is relatively fresh. However, they're not always to be trusted. Some will just take your money, give you a bad product, and then disappear. The third type of herbalist are the ones with the stalls. The quality there is mixed. Sometimes you can get very lucky and pick a real treasure from their stock for a great price. It's a bit like gambling. But if you find out you picked something substandard, you can't just return it, understand? While Tyson ran through this description, the herbalist who had first come up to harry their group became discouraged and wandered away in search of other customers. Tyson nudged Aiden and pointed at the stalls. With your skills, you're likely to have success at the stalls. Aiden nodded. He hadn't expected abundance to be such a complicated place. He quickly swept over the stalls before him with a sharp-eyed gaze. Activating proficient level medicinal knowledge. Identify the quality of the medicinal herbs. According to the ability settings, the quality of the medicinal herbs is divided into D, C, B, A, and S. For herbs that cannot be identified, the system will evaluate them with unconfirmed error. Grade B medicinal ingredient, 9 fragrance, insect. Current quality, 32%. There has been a degeneration within. Aiden shook his head in disgust and continued to look down at the stalls. D grade medicinal herb aloe vera was found. Current quality, 93%. Quality, fresh. Since it was such a common plant, Aiden instantly lost interest. He walked around the stalls for some time. He didn't discover any particularly good herbs, but he took the opportunity to improve his ability to identify the plants. When they finally reached the town center, Aiden's eyes suddenly lit up as he looked at a seemingly ordinary herb. Grade A medicinal herb, tiger eargrass, has been discovered. 
Current quality, 98%. Aiden couldn't believe that the herb was in such good condition. He beckoned the others over to the stall. The owner was a fierce-looking middle-aged man. He noticed his guest and glanced at them. He impatiently said, I'm a small business and I display my prices. I don't bargain, okay? Aiden looked at the price of the tiger ear grass and was shocked to see it was only $2.14 per gram. He was secretly delighted. The herb was very ordinary looking. He figured the stall owner didn't recognize them for what they really were and probably thought that they were common medicinal herbs. He must have randomly marked a price without thinking about it too much. But Aiden knew the herb could be sold for over $42 per gram. Since the stall owner had been so brisk, Aiden decided to take advantage of the situation. Pointing at the large pile of tiger eargrass, he said, I'll take all of these, sir. At that moment, an unfamiliar voice came from the other side and also said, I want all of these. Aiden's heart skipped a beat. Did someone else notice? He thought. Aiden turned around and looked at the tall young man who had spoken. He was wearing a white physician's coat and the purple rose pattern on the chest pocket was very striking. I saw that same pattern just a little while ago in Arkland City. He thought as he squinted at the doctor's name tag, which identified him as Marcus Gilpin from the New York City Medical Association. And what exactly are you staring at, you country oaf? The doctor asked derisively, giving Aiden a scathing look. Turning to the herbalist, he ordered imperiously, Hurry up! I need those blanks. Tyson had told Aiden and the others about these so-called blanks, which was a code word that herbalists used when they weren't able to differentiate specific medicinal herbs. Until the herbs went through a professional appraisal, nobody knew the value of these blanks. On the East Coast alone, there were more than 10,000 medicinal herbs, and many herbalists lacked the knowledge to identify them properly. Because money could be made with the right herb, people collected plants haphazardly and brought them to the nearest pharmacy to sell, where an herbalist would set a rough price based on the appearance of the blanks. Whether a physician bought top-grade or substandard herbs, or maybe even weeds, depending on the doctor's personal knowledge or just plain luck. Gambling on blanks was very popular in the Eternal City, where a rare and valuable medicinal plant like the tiger eargrass could be sold as an ordinary blank by an herbalist who didn't know any better. Aiden watched as Marcus Gilpin set his sights on a particular blank and looked inquiringly at the herbalist. It's $250 in cash, the man said evenly, his expression serious. Tommy, go ahead and pay him, Marcus ordered impatiently, and Aiden noticed a skinny short man standing behind the doctor. He was so slight that he was easily overshadowed by Marcus's height. Right away, Dr. Gilpin, Tommy replied as he picked up his phone and scanned the two-dimensional code on the receipt that the herbalist had placed on the counter. Judging from the interactions between the two men, Aiden guessed that Tommy was Marcus's apprentice. Just then, someone slapped the doctor hard on the shoulder. He spun around angrily, only to see a slight young man who was glaring at him. Who are you calling a country oaf, you conceited beanpoles? Garrett snapped, not showing any fear in the face of the doctor's anger. Aiden was startled by Garrett's outburst. He hadn't known Garrett long, but the young man had come across as being very gentle and soft-spoken. Marcus looked Garrett up and down and then dismissed him out of hand despite the white coat he was wearing. Tapping the purple rose on his chest pocket, he smiled derisively and said in a scathing tone, "'How about you come back when you've made it to my level, you amateur? You're just like your buddy, a nobody from the outskirts of Philadelphia. You're not even an intermediate-level doctor yet.' Aiden looked more closely at the insignia on Marcus's code and noticed two silver five-pointed stars embroidered on the edge of the purple rose pattern. He knew that there were different levels that physicians could achieve as they moved from apprentice to junior to intermediate and finally to senior. Beyond the senior level was the specialist category, which was hard to attain. Even Dr. Winston, the vice chairman of the New York City Medical Association, had only achieved senior level. I guess it's impressive that he's reached the intermediate level at such a young age, Aiden thought, but that still doesn't give him the right to be so condescending. To achieve the junior level certification, a doctor only needed to have basic medical skills. But to reach the senior level, they needed to pass strict tests and be able to write advanced prescriptions. Rumor had it that Dr. Winston had qualified as a senior physician by writing and preparing five perfect formulations. None of the members of the Arkland City Medical Association had been certified at any level because they were all too inexperienced, so they were no different from ordinary apprentices. Only Tyson had the relevant experience but he had no interest in such window dressing. With their doctor's coats lacking any kind of insignia, 
Aiden wasn't surprised that Marcus looked down on him and his friends. Garrett was livid and looked like he wanted to say more, but Tyson held him back. In a low voice, he advised, Don't pick a fight you can't win. Right now, we're better off not offending the New York Medical Association. It'll do us more harm than good. Garrett looked unconvinced, but he stepped back and Jenna pulled him aside with a small smile. Don't worry about getting even, Garrett, she said. Someone else will stand up for you. When he looked at her, confused, she nodded her head in Aiden's direction and added, He doesn't tolerate his friends getting mistreated, so just wait and see what happens next. Just then, the herbalist said impatiently, If you guys want to fight, do it outside. I can't have your disagreements affecting my business. Aiden nodded apologetically and then pointed at the tiger ear grass and the blank. Could you tell me how much for both? I'd like to buy them. $125 total, the herbalist replied. Aiden picked up his phone and was about to pay when Marcus interjected with a curt laugh. A country oath with poor eyesight is spending over a hundred bucks on that pile of trash? Trying to flatter him, Tommy quickly nodded. After all, not everyone has your excellent eyesight and herbal knowledge, sir. Marcus smiled at the sycophantic compliment and raised his head higher, but Garrett and the others got even more annoyed. They looked at Aiden expectantly to see what he would do, but he didn't seem angry at all. He calmly paid for the herb bundles and then said to Marcus, So you don't think these herbs here are more valuable than the ones you're holding? Marcus burst into laughter. Are you seriously asking me if my herbs are worth less than yours? Are you too stupid to do math or do you think I'm an idiot? The latter, of course. Aiden replied with an indifferent shrug. You bastard! Marcus roared angrily. He pulled up his sleeves as if readying himself for a fight. Hey, you two, that's enough! The herbalist interjected. Looking at Aiden, he asked, I take it you think I've made a mistake in pricing these herbs, but I've been doing this for a very long time and I'm completely confident that my pricing is correct. Listen to him, you fool! Marcus snarled contemptuously. What more proof do you need? Activating proficiency level medicinal knowledge. Discovering B-grade medicinal herb black feather root. Current progress, 88%. Glancing at the herbs in Marcus's hand, Aiden smiled and said, Let's make a bet, Dr. Gilpin, if you dare. Let's bet on which of these herbs is more valuable, based on an analysis by the formulation decoder. The loser not only has to hand over their herbs to the winner, but he also has to go out on the street and shout three times, I'm an idiot! What do you say? Activating proficiency level provocation ability. Marcus had looked down on the crew from the Arkland City Medical Association from the beginning and didn't need much coaxing to agree to Aiden's suggestion. Loudly, he declared, Why wouldn't I dare to accept your ridiculous bet? Looking around, he noticed a formulation decoder behind the herbalist's counter and pointed at it excitedly. There's what we need to settle this bet. It'll tell us right away whose herbs are the best. Aiden nodded and walked over to the decoder alongside Marcus while the others followed. Garrett, who was at the back, turned to Tyson and asked anxiously, Isn't he being a bit overconfident? Tyson shook his head and replied, Because you just joined the association a little while ago, you haven't gotten to know our vice chairman yet, and I can tell you that you don't need to worry. He never does anything unless he's fully confident that it'll work. Anita agreed. This bet is as good as one. She added with a smile as she looked at the herb bundles. Jenna nodded while she examined the decoder. She knew that it could justify any herb or formulation known to exist, and it could also assess the compatibility of different formulations. A machine like this cost a small fortune, which is why most herbalists didn't have one. Only those pharmacies frequented by doctors of a medical association had enough cash flow to invest in a decoder. The herbalists nodded deferentially at Marcus, being well aware of the meaning of the crest on his white coat. Dr. Gilpin, you can go right ahead just as soon as I've collected the appraisal fee, he said, motioning at the decoder. Like most people in abundance, he had a great deal of respect for intermediate and senior level doctors, but he still wanted to get paid. Marcus glared at him and snapped. What do you mean pay the fee? My medical association pays a monthly fee for any appraisal required by one of its doctors so I'm not going to pay again. The herbalist blanched and nodded. Of course, Dr. Gilpin, my mistake. You can proceed whenever you're ready, he demurred hastily. Then, he remembered Aiden and looked at him questioningly. Aiden smiled and said agreeably, since the appraisal fee has been paid by Dr. Gilpin's association, he should go first, of course. Marcus looked at him coldly and replied, it's about time you learned some manners. 
It would have been better for everyone if you had been this tactful right from the start. Then he handed the herbs to Tommy and ordered, Take them to the decoder and start the analysis. Let's broaden the horizons of these yokels. Tommy carefully took a small sample from the blank and placed it into the testing tray. A red scanning light slowly swept across the herb as the analysis results appeared on the screen. Scan complete, current herb, black feather root, occurrence, mid and southwest portions of the east coast, function, warming and cooling, digestion, replenishing energy. When Marcus saw the three words, black feather root, his eyes lit up. Aha! I knew it! He exclaimed triumphantly. This is a rare herb indeed! Tommy agreed emphatically. Yes, sir. You really have an excellent eye for herbs, picking up this treasure from the pile. Marcus uttered a satisfied laugh and turned to the herbalist. Check the market price for black feather root and let everyone know what it is, he demanded while glancing at Aiden disdainfully. The herbalist quickly typed the name of the herb into his computer and scanned the result before printing out a sheet with some numbers. He handed it to Marcus and said, I found it. Here is the price breakdown. Based on the current market value for black feather root, your bundle is worth about $200. The smile on Marcus's face froze. How much? He asked in a strangled tone. $200, the herbalist replied, articulating each word. Is something wrong, Dr. Gilpin? He added nervously, noting the pale color on Marcus's face. Meanwhile, Jenna, Garrett, and the others covered their mouths to stifle their laughs. Everything is fine. Marcus croaked, trying to force a smile. I've just spent $250 on an herb that's only worth $200, he thought angrily. I can't believe I'm out $50 and these oafs are laughing at me behind my back. But we'll see who has the last laugh. With that thought, he turned to Aiden and said, Well, let's see what you bought. Go ahead and put it into the decoder already. Aiden wasn't surprised by the results of the analysis, having already figured out that Marcus's herb was black feather root. Calmly, he placed a piece of the tiger ear grass into the tray and activated the machine. The red light scanned the material as the results popped up on the monitor. Scan complete. Current herb. Tiger ear grass. Occurrence. Southeast portion of the east coast. Function. Clearing of bowels. Cooling. Detoxifying blood. When the herbalist saw the name of the herb, his eyes lit up and he exclaimed excitedly, Wow! A detoxification herb! What a rarity! Frantically, he typed the name into the computer and checked the listings as he muttered. We sold a bundle like this last year, and I remember that it went for $5,000 then. It'll definitely be worth a lot more now. He looked at Aiden and asked pleadingly, Is there any chance that you'll sell this herb back to me? I'll make it worth your while. I'll give you twelve, no, fourteen hundred dollars for the bundle. Fourteen hundred dollars? Are you crazy? Marcus yelled, his eyes almost popping out of his head. The herbalist was too excited to take offense at Marcus's rudeness. He just looked at him dismissively and replied, I'm not crazy at all. This herb is worth its weight in gold. Over the last few years, more and more people have gone into the verdant plains to gather rare herbs, but a lot of them don't know what they're doing, and they are getting poisoned. As it happens, tiger eargrass is the best antidote on the market, and there are hundreds of folks clambering for it. I could sell pounds of it every week, but there is no inventory. Marcus was stunned when he heard the herbalist's explanation, and he immediately thought of the legend of Rex in the verdant plains. Aiden was also surprised. He had known that the tiger eargrass was valuable, but he hadn't expected it to be related to the verdant plains. If that's the case, I'll have to hang on to it, he thought, frowning and shaking his head at the herbalist. Sorry, but I'm not interested in selling what I have, he said and watched as the man's face dropped. Well, he made money on the black feather root he thought, but he knew that the herbalist was dismayed at the loss of the tiger eargrass. There was no question as to who had won the bet, and Marcus knew it as well. His face was dark as he turned to Tommy and said curtly, Let's go. Our business here is finished. He cast a cold look at Aiden and his friends and said over his shoulder, Consider yourselves lucky, you yokels. Just as he was about to leave, Tyson and Garrett stepped forward to block the door. Smiling coldly, Garrett asked, Dr. Gilpin, aren't you forgetting something? Jenna also chimed in. It looks like the physicians of the New York City Medical Association don't keep their promises. If this gets out, it'll be very embarrassing for your association. Marcus's face turned beet red and he stammered. What? No, no, I, I didn't forget. 
Hastily, he tossed the bundle of black feather root at Aiden and stomped out the door where he roared. I'm an idiot! I'm an idiot! I'm an idiot! His loud voice reverberated inside the pharmacy where everyone was desperately trying to hold back their laughter. Passerby looked at Marcus in shock and surprise, and his face was so red it almost looked purple. Marcus turned around and looked at Aiden and his friends, his expression livid. Is that good enough? He asked acidly. When Tyson and Garrett nodded, he turned on his heel and left with Tommy in tow. As soon as he was gone, everyone in the shop burst into laughter. Garrett was the happiest of the bunch, and he smiled at Aiden gratefully. Now I finally understand why everyone has so much faith in him, he thought, filled with admiration. The herbalist looked confused because he had thought until then that Aiden and Marcus were part of the same association. Okay, now that we've got what we've came for, let's go and explore the town, Aiden suggested as he put away the tiger ear grass and the black feather root he had won. Everyone nodded and they left the pharmacy to take a walk around town. Meanwhile, in a dark alley not far from the pharmacy, Marcus was fuming with anger. He punched the wall hard and yelled, Damn it! I can't believe I got humiliated like that by these country bumpkins! How infuriating! Tommy looked at him consideringly for a moment and then proposed, You know, there may be a way for us to get even with them. Oh, what are you thinking? Marcus asked curiously and Tommy smiled deviously. Well, before I became a physician's apprentice... I had some experience in other lines of work, so to speak. I may be able to get those herbs back from that Aiden guy without him noticing, he replied. Marcus's eyes lit up. You would steal them? He clarified. Not entirely ethical, but sure, go ahead. I just want to see that arrogant kid be put in his place. Tommy nodded and slipped out of the alley like a shadow. By then... Aiden and his friends had walked from the south of the town to the east side where there was a huge open-air market that sold a large selection of medicinal herbs. There were many farmer and merchant stands selling everything from common garden herbs to high-grade medicinal formulations. The market square was packed as people milled about and the atmosphere was lively. Suddenly, Aiden felt like he was being watched. Detecting covert surveillance. Danger detection ability plus one. Current progress, 10%. Current level, Beginner. Activating beginner level crisis detection ability. Activating beginner level anti reconnaissance ability. Activating proficiency level hearing ability. Aiden's eyes flashed coldly and he lunged to the side, grabbing onto something the others couldn't see. A blood curdling scream rocked the square, and people looked around in shock. The crowd around Aiden's friends dispersed quickly as merchants and customers alike eyed the group warily. Before long, they were standing by themselves except for Aiden who was holding onto the arm of a skinny young man. His grip was so strong that the young man's arm had gone pale from lack of circulation, and he was crying with pain. His face was starting to turn white, and he looked like he was going to faint. Hey, isn't that Tommy, Marcus's apprentice? Garrett noted, glaring at the young man. What does he want from you, Aiden? Aiden glared at Tommy, who looked miserable and snarled. He stole my herbs and was just about to take off when I caught him. His words ignited more anger in Garrett and he burst out. That loser! Let me at him! I'll make sure he gives them back! Tommy gritted his teeth in the face of these accusations and retorted desperately. I didn't steal anything! You're trying to frame me! Just then, there was a commotion as a group of burly men holding batons pushed their way through the crowd. There were about ten of them and they looked ready to break up the altercation using force. Tyson's face darkened at the sight of them and he whispered in Aiden's ear. That's the security force for the New York City Medical Association. They're responsible for keeping the peace, and we don't want to get on the wrong side of them. I've heard they're not shy about using those batons. Move along, move along, one of the men called out, trying to disperse the onlookers. He was a big man with a beard who looked as intimidating as the rest of the team. Confidently, he strode up to Aiden and ordered coldly, Let him go. Aiden frowned and replied, This guy is a thief. We can't just let him go. The man's gaze turned to ice as he retorted sharply. I'm the head of the security force, Captain Norman Ledger. Whether he's a thief is up to us to determine, not you. You'll let him go now, and you'll also stop trying to break his arm. He glanced down at the iron grip with which Aiden was still holding Tommy's arm and shook his head in disbelief. I've been the captain of the security force for a long time, but I've never seen anyone as strong as this kid, he thought. Aiden eased his hold slightly, but he still didn't let go. Meeting the captain's stern gaze, he asserted, 
I'm not letting go until he tells me where my herbs are. Norman's face turned red with anger, but before he could say anything, there was a shout from within the crowd. Tommy! Marcus exclaimed as he strode forward and stepped up to his apprentice. Feigning worry, he asked, Tommy, where have you been? I sent you to the market to buy those herbs ages ago. Why didn't you come back right away like I told you? Tommy looked at him with a pained expression and replied, Sir, this person suddenly attacked me and has accused me of stealing his medicinal herbs. Marcus acted as if he had just become aware of Aiden and said with mock surprise, Oh, it's you guys again. When he noticed Norman's confusion, he quickly added, These folks caused some trouble for us earlier, and it seems like they're still holding a grudge. It looks like this kid took the opportunity to frame my apprentice as an act of revenge. I know Tommy very well, and he would never do anything like this. That kid is lying and slandering people. As he spoke, Marcus turned intentionally so that the physician's crest on his coat was clearly visible to Norman. When the captain saw the two silver pentagram stars, his eyes narrowed and he nodded at Marcus imperceptibly. He waved to his men who walked up and surrounded Aiden. Sir, if you don't let go of this man, we'll use force to make you, Norman threatened. Ah, I see now that this was all planned, Aiden replied coldly and turned to Tommy. Did you know that people who are guilty do all kinds of things that betray them? He asked evenly. His voice was quiet, but it sounded like thunder in Tommy's ears. He panicked and his eyes darted back and forth. There, you see? You keep on looking at Marcus, hoping that'll bail you out. That's the fourth time you've looked at him in the last few seconds. Aiden pointed out as the corners of his mouth twitched. Having thrown Tommy off balance, he reached out quickly and grabbed the front of his coat. Aiden had grabbed a patch on the front of the coat that was inconspicuous and quite ordinary looking. It didn't seem to be made of a different material than the rest of the coat, but as soon as he touched it, Tommy flinched and looked scared. In a smooth motion, Aiden ripped off the patch, and to everyone's surprise, there was a hidden pocket behind it. As the fabric tore open, several herb bundles tumbled out, including the packages of tiger ear grass and black feather root. Excited murmurs rippled through the crowd that soon swelled into an uproar of indignation. Marcus's expression turned grim, and a fleeting moment of panic crossed his face. Aiden smiled as he picked the herb bundles off the ground. Would you look at that, he commented casually. My tiger ear herb and black feather root. Turning to Norman, he asked calmly, Captain Ledger, what do you say to this? Norman looked embarrassed. He glared at Marcus and inquired curtly, What's going on here? Marcus hesitated for a second and then replied, Isn't it obvious? These are the herbs I asked Tommy to buy at the market. Clearly, he did as he was told, and now he's being accused of having stolen them. Before Norman could respond, Aiden pointed at Tommy's chest and interjected. If you bought them, why do you need to hide them in a secret compartment in your coat? Because they're expensive, and he was trying to keep them safe, Marcus explained quickly before Tommy had a chance to open his mouth. He was starting to look more and more anxious, with cold sweat beating on his forehead and his mouth drawn in a hard line. Aiden's mouth twitched as if he was trying to suppress a smile. Looking intently at Tommy, he asked, If that's the case, how about you show me and the others where you bought these herbs? His question hung in the air as everyone waited for a response, but Marcus and Tommy were momentarily speechless. Aiden could see that Marcus's mind was racing, trying to figure out how he could convince the herbalist to pretend that he had sold Tommy the herbs without anyone in the audience noticing. Based on his increasingly despondent facial expression, Aiden guessed that Marcus knew he had painted himself into a corner. After a brief, uncomfortable silence, Norman walked up to Marcus and yelled in his face, I can't believe you fabricated this entire story and made fools of the security force. Men, detain these two for theft and disturbing the peace. The security guards were about to handcuff Marcus when he shouted anxiously, Don't arrest me! This has nothing to do with me! It was all Tommy's doing! As he spoke, he stared coldly at his apprentice, whose face dropped when he realized he had been sold out. Nevertheless, he nodded and admitted bitterly, Yes, he's right. It was all my idea. I'm sorry. Norman frowned and told the guards, Fine, just take the young man then. He didn't want to get on the wrong side of an intermediate level physician, and he was relieved that he didn't have to arrest Marcus after all. What will happen to him? Aiden asked, wanting to make sure that Tommy was properly disciplined. Just leave that to us. Norman replied brusquely. We have procedures for this kind of crime, and there will be an appropriate penalty. What kind of penalty? Aiden insisted, not letting the matter go. 
Norman rolled his eyes impatiently and retorted, Like I said, we have penalties for theft. Now just let it drop, will you? Aiden nodded and asked with a slight smile, Does the penalty involve making a substantial donation to the security force, perhaps in cash? Aiden's insinuation that Tommy would bribe his way out of the situation made the onlookers laugh, but it also served to tarnish the reputation of Norman and the security force. Maybe he's right. Maybe these guys can't be trusted, someone in the crowd muttered, and several others agreed. Seeing the distrustful glances around him, Norman got angry and shouted, How dare you imply something like that! This man will be penalized by being barred from the association for the rest of his life. He will never become a physician, and he will be forbidden to do any kind of business inside Abundance, New Jersey. I see, Aiden said with satisfaction, letting go of Tommy's arm. When he heard Norman's words, Tommy looked utterly defeated. He just stood there as if in a daze, his mind completely blank. He felt like all of his dreams had been shattered in an instant. At one point in his life, he had been a thief for a living, stealing valuable medicinal herbs and selling them on the black market for a good price. As he had started to make connections with different herbalists and eventually with physicians, he had imagined a brighter future for himself. When Marcus had accepted him as an apprentice, it was like a dream come true. He bid farewell to his career as a thief and concentrated on becoming the best apprentice he could be, trying his utmost to please Marcus. But now, I've lost everything, he thought, tears welling up in his eyes. And it's not fair. I don't deserve this. He stared at Marcus, resentment building in his chest. If it wasn't for him, I would have never had to steal those herbs in the first place, he thought as anger seethed inside of him. And then he threw me under the bus and ruined my life. Now he just gets to walk away and still be a physician, whereas I'm finished. Tommy's fury devoured every last bit of his rationality and overwhelmed his self-control. With a roar, he lunged at Marcus and knocked him down. This is all your fault! He yelled while grabbing his neck and throttling him fiercely. You told me to steal those herbs, you liar! You should be the one losing your physician's license! Marcus was caught completely off guard by the attack. He gasped and choked as Tommy cut off his air supply and clawed desperately at the vice-like hands around his neck. Seeing Marcus's distress, everyone started talking at once, but no one had the courage to intervene. I knew it! It was the physician who put his apprentice up to this. One of the spectators commented. But how is that possible? His friend wondered. You're talking about an intermediate level physician here. Why would he behave so poorly? Norman's mood had gone from bad to worse. He had been prepared to let Marcus go, but in the face of Tommy's accusations and Aiden's evidence, he couldn't save face unless he had Marcus arrested as well. Otherwise, nobody will trust the security force anymore, he thought as he watched the two men wrestling on the ground. All right, that's enough. He yelled. Guards, break up this fight and arrest both of these men. On his command, several security guards stepped forward and used their batons to separate Tommy and Marcus. In short order, both of them had been handcuffed and were being led away. Norman scowled at Aiden, who just smiled placidly. The smile annoyed Norman even more. If it weren't for this kid, my day would have been a lot easier, he thought, massaging his temples. Now I have a splitting headache and a lot of paperwork. What's your name, kid? He asked curtly. It's Aiden Dale, he replied calmly. Aiden Dale. I'll remember that name, Norman replied with a stony expression. I hope we'll meet again someday. Then he motioned to the rest of his team, and together, they walked out of the marketplace. Tyson watched them leave with a worried expression. Turning to Aiden, he said, I don't think you've made a friend in this Captain Ledger. Maybe you were a bit too impulsive. No, I think Aiden did the right thing, Garrett objected, disagreeing with Tyson. He showed up that arrogant doctor and made sure the apprentice learned a lesson. If those two have any brains at all, they won't bother us again. Aiden didn't take sides in his friend's disagreement and just smiled noncommittally. I'm not one of those people who needs to weigh all the pros and cons before I act, he thought. I do what I think is best, and if someone causes me grief... I won't hesitate to put them in their place. Anyway, Marcus, Tommy, and Norman are just lackeys. I need to find out who's behind all of this. That's the person I need to deal with. I hope that my actions will get the attention of the right person, he told Tyson. And if that person continues to provoke me, they'll be in for some serious trouble. He looked at the retreating backs of the security force. 
I'm sure Captain Ledger will report back to whoever sent him. When people realized that there was no more excitement to be had, everyone dispersed in short order. Only a few remained behind, including the vendors and farmers who had stands nearby. Suddenly, Aiden felt a prickling at the back of his neck, and he spun around to see an old herbalist staring at him. The man was at least 65, with a thick mop of white hair that was crowned by a wide-brimmed hat. The man's face was deeply tanned, and he had a slight stoop that made him look older than he probably was. While his appearance was ordinary, Aiden was struck by his eyes, which were sparkling with amusement. I wonder what he wants, he thought as he walked straight toward the herbalist. The headquarters of the security force were only a mile north of the market, and it didn't take them long to reach the three-story building. Norman had his men escort Marcus and Tommy directly to interrogation rooms when they arrived. Lock them up separately, he ordered, waving his hand impatiently before he sat down at his desk to make a few phone calls. A few minutes later, an expensive black car pulled up in front of the headquarters and a middle-aged man in a white physician's coat got out of the vehicle. Three golden pentagram stars were embroidered next to the purple roses on the chest pocket, identifying the man as a senior-level doctor. If Aiden and his friends had been around, they would have recognized him as Dr. Newt Winston, the vice chairman of the New York City Medical Association. Norman got out of his chair when the doctor entered his office and shook his hand. Thanks for coming so quickly, Dr. Winston, he said deferentially. Please come right this way. He led the way to one of the interrogation rooms and the physician followed. Meanwhile, in the interrogation room, Marcus was suffering. He had been provided with good food and something to drink, but he wasn't in the mood for any of it. His face was contorted with anger as he massaged the tense muscles in his neck where Tommy had grabbed him. That bastard, he muttered just as the door of the interrogation room opened and Dr. Winston walked in. Norman nodded at him and quietly closed the door, leaving the two men alone. Newt Winston glared at Marcus, and instead of a greeting, he snarled, You fool! Why on earth did you provoke that kid and get into an altercation that you couldn't possibly win? Before Marcus had a chance to reply, he continued, If I hadn't found out about the trouble you were in and asked Captain Ledger to save your hide, your license would have been suspended, and you would have lost the right to practice. Judging from his uncle's tone, Marcus deduced that Newt had known Aiden for a while and had felt it necessary to intervene. While it irked him to admit it, he was grateful for the help, and he tried to calm his uncle down by being deferential. Don't be angry with me, Uncle Newt, he wheedled. At least now you know just how strong that Aiden kid is, which is worth something. His deferential, obsequious behavior at that moment was completely different from the arrogant, overconfident man he portrayed at other times. Dr. Winston's tone softened a little, but he still admonished Marcus further. I should have known that you don't have the capacity to deal with a situation like that. Marcus frowned at his dismissive comment, but he schooled his face and replied, I didn't expect the kid to be so skilled given how young he is. It was a mistake to underestimate him, Newt scolded. Even the folks he has taught can defeat me when we are face to face, so he is not someone to test on a whim. Just when Marcus thought his uncle was done, Newt asked with concern, He didn't figure out that we're related, did he? No. He definitely didn't, Marcus assured him with a confident smile. I have pretty good acting skills, and I'm sure he thought that I was just your average physician. He also didn't guess that Captain Ledger was being paid by you. That's something, I suppose, Dr. Winston conceded and sighed. Now tell me how your preparations are going. Are you sure you'll be able to beat him in the competition tomorrow? Marcus's face froze as he recalled Aiden's skill and excellent herbal knowledge. Seeing his reaction, Newt felt that he had his answer. He sighed again and said, Yes, I could see that defeating Aiden is beyond you. We'll have to rely on Rex then. Lowering his voice, he added, How is Rex handling it anyway? Marcus patted his uncle on the shoulder and assured him, Everything is ready, including Rex. Aiden is in for a big surprise tomorrow. Let's hope so, Dr. Winston emphasized. The outcome of this competition will have implications for my position as vice chair of the New York City Medical Association and it will also affect my chances of becoming chairman. That means there can't be any mistakes. Is that clear? Crystal clear, Uncle Newt, Marcus replied confidently. I've got this. Meanwhile, back at the market, Aiden wasn't looking at the herbs, wondering instead why the herbalist kept staring at him. Finally, he asked jokingly, Do I have something on my face? Is that why you keep looking at me? The herbalist, 
who was an elderly man with a sharp, intelligent gaze, smiled broadly at him and replied, Kid, I've been watching you for longer than you can guess. The herbalist's voice was deep and authoritative. Normally, it caused people to panic, but to Aiden, it was like a light, refreshing breeze. He wasn't affected by the voice at all, and he smiled at the old man. How long have you been watching me? He asked. The old man pointed in the direction of the town's entrance. As soon as you entered the town. The smile on Aiden's face suddenly disappeared. He looked around, his steely gaze focusing on a few people around them. Are these your spies? He asked softly. Who are you? Why are you following me? The herbalist wasn't surprised by Aiden's accusatory tone. He only glanced at Aiden and said admiringly, You have quite a pair of eyes. You're very different from the average person. If you wanted, you could probably see through all the vendors and their lies. This entire town would go bankrupt because of you. Aiden narrowed his eyes. He couldn't sense any malice in the herbalist's words, but he didn't like the strange old man either. I have no ulterior motives, the old man asserted, seeming to have seen through Aiden's coldness. I'll just get straight to the point. I have a proposition for you. Sorry, I'm not interested. Aiden turned around to leave. Have you ever heard of the Verdant Plains? Aiden stopped in his tracks, but he kept his back to the old man. The old man stroked his beard and smiled confidently. I assume that you would want to go to the Verdant Plains as well. If that's really the case, meet me here tonight at 11.30. Aiden didn't tell the others about his conversation with the old man and continued to casually lead them around the town. The day passed quickly, and by the end of it, with Aiden's help, Tyson and the others had found some valuable herbs at a low price, which made them incredibly happy. After sunset, the town was shrouded in darkness. The organizers of the meeting had already arranged for Aiden and the others to stay at an inn in the north of the town. It had a traditional and quite outdated exterior, but the inside was decorated modernly. It reminded Aiden of the few nights he spent in the Temple of the Five Elements. There was a lull over the town at 11.30. Abundance wasn't as lively in the evening as it was during the day, and no one was out. Most were at home, getting rest and replenishing their energy for the next day's competition. There was no way anyone with any sense would be lurking in dark corners at this time of night, and yet there were three figures silently standing at the entrance of the market in the east of town. The old man that Aiden had spoken to that day leaned against a wall with his eyes closed. To his left, a handsome and slight young man was quickly pacing up and down the street. Richie, is the person you talked about coming or not? He asked impatiently. If we don't leave now, we won't get there on time. We need to go. Opposite the old man stood a beautiful middle-aged woman in a blue dress. Her long black hair was tied up with a simple jade hairpin, and there was no makeup on her refined face. Don't be anxious, sweetheart, don't be anxious, she said in a gentle voice. If Richie says that his guy will come, he'll come. You know the old man has never been wrong. Let's just wait a little longer. Her gentle voice didn't relieve the young man's restlessness in the slightest. Instead, he rolled his eyes. How many times have I told you to stop doing that? Don't call me sweetheart. You're always talking to me as if I were your child. To the two of us, you are just a child. We don't think you're ever going to grow up. She covered her mouth and laughed, attracting a dissatisfied stare from the young man. Stop arguing. He's here. The old man who was leaning against the wall suddenly opened his eyes and looked at the town entrance. A figure came out from around the corner and gracefully walked toward them. It seemed to blend into the darkness, so it was difficult for the other two to see it at first. As the figure soundlessly approached them, the young man froze suddenly, a quizzical look on his face. The woman showed great interest, though, and started to smile. He's definitely no ordinary man. The figure walked closer and closer until finally Aiden's face was revealed under the dim light of the street lamp. Well, you didn't disappoint me. The old man lifted his hat and nodded slightly at Aiden. My name is Caleb Richter. You can call me Richie like these two. He pointed at the young man and said, This is Sailor Bentine. Don't mind his yelling. He has a short temper. You hear that? Sailor immediately blurted out. His eyes were blazing. I'm not someone you want to mess with, so don't push me. But Aiden barely glanced at him. He couldn't care less about Sailor, which made him feel embarrassed. 
He rubbed the back of his neck awkwardly and muttered, Strange. Very strange. You're really not afraid of me. Aiden then looked at the woman in the blue dress who Caleb introduced next. This is Deb Tailby. Deb stretched out her fair hand and smiled softly. Nice to meet you. Aiden returned the handshake. My name's Aiden Dale. I'm from Philadelphia. Huh, Philadelphia. Do you happen to know old Jonathan Shue? Sayla interrupted from the side. His eyes widened as he stared. Aiden, who had been about to ask Deb a question, turned to face Sailor and gave him a hard smack on the back of the head. You rude brat, don't interrupt me! Sailor stomped his foot angrily and was about to complain to Caleb, but he was silenced by a glare. Stop messing around, Caleb commanded before he looked down at the old watch on his wrist. Then he fixed his eyes on Aiden. Listen to me first. Time is of the essence, so I'll cut right to the chase. I'm certain you've heard of Rex in the Verdant Plains already so I won't repeat the story. However, other than Rex, there is also word of a poppy in the plains. People typically think that it's referring to the poppy flower, which has many medicinal uses, but it's not medicine we're after. Poppy is a person. We know that she lives in the mountains, and we think that she's Rex's leader. That's the reason why I invited you here tonight. I want you to come to the verdant plains with us to track down Poppy. Aiden blinked a few times and quickly digested the information. He tilted his head and asked, Why now? We've received intel about where Poppy will be in the early hours of the morning. Sailor chimed in. The more Aiden ignored him, the more he wanted to talk. Aiden ignored him again, though, his eyes only on Caleb. I have one last question, he asked slowly, quietly activating his mind-reading ability. Why did you choose me? I told you about it earlier today. Caleb's brow wrinkled, and his eyes were serious. Since you've shown up, I can tell you frankly now. The verdant plains are covered by a poisonous mist, as well as poisonous herbs and flowers that grow all over the ground. To be honest, Deb, Sailor, and I are all in danger. This isn't the first time we've entered the mountain. Every time we went, we were forced back by overpowering poisonous plants. So I've been looking for someone who can identify the poisonous weeds and help us navigate our way to the mountain. Activating proficient level mind reading ability. Target's mental state shows sincerity at 94% and anxiety at 5%. It appeared that Caleb was reliable. However, Aiden was still indifferent. I'm not selfless and I'm definitely not a saint. I won't do anything without a reason or for free. Setting foot on that mountain is extremely dangerous. Caleb smiled knowingly. We can give you a great treasure after we're done. Also, Anything else you obtain in the plains will belong to you, and all you have to do is guide us up the mountain. He gestured at Deb as he spoke. She nodded and then carefully took out a flower from a small pouch tied around her waist. Aiden had never seen such a strange flower before. It had a total of three petals, each gold, silver, and purple, respectively. As soon as the flower was taken out of the pouch, it emitted a fragrance of orchids and musk, a strong scent that caused them all to feel awake and refreshed. Activating proficient level medical knowledge. Analysis of the object is 94% complete. Object is a class S medicinal herb, the rainbow blossom. Aiden narrowed his eyes. Although he didn't know the specific effects of the medicinal herb in front of him, just the fact that it was an S rank herb was enough to attract his interest. After spending the entire day in abundance, all he and the others had managed to obtain was a class A herb, the tiger eargrass. I presume that with your ability, you can already see how valuable this is, can't you? Caleb and the others looked at Aiden carefully, assessing his reaction. Aiden didn't show any emotion, though. It's the rainbow blossom, he answered quietly. Its power and quality are adequate. Sailor gritted his teeth and Deb shook her head. We risked our lives to get this. I would think it would be more than adequate in your eyes, Sailor said bitterly. Caleb's eyes twinkled and he simply laughed. If you help us find Poppy... This treasure will be yours. As he spoke to Aiden, Sailor hurriedly told Deb to put the flower back into its pouch. You know this thing can't be exposed for too long, Deb. It's fine, she said dismissively. It'll be Aiden sooner or later anyway. It's fine if he looks at it for a few minutes longer. Sailor scoffed. Does he really have the ability to earn it? Let's not get ahead of ourselves. It's still too early to come to any conclusions. Aiden suddenly smiled and glanced at Sailor's unconvinced expression. Bentine, do you want to make a bet with me? What do you want to bet? It's very simple. 
Aiden squinted his eyes. If I can help you get to Poppy, you must give me another herb of the same class as the Rainbow Blossom. Same class? Sailor's brow furrowed. Oh, is there a problem? Are you scared you're going to lose, Bentine? Aiden had a playful look on his face. What are you talking about? Sailor became enraged. There's no problem here, but what if you lose? If I lose, then I'll give you something worth the same value as the Rainbow Blossom. Sailor agreed excitedly to the offer. Okay, I'll take the bet. Caleb and Deb looked at each other and shook their heads sympathetically. Sailor, who had always been reckless, seemed to have finally met his match. With that said, Aiden accepted the task. In the middle of the night, the three of them walked out of abundance. In the parking lot outside the town, a camouflaged off-road vehicle was waiting for them. Its wide body and domineering wheels were intimidating, but enticing at the same time. Sailor raced ahead so quickly that Aiden thought he was heading to the driver's seat, but instead he hopped into the back. He caught the stunned look on Aiden's face and angrily responded, I want to drive, but Deb never lets me. You? No way. She sat in the driver's seat and started the car. You seem to have forgotten last time when you drove the car into a ditch. You were crying and screaming for help. You were like a little helpless. Stop! Don't say anything else! Sailor's face was red. Let's just get to the planes now. We don't want to be too late. Aiden smirked and settled into his seat. Deb's driving style was the complete opposite of her calm and gentle demeanor. The off-road vehicle bounced and sped at an alarming pace down the road like a steel monster on a rampage. She had no intention of slowing down and, in fact, seemed to drive even faster as time passed. Caleb was used to Deb's driving, and he calmly sat in the passenger seat with his eyes closed as he rested. Sailor, on the other hand, had his eyes shut tightly, and he gripped the door handle as his face paled. Aiden, though, showed no signs of discomfort. Instead, he stared leisurely out the window at the night sky. His calmness surprised Deb and Caleb, who each took turns glancing at him from the rearview mirror throughout the drive. About ten minutes after they had left Abundance, the car stopped at the side of the road, where there were already a few other cars parked. Deb scowled at the cars. It looks like we're not the only ones who received that intel. Caleb looked at his watch. The road to the mountains is uneven and cars can't drive up it. There's no time to lose. Let's hurry up. We need to get up the mountain. He looked at his watch once again and then led them up the road. They struggled along the road, which was overrun with weeds and jagged stones. After a few minutes, they spotted faint lights ahead of them, and soon after, they could vaguely hear voices. Caleb made a shushing gesture and led the others away from the road in front of them into a small path covered with weeds. Once the lights had disappeared completely, he began to talk. Those people just now are from Little Nook. They're patrolling the area, he said, answering the unspoken question on Aiden's lips. He explained that the path they were walking on led to the largest road to the Verdant Plains and was usually guarded by the people from Little Nook. The road had been highlighted in the intelligence report and would allow them to bypass the people on patrol. It would be a difficult journey, but it would be better for them to avoid any confrontations. Aiden was reminded of the bus driver's words and Anita's strange behavior. What's the difference between Little Nook and the Verdant Plains? He asked curiously. They still had some time, so Caleb took a moment to explain the history between Little Nook and the Verdant Plains. About 35 years ago, the people of Abundance suddenly discovered a mountain outside the town shrouded in green mist. The original name of the mountain has been forgotten, so everyone refers to this area as the Verdant Plains. Many curious people went up the mountain to find out where the green mist had come from. However, when they arrived at the mountainside of the plains, they came across a mysterious small town. This was Little Nook. The people from Abundance were sure that the town had never been there before. It seemed to have appeared with the mountain. At first, the townsfolk didn't stop people from going up the mountain. Those who entered the Verdant Plains found that the mist was poisonous and were forced to retreat. For decades, the Verdant Plain was considered a dangerous place, and no one dared explore it again. Everyone was safe and sound. Recently, there's been evidence of people living in the mountains. Once this news spread, it sparked another wave of exploration from people all over, including the doctors from the New York Association of Medicine. They've set their eyes on the verdant plains and wrecks. For some inexplicable reason, 
Rex is a source of great interest to the doctors in New York City. Group after group has traveled here to enter the Verdant Plains. Compared to ordinary explorers, these doctors have many ways to deal with the poisonous mist. Just last month, there were rumors that they had captured Rex and transported him out of the Verdant Plains. Ever since, the folks in Little Nook have gone mad and prevented anyone from getting anywhere near the mountain. They have people patrolling the mountain path 24 hours a day. Aiden was still confused. Well, what does the New York City Medical Association want with Rex? Isn't it obvious? Sailor said disdainfully. It's clear because they have their eyes on Rex's special physique. He roams freely and completely unaffected in the poisonous mist all year round. There's a rumor that his blood can be refined into a pill that will make whoever consumes it immune to all poisons in the medical world, whether they're modern or ancient. That is why they captured Rex. Caleb sighed. The New York City Medical Association has become radical in its medical practices over the past few years. They don't follow the more peaceful approach toward medicine that the rest of us do. Aiden sneered. So you've come all this way to take Rex's leader, this poppy woman. Isn't that just as disgusting as the actions of the New Yorkers? You misunderstand us, Deb replied with a smile. We deduce that Poppy is highly intelligent. We've come here intending to cooperate with her. Caleb nodded in agreement. Furthermore, the mist is spreading in all directions. If it continues, abundance will soon be hit. We figure she knows how we can stop the mist and save abundance and the world. Aiden was silent but a hint of respect flashed in his eyes as he looked at the three of them as they continued up the mountain. The people of Abundance had no idea what these three were doing. They wouldn't receive any recognition or thanks if the poisonous mist was cleared, and yet they were still willing to set foot in such a dangerous place without hesitation. They made their way up the mountain just before dawn. Caleb suddenly stopped in his tracks, signaling for the others to follow. Their faces were solemn, their eyes hard as they looked around. Aiden stopped and scanned his surroundings with sharp eyes. There was a forest in the distance and wisps of green mist rose from it and began to spread across the ground. The mist coiled around the flowers and plants, penetrating the stems, branches, and petals and making everything look green. The sound of crickets chirping had been loud, but now the mountain was completely silent. They would need to enter the mist if they wanted to complete their journey to the verdant plains. Deb, Caleb said softly. Understood. She took out four brown pills from the other pouch around her waist, distributing them to everyone. These are anti-poison pills we developed to deal with the green mist, she explained to Aiden. They can protect us from the poison, but only temporarily. If we stay in the green mist for too long, the pill will lose its effectiveness. Caleb looked at his watch and said in a deep voice, Within an hour, we must find Poppy and get out of the verdant plains. Let's go. The four of them stepped toward the mist, quickly swallowing the anti-poison pills before they entered. Activating proficient level poison resistance ability. Analyzing the composition of the poison. Aiden didn't know if it was because of his poison resistance ability or the effect of the anti-poison pill, but after he entered the green mist, he felt slightly dizzy. He shook his head and then focused on Caleb, who stood in front of the team with a map in his hands. According to the information, Poppy will appear at the edge of the crescent moon lake at dawn, he said. Our destination is there. He turned to look at Aiden and said solemnly, We'll be following you now. Aiden nodded and quietly walked to the front of the team to take Caleb's place. He held his breath and looked around. After entering the mist, he could see the variety of the flowers and plants. They no longer looked green, but were an assortment of rich and vibrant colors that had been affected by the mist. Activating proficient level medicinal knowledge and proficient level poison identification ability. Current progress... 89 out of 100. Current level, beginner. Mutated crested dog's tail grass. A class D poisonous herb has been discovered. The way that poisons were ranked was similar to how normal medicinal herbs were. The higher the level of poison in the herb, the greater its toxicity. The mutated crested dog's tail grass was a class D herb and posed almost no threat. However, Aiden didn't dare be complacent or neglectful. As he led the team forward, he surveyed every single flower and blade of grass they passed on the roadside. Mutated Shepherd's Purse Cabbage, a Class D poisonous herb has been discovered. Mutated Jade Flower, a Class D poisonous herb has been discovered. Current poison identification progress, 97 out of 100. Mutated Rainbow Pear, a Class B poisonous fruit has been discovered. 
Aiden waved his hand and ordered everyone to stop. What's wrong? Caleb asked. Aiden didn't say anything. He just stared at the pear tree in front of them. It was full of rainbow pears, a famous wild pear in the area. Its flesh was five different colors and the fruit was sweet, making it very popular among the locals. This fruit tree was different though, as the pears had been affected by the green mist, so their flesh had six colors. Hey, you're stalling, aren't you? Sailor asked impatiently as he glared at Aiden's stop. Shh. Deb put her hand up and then pointed at one of the branches where a small green snake with a pointed head was slithering toward one of the pears. Sailor could recognize the snake's distinct color and shape anywhere. It was a green sword snake. It had a bright color with a head no wider than an inch, but it was poisonous and extremely dangerous. His eyes widened and he covered his mouth with a shaky hand. After what felt like an eternity, the snake finally slithered to a rainbow pear. It opened its mouth wide and swallowed the fruit whole. In a split second, the snake's body trembled and it fell directly from the branch. Its vivid green skin instantly turned black, and after twitching a few times, it became still. I can't believe it. It's dead? Deb stuttered. What kind of pear is able to poison a green sword snake badly enough to kill it? Caleb looked at the surrounding pear trees and said decisively, Let's go around the forest. He patted Aiden's shoulder and said with a face full of relief, We're lucky we've got you. Otherwise, we might have ended up like that snake. The green mist swirled around and grew thicker, blocking their line of sight. If they had wandered into the forest, they might never have come out of it alive. Deb also cast a grateful graze at Aiden, who shrugged nonchalantly before leading everyone carefully around the pear forest. Sailor looked at the sword snake's body with lingering fear and swallowed nervously. The rest of the group had left him standing there, and when he noticed, his heart started to beat wildly in his chest. Wait! Wait for me! After passing the strange pear forest, they proceeded up the mountain road. The higher they climbed, the denser the green mist became. They could barely see anything in front of them, not even Caleb's map, which was impossible to read through the thick mist. In the end, he put it back in his pocket. It was completely useless. The four of them could only rely on their instincts as they stumbled to the top of the mountain. They had no choice but to hold hands so as to not get lost in the mist. Suddenly, Aiden stopped again, tilting his head slightly. He could hear faint rustling sounds coming from around them. He had been so focused on identifying poisonous herbs and flowers that he hadn't been paying much attention to his surroundings. Everyone, be careful. Something's not right, Aiden warned. Hey, the kid's ears are pretty good. They were all startled when they heard hoarse laughter followed by a series of frantic footsteps. Eventually, a group of about ten people slowly walked out of the thick fog. They were wearing hiking gear and stared at Aiden and the others with cold and fierce eyes. The group was led by a middle-aged man with a hideous scar on his right cheek. He was chewing gum, and he was twirling a dagger in his hand. His companions also held daggers, and they moved to form a tight circle around Aiden, Caleb, Deb, and Sailor. Caleb looked at the group with a puzzled expression. So those cars we saw belong to you all, he said coldly. Clearly a group of specialists. You must have been the ones who captured Rex, am I right? The leader laughed. Not too bad, old man. Grabbing Rex got us two million dollars each, and we can make even more if we get the other one. Otherwise, we wouldn't have taken the risk of coming to this dark place. But we've searched all night and can't find anything. It's pretty unfortunate that you guys were caught by us but maybe we can collect some interest from you. He scowled and then waved his hand at his subordinates. Go, remove anything valuable they may have. His comrades laughed and nodded and they pointed their daggers at the small group. The circle became even tighter as they drew closer. Caleb gave Deb a look. She immediately understood and suddenly took out a handful of powder from her bag and threw it into the air. Some of the men began to cough. What is that? This doesn't look good. Why am I so dizzy? One after another, the hunters were overcome by the powder and fell to the ground. Deb's eyes swept over the unconscious group, and then she put her hands on her hips. What a bunch of idiots, she mumbled. Don't they know that doctors with knowledge of ancient medical skills also know everything about poisons? My powder will have them fast asleep until dawn. Wow, Deb, I can't believe you really did that. Sailor rushed over to the unconscious scar-faced leader. He nudged the leader with his foot and then kicked him. That's what you get for trying to rob me. Aiden's eyebrows raised suddenly. 
Get away from there! However, it was too late. The leader, who had been lying still on the ground, suddenly opened his eyes, grabbed Sailor's extended leg, and dragged him down. Sailor tried to get up, but before he could get away, the leader held a dagger to his neck. If you move again, it'll be the last thing you do in this life, the leader threatened. Sailor was frightened and motionless. Before Aiden and the others could help out, the hunters, who were lying on the ground, also jumped up and grabbed Deb and Caleb, holding daggers to their necks. In an instant, three of the four were held hostage. The scar-faced leader spat out the chewing gum in his mouth. He cracked his neck and said mockingly, I was just playing with you guys. Do you really think we fell for your stupid sleeping powder? You're not the only ones who've been in the verdant plains before. Do you really think that we weren't prepared? The hunters roared with laughter, and the hostages' faces were pale and full of despair. Now it's your turn, the leader said to Aiden. He passed Sailor on to one of his men, and after wiping the powder off his hands, he pointed his dagger at Aiden. Do you know why I didn't catch you, kid? He smirked evilly. Because you're obviously the big fish. Now listen up. If you don't want to see your friends get cut open, hurry up and hand over all your money. As he spoke, he pressed his dagger closer to Sailor's neck. Taylor's face was as white as snow now. However, to the hunter's disappointment, Aiden remained calm and looked silently at the group in front of him. Then, the corner of his mouth curled up into a mocking smile. The leader was insulted by Aiden's clear amusement. You really don't care if they live or die, he roared. Aiden didn't answer. Instead, he slowly broke a thick branch from a nearby tree. He shook it a few times and then held it out like a sword, issuing a silent challenge to the hunters. They were stunned at first, and then they covered their stomachs and doubled over, laughing so hard that tears rolled down their faces. You're not really going to fight us with that, are you? Even if you want to fight, can't you use something a little better? What the hell is with the tree branch? Hey kid, do you want to borrow a dagger? Amidst the laughter, the leader shook his head. Go and catch this fool, he commanded. We'll exchange them all for money. Two hunters jumped forward, still laughing. They had their daggers in their hands, but didn't point them at Aiden as they approached. They were hardly holding onto their weapons, as they didn't see him as a real threat. Suddenly, a gust of wind blew through the forest. Sailor, whose neck was hurting from the sharp tip of the hunter's dagger, cursed at Aiden. You idiot! Don't bother about us! Run! Shut up! The hunter wrapped Sailor's arm in a tight grip and forced him down to the ground. Sharp pain shot up and down his arm and he became silent again. However, he was stubborn and he winked at Aiden. Caleb also winked, trying to tell him to leave. He gestured in the direction of Little Nook with his head. If Aiden left now, he could get to the town and find help. However, Aiden still didn't move, which made the three of them even more anxious. I won't hold anything you've said about me against you, Aiden smiled at Sailor, and then gently waved the branch in his hand. Using sword skills from the Blade Ridge Warriors, martial arts ability plus one, accessing information from the Universal Pride Lord Manuscript for the water attribute technique, now accessing wind attribute technique from the Blade Ridge Warriors. Aiden raised the withered branch higher in the air. The wind blew more forcefully, whipping everyone's hair and clothes wildly around. Where did this wind come from? Oh no, I can't open my eyes! Everyone except Aiden closed their eyes tightly. The wind was getting stronger and stronger. The hunters lost interest in the hostages and soon let them go. They clung to the tree trunk so that they wouldn't be blown away by the wind. Sailor and the others had been affected by the wind at first, but they suddenly felt lighter. An invisible force wrapped around their bodies, and when they opened their eyes, they realized that they had been brought to an open space away from the forest. This place wasn't affected by the strong winds, so they could clearly see what was happening. Caleb, Deb, and Sailor's mouths were hanging wide open as they stared at Aiden, who was freely wandering the forest, completely unaffected by the wind. Then, as suddenly as the strong winds came, they left. The hunters were able to regain their balance, but when they opened their eyes to look at their surroundings, they were met with an unexpected surprise. The forest had been ravaged by the violent winds and countless branches were scattered all over the ground. It was a complete mess. There were also various pieces of clothing scattered on the ground that looked eerily familiar. Those look like our clothes. Where did they come from? The hunters were shocked and quickly looked down. What? What happened to our clothes? In an unprecedented turn of events, 
they realized that no one was wearing a complete set of clothes. Their hiking clothes were torn to shreds, and they had all had deep cuts on the exposed skin. The cuts were too painful to touch, and the hunters couldn't understand how they got there in the first place. Aiden was standing close by. He was still holding the tree branch, and he stared at all the hunters with a small smile on his lips. A slight breeze blew past, and the hunters who were not fully clothed felt a chill running up and down their spines. The scar-faced leader was the first to kneel down, trembling. Spare me! Please spare me! He begged Aiden. The rest of the ragged hunters followed his example, each of them issuing a loud and desperate plea. Caleb, Deb, and Sailor rubbed their eyes, staring blankly at the surreal scene. Aiden used the ropes he found from the hunters to tie them all up to a few trees. The hunters were scared of Aiden's tree sword and allowed themselves to be restrained. What are you going to do to us? The scar-faced leader asked nervously. Aiden clapped his hands. I know you must be a group of poor people, so don't worry. I won't blackmail you. But I will be leaving you all here for the time being. The hunters all lowered their heads in embarrassment, not knowing whether to be happy or sad that Aiden wasn't going to kill or blackmail them. When Aiden turned around, he found Caleb and the others still in shock. If we don't leave soon, we'll run out of time, he tapped his wrist. Caleb quickly looked down at his watch, only to find that there was less than five minutes left before dawn. He became serious again and ran toward the top of the mountain. Deb reacted quickly and followed, instantly forgetting about the hunters. Sailor, who was at the back of the group, turned and smirked at the hunters. You guys will want to watch out. I think I saw a green sword snake around here earlier. Then he left without looking back. The hunters were pale, their mouths opening and closing as they struggled to speak. To save us! Help! Help! Soon, all of them began to scream, their mournful cries for help echoing across the mountain. In Little Nook, everyone was fast asleep, apart from the people who were on patrol. They were walking along the main road that led to the verdant plains when one of the men stopped. He closed his eyes to concentrate his hearing on a shrill sound in the distance. You guys hear that? He asked quietly. I think so, another patrolman responded. I think it came from the mountain. That's not good. It must be a thief that snuck up the road. Notify the mayor. Soon, the lights of every household in Little Nook were lit, and the people raced out of their homes and gathered at the entrance of the town. They wore a strange brown leather armor, and many carried black short crossbows in their hands. Silver arrowheads protruded from the quiver bags on their shoulders, emitting a cold light. About a hundred townspeople were standing at the entrance now, each of them staring at a burly middle-aged man standing at the front. He looked like an iron tower, and his eyes blazed fiercely as he talked to the townspeople. The thieves have kidnapped the princess from the mountain, and now they're trying to escape. We can't let them get away. We must teach them a lesson. They will pay with their blood. They're going to regret trying to take the princess. Let's get them! The people were livid, each one full of fighting spirit. Their burly leader waved his hand and roared, To the mountain! They quickly lit their lanterns. They formed a long line and rushed toward the top of the verdant plains. Caleb's watch chimed softly, indicating that it was finally dawn. They were now only a few feet away from the crescent moon lake, but decided to hide in the dense bushes near the bank. There, they could observe the lake without being detected. Someone's coming, Sailor suddenly hissed in an excited voice. The top of the mountain was open and clear. There was no sign of the green mist so everyone could clearly see when a petite figure appeared, slowly walking by the lake. By the light of the moon, they could see that it was a young girl of about ten years of age. Although her features were still that of a child, it was clear that she would grow into a woman of ethereal beauty. She had deep, dark eyes that seemed to contain a wisdom beyond her years, and her jet black hair was very long and tied into two ponytails, with the left tied by a purple ribbon, while the right was tied by one of gold. Her black dress sheathed her body and seemed to shimmer, as though it held all the spirit energy of the mountain. The girl looked for all the world like a beautiful princess. It was Poppy. Activating proficient level discerning ability. Target skill level currently insufficiently powerful to discern at high level. Aiden whispered to Caleb from the corner of his mouth. This must be Poppy. If they hadn't been on the verdant plains, Aiden would have thought she was simply a child from a wealthy family who had snuck out to play. She seemed to be incapable of having any association with any type of barbarian at all. Before Caleb could reply, Poppy moved slowly to the edge of the cliff on the mountaintop. From there, she raised her head and stared directly at him. 
Her tiny form seemed to grow larger and fill the sky before she parted her perfectly formed lips and began to gently sing. As her song floated out in the mountain air, it seemed as though the clouds covered the light of the moon, and the wind strengthened, promising another snowfall. A sense of deep melancholy filled the listeners, reminding them of all the sorrows and bittersweet joys they had ever experienced. The sound washed over the entire mountaintop, enveloping everyone in an utterly captivating mist of longing and treasured memories. In no time at all, Aiden was entranced. It was the first time he had ever heard the song, but he immediately sensed a familiar nostalgia welling up from deep inside. In the depths of his being, he felt the despair of a young girl lost in the mountains, calling incessantly for help without ever receiving a response. Suddenly, he recalled where he had experienced a similar mix of emotions. Activating Grandmaster level musical ability, automatically resisting external music field. He realized that they were being profoundly affected by the same dimension of musical expression that he had invoked when he played in Montgomery County at the music competition. It was the uncanny capacity of music, expertly realized and performed by a master of the art that invoked a deep resonance in the listener, not only with the notes, instruments, and physical surroundings, but the waves of joy and sadness, pain and sorrow, and recollection and regrets that abide deep in every heart. Only a true virtuoso could evoke the type of transcendent mood such as the one he felt transfixed by the song at the top of the verdant plains. He opened his eyes to discover that not only was he surrounded by the welling waves of sound, but also a cloud of poisonous red mist. Proficient level poison resistance ability triggered. Analysis indicates the poison component of current red mist is a strengthened version of the green mist. It has automatically detoxified the host. Fortunately, the system analyzed the composition of the green mist's poison, which allowed Aiden to avoid the similar effect of the red mist. However, the other three were not so lucky. Caleb Richter, Deb Tailby, and Sailor Ben Tyne had all fallen to the ground without a sound. Aiden quickly examined their prone forms and let out a sigh of relief. Although the poison gas had entered their systems, their lives were not in danger, thanks to the anti-poison pills they had taken. At the sound of rustling and approaching footfalls, Aiden raised his head to find Poppy looking at him with great curiosity. He realized that the singing had stopped. She said, Why are you not affected? Her speaking voice was as melodious as bird song and almost as entrancing as her singing voice. Aiden looked at her with great weariness. He knew it would be a mistake to underestimate this innocent looking child. Her song was poisonous. One careless mistake and he would suffer. Aiden stopped still and glanced cautiously to either side. Four strong-looking figures had emerged from the surrounding bushes. Without staring directly at them, he saw that each was at least six feet tall and they were crudely dressed in a few well-draped pieces of rough cloth. He had an overwhelming sense of primitive animal power. There wasn't the same sense of danger that he received from Jesse Evans or Billy Barton, but Aiden was keenly aware that they could be just as dangerous, although in a more brutal fashion, and he would have to be very careful of their unfamiliar power. He wondered if these were the notorious mountain people of the Verdant Plains. They stared at him, their sharp eyes glittering keenly. Poppy gave a small wave of her hand, and they all instantly relaxed and paid her rapt attention. She moved closer to Aiden and moved slowly around him, sniffing at him cautiously like a puppy investigating something strange and new. Strange, she said softly. He's clearly not one of us, but he is not affected by the singing. She looked up and fixed her bright eyes on his. She wondered aloud, maybe you could be the one. Suddenly, she arrived at a decision. She said firmly, take me down the mountain. Aiden was quite nonplussed. He was having trouble anticipating what she was going to do or say. She saw that he was confused and said, this is no place to talk, come with me. Aiden made no move, but looked pointedly at Caleb and the others lying on the ground. Poppy said, don't worry, they will be fine. She gave a series of orders to her people in a language Aiden did not understand. They lifted up the three unconscious companions and followed Poppy. She added, But if you don't come too, I can't guarantee that they will remain so. She grinned at Aiden devilishly, revealing two small, sharp canine teeth. Aiden had no choice but to follow, and she led him to a cave not far from the peak. He expected to find a crude dwelling and rough furnishings, if any, but the cave was tastefully furnished and decorated. There were sandalwood chairs and tables, soft cushioning, and many landscape paintings. Aiden immediately felt that he was a visitor in an elegant country house, 
rather than in a cave at the top of a mountain. Please take a seat, she said, gesturing to a finely carved chair. One of her people brought a platter of fruit, and Poppy removed an elegant porcelain tea set from a drawer. When some water had been boiled, she made tea and poured it in a cup, serving him herself. Let me introduce myself first, she said with a smile. I have lived on this mountain since I was very young. You could say I am a mountain girl. Aiden wondered what she meant by that. He sniffed his tea suspiciously. It was a tea of clear and pleasing purity, and he couldn't recall ever having seen or smelled tea of such quality ever before. He remained wary and had no intention of taking even a sip. He had experienced too many strange things lately, and even though Poppy seemed to have no further bad intentions, he dared not lower his guard. Aiden said, So may I call you Poppy? I was told your name is Poppy. Poppy thought for a moment and said, All right then, it will do, I suppose. From now on, I will be known as Poppy Hansen. She took a sip of her tea and said, You're right to call me their leader, but this community isn't as wild or strange as people think. They have their own ideas and philosophies, their own name, and their own way of looking at the world. They live peacefully on the verdant plains with me. They have no wish or intention of interacting at all with the outside world. However, a few days ago, a group of white-clothed men kidnapped some of our folks. Aiden was intrigued. The people she was talking about were probably the same that Caleb and the others had mentioned. He guessed that they were from the New York City Medical Association. Poppy said, Now it's your turn. Who are you? Aiden replied, My name is Aiden. I'm from Philadelphia. He went on to tell her about his plan to get to the top of the mountain. Pointing at his three sleeping companions, he said, We have no ill intentions. Hurry up and detoxify them. Poppy nodded her understanding, but said, I see that's how it is. You do seem to be different to the others who have also come up to the top of the verdant plains. Not exactly agreeing to Aiden's request, she went on. I can cure them, but first, I want you to do something for me. What is it? He asked. I have already told you. I want you to take me down the mountain, she said determinedly. Aiden saw that she meant what she said and felt a headache coming on. He said, Why do you have to go down? Poppy replied angrily, To find out about our companions who have been abducted, of course. The others are too distinctive and would attract too much attention, so I must be the one to go down in their place. But I don't know what life is like there, so I need someone to lead the way and guide me. That's where you come in. Aiden looked uncomfortably at her. He said, It will be easy enough to help you down the mountain but I'm afraid that you might cause some destruction and trouble down there, and maybe even hurt some people you come across. Poppy looked very solemn. She raised her hand and swore, I swear in the name of my parents in heaven that I will not hurt any innocent people. Aiden was impressed at hearing her grave promise. He thought that if she caused any trouble, he could quite readily knock her out and return her to the top of the mountain. He promised, Okay, I'll do it. Now get the poison out of my friends, quickly! Poppy laughed happily and clapped her hands. From outside the cave, one of the mountain people carried a cup of liquid carefully to her. It contained a clear liquid of some kind that was identical, as far as Aiden could tell, to water. Under Poppy Hansen's instructions, the burly man fed the three unconscious people some of the clear liquid. It was the antidote to the red mist and worked very quickly. In just a few minutes, Caleb, Sailor, and Deb groggily returned to consciousness. Sailor groaned. Oh my god he managed to say after a while. Where am I? What happened? All three slowly recovered and looked around, trying to work out where they were. When Caleb became aware that one of the men he understood to be a mountain person was trying to force him to drink from a cup, he recoiled in fear, shouting, Get away from me, you savage! Poppy made a disappointed face and said, How rude you are. I wouldn't have bothered saving you if I knew you would be so ungrateful. When they looked around to see who had spoken, all three looked at Aiden and Poppy in great confusion. Deb shook her head and said, Aiden, what happened? What's going on? She was very surprised. Sighing, Aiden said, It's a long story, and told them everything. It took them a long time to put all the events in place. Caleb asked, Poppy, is there any way to stop the green mist from spreading down the mountain? Poppy played with one of her ponytails and said, I am sure there must be a way, but first... I have to find my people. Caleb looked quite anxious, but suddenly, he and the others became dizzy, and he had to cover his eyes with his hands. Aiden hurriedly checked their pulses. When he had finished, he said to Poppy coldly, 
The poison hasn't cleared from their systems. Poppy fiddled again, this time with her other ponytail, and said, Well, I trust you, but that doesn't mean I have to trust them, too. If I'm to find my people, I'll need a way to be sure that they won't betray me. Don't worry, this residual trace of poison won't cause them any long-term harm. As soon as he said this, the dizziness dissipated in all three victims. Caleb roused himself and said, Poppy, I give you my word that we won't harm you or anyone else. You don't have to keep treating us like this. What good does it serve? The people at the foot of the mountain are more cunning than others. You may lie more than you tell the truth. Who knows what you are thinking? Poppy muttered. Sailor began wailing. Poppy, I'm much more handsome than he is. Why trust him more than you would trust me? I am so much better looking. Poppy looked at Aiden. She then looked at Sailor and went back to Aiden a few more times. She turned to Sailor and said very seriously, I am sorry, you are not as handsome as Aiden. Sailor looked very disheartened, and although Aiden was secretly pleased, he was unsure why Poppy trusted him so much. Right at that minute, however, he didn't have time to consider it very much further. Seeing that nightfall was approaching, he said, Okay, everyone, we are going down the mountain. Poppy was a little surprised and said, I know that you have all agreed to help me, but do we really need to be in such a hurry? Why don't we just stay here the night and go down tomorrow? Because I have to participate in the competition tomorrow, replied Aiden. Caleb, Deb, and Sailor said in unison, You're going to participate in a medical conference? Aiden shrugged and said, Didn't I ever tell you? I'm the vice chairman of the Arkland City Medical Association. I'm leading my team in the competition. Even if I don't compete myself, I'm still responsible for the members of my association. After everything that had happened, they all felt much closer to one another and felt like they all knew each other a little more fully. Aiden didn't think he needed to keep everything from them any longer. Sailor was very put out. He shouted, When were you planning on telling us? Hearing Deb's sigh, he turned to her and said, What's that big sigh for? Deb shrugged and said, I'm just sympathizing with all the competitors. I didn't think that you would turn out to be so against it. Sailor set his face into a very grumpy expression. Caleb looked at Aiden and said, In that case, I think we should go down as soon as we can. Let's not delay Aiden's competition. Seeing that she was outnumbered, Poppy decided that she had to go. She informed her people, and then they all set off down the mountain. The mountain people followed them until they reached the limits of the green mist and then reluctantly waved Poppy farewell. Before they had gone very far, however, they heard shouting in the distance, We found traces of the kidnappers! Come quickly! Aiden and his group had no choice but to stop and hear what the approaching people had to say. They were quickly surrounded by a large group who looked at them with hostility in the torchlight that reflected from the steel arrowheads they had drawn in their bows. The many bobbing flashlights made it difficult to see. It looks like these guys are all from Little Duck, whispered Caleb to Aiden, looking worriedly at the armed men. He knew Aiden had supernatural abilities, but he hoped that he wouldn't use them against these ordinary townspeople. If he did and it ever got out, it would be terrible for his reputation. Caleb knew it was time that he stepped in. He had been the recipient of Aiden's help in the past, and it was time to repay the favor. Caleb stood before the armed mob and tried to placate them. He said, My friends, we are doctors from abundance. We have come to the mountain with nothing but good intentions. It would have been better if Caleb hadn't stepped forward. Telling the angry mob that they were doctors only made them more agitated. One of the townsfolk cried, Damn it! Wasn't it the doctors who kidnapped one of us? We haven't settled that score with you yet. Let's arrest them and bring them back to town for interrogation. Sailor responded furiously. Hey, open your minds and eyes a little. We're not the same as those other doctors. His anger only added fuel to the fire, and his attitude only made the townspeople angrier. Another man called out. We've fallen for fancy talking people before, and they took advantage of our good nature to sneak up to the top of the mountain. I say we take them back to the town and let them spend a couple days in the well before we ask them any questions. Sailor turned very pale. Just as the situation seemed to be getting out of hand, there was a movement from behind Aiden, and Poppy made her way forward into the light. She stood proudly before the riled-up citizens of Little Nook. As soon as they saw her, they quieted down. A burly man pushed his way forward from the crowd of townsfolk. He shouted, All of you, quiet down, back off! He stood in front of Poppy, who stood there calmly without speaking. He sized her up, looking her over carefully. After another moment, he dropped to one knee and said, Greetings, my lady. All of the other townspeople also dropped to one knee and echoed him. 
Greetings, my lady, they recited together. Aiden and the others were dumbfounded. Wow, Poppy, since when did you become so revered? Asked Sailor rather rudely. How dare you! Cried one of the men and glared at him so fiercely that he shrank back and tried to hide behind Deb. Only Aiden showed no emotion. He had already been thinking about Poppy and her relationship with the townspeople. He knew from Anita Grayson and some of the local legends that he had picked up around Little Nook about the verdant plains that there was a special kind of relationship among Poppy, the townsfolk, and the so-called mountain people at the top of the mountain. There was clearly a long-standing and special relationship of mutual care and protection that they all shared. Aiden had heard Anita Grayson talk about the unique relationship in the past. She had never regarded the mountain people as wild folks, but as a unique group that had been watched over by the townsfolk of Little Nook for generations. She had become very angry when the bus driver had called them barbarians, but she knew that while the origins of the special relationship was shrouded in mystery, the citizens of Little Nook had taken their duty very seriously. Anita had also mentioned that the older folk in the community had spoken of a rather special person who was sometimes referred to as my lady or princess. Aiden didn't quite understand why the Little Nook citizens had called Poppy that. He wondered if she was descended from a royal family of some type from the past. He found it hard to believe. As Aiden was trying to make sense of the fragments of information he had gathered, Poppy coughed discreetly and said, I would like to go down to the bottom of the mountain with these people. Please don't stop us. The burly man who had first recognized her said, But you mustn't go down the mountain. Why do you want to do that? There was a general murmur of agreement with his thoughts from the other townspeople. He continued, Princess, it's too dangerous down there. The people there are full of rat cunning and deceit. Please don't go. Despite her tender years, Poppy looked very dignified as she replied, I have already made up my mind. Please don't try to dissuade me. She really did have the aura and authority that one might expect a royal princess to display. The muscular man tried again. But stop, that's quite enough, Poppy said impatiently. There is another group of people tied up near the forest. They came up the mountain with the intention of causing trouble. You must take enough people and go deal with them later. Aiden had mentioned the hunting party to Poppy when they were talking earlier, which is how she knew they were there. Poppy needed them to go to the forest so she could continue on her way. As soon as she finished speaking, she began walking despite everyone's misgivings. Some of them lit her way with their torches and flashlights, but each was very concerned about her safety. A citizen asked the strong-looking man, What should we do now, Mr. Mayor? The mayor said, Take a few of the guys and keep an eye on the princess. Don't let them know you're shadowing them. Stay in touch with me. The man nodded and went off to select his posse. The mayor gestured to the remaining men and ordered, Let's go to the forest. A short while later, in a clearing in the forest, the members of the hunting group were hugging each other and cheering with delight and relief. They had managed to free themselves after a long struggle and were very pleased that they had not been eaten by wild animals. They hadn't been celebrating for very long when they saw a group of angry townspeople approaching them with arrows and weapons of all kinds aimed directly at them. The smiles of relief instantly froze on their faces. They felt as though they had leapt out of the frying pan and into the fire. Their scar-faced leader managed a weak smile. He said pleadingly, Everyone, this is all just a misunderstanding. Listen to me. As he tried desperately to think of ways to keep them all out of worse trouble, the mayor said, Okay, boys, get to work. Immediately, the sickening sounds of blows on unprotected flesh and cries of pain and protest filled the clearing. At two in the morning, Aiden and his group finally returned to abundance. They all exchanged contact information so they could help Poppy find her missing people after the medical conference was over. Before parting ways with Caleb and the others, Sailor Ben Tyne called Aiden to one side. Here, he said, offering Aiden a small box. He looked proudly at Aiden and held his head high. What is this? asked Aiden. Puzzled, he opened the box. Inside, he saw the rainbow blossom that he had been promised for helping Caleb. There was also a ball of what looked like stone or resin. Activating proficient level medicinal knowledge. Grade S medicinal herb, microsin. Medicinal bio agent efficiency, 72.65%. It was another S grade medicinal herb. The resin derived from a rare fungus was the payment for the bet Sailor had lost to Aiden. It was used as a catalyst when ground into a powdered form and made an effective wound treatment. It was very useful, although it worked best when the patient was not too severely injured. I haven't used it too often, said Sailor but it's at least as valuable as Rainbow Blossom. 
He tried to hide his feelings and turned his head so Aiden wouldn't see the regret on his face at having to part with it. If I had realized, I would never have made a bet with you, you pest, he thought. It sure does hurt to hand this over to you. I wish I didn't have to be so full of good intentions. Aiden smiled and pretended not to notice. He put the two substances into his pocket and said, Thanks. I don't think I have to be too polite. You lost. Sailor asked, By the way, do you have to participate in this medical contest? Aiden wasn't sure what he was getting at, but nodded in reply. He said, It involves a kind of duel with a very annoying competitor. It means a lot to our association's honor and good name, so we have to fight it out. Sailor sighed. All right, he said. It looks like he seemed conflicted, as though he wanted to say more. In the end, he sighed again and walked away without adding to his cryptic comments. Deb winked playfully at Aiden and said, I might go to the contest tomorrow, too. See you then. Aiden was once more confused by the attention. Caleb looked at Poppy, who was quietly observing the town. He lowered his voice so she wouldn't hear and said, Well, boy, whether the poison in our bodies can be removed is now really up to you. Make sure you keep this little miss happy. Aiden's headache began anew. There was so much that was out of his hands, but he said, Don't worry, Caleb. I will find a way to cure you as soon as possible. It was 2.30 in the morning when they finally made their last farewells. Abundance was completely silent. Not a single person could be seen on the streets. Poppy had nowhere to go, so Aiden had little choice but to take her back to his hotel. It would only be temporary, but as soon as he entered his home, he regretted having to make that decision. Poppy said, Tonight, I have no choice but to stay here with you. I warn you, if you hurt me, it will not end well for you. Aiden tried to look unconcerned. His face hurt along with his head. Why on earth would you think I might want to hurt a little kid like you? He said. He pointed to the bed and said, You have the bed. I'll stay here in this chair. He helped Poppy straighten the sheets and smooth the blankets. He said, I don't know where a little girl like you gets all of her crazy ideas. Poppy looked crestfallen hearing herself described as a little kid. But as soon as the bed was made, she fell into it. And in a few seconds, she felt herself sliding into a dreamless sleep. Aiden ignored Poppy, and while she slept, he sat at the table quietly flicking through a stack of documents. Most of them related to the rules of the National Medical Association Conference and the protocols surrounding the exchange of research. He hadn't had any time to read through them, so he browsed while he had the chance. Burning the Midnight Oil, Night Reading, Wakefulness Ability Plus, Current Progress, 1 to 1 out of 10, Current Level, Beginner Level, Activating Ability Combo, Vitality plus Spirit Recovery plus 1. Far from feeling tired, Aiden began to feel quite energized. From the bed, Poppy had stirred and was looking at his back as he read through the rules. She thought, Hmm, Aiden, I wonder why I trust you so completely. It's very strange. She felt very much at ease and was not the slightest bit nervous, despite finding herself in such an unfamiliar environment. It was as if Aiden put her mind at ease. Even the hotel bed felt better than her own much-loved bed back in the cave on the mountain. Her eyelids became heavier and heavier. Finally, she could resist her tiredness no longer. She leaned back on her pillow and her breathing became deep and even as she sank into slumber. Aiden turned to look at her. He got up and looked at the temperature showing on the air conditioner. Seeing it was quite cool, he gently lifted the blanket that had slipped from the bed and laid it over the sleeping little girl. He returned to the table and looked thoughtfully at the pile of documents in the still, silent night. The next morning, Poppy was surprised to see Aiden was still sitting at the table, but the pile of documents had been replaced by an ancient-looking yellow book. From her prone position on the bed, she could just make out the patterns and symbols on its pages and cover. Aiden sensed there had been some movement and turned around. He said, You slept very soundly. I thought you were afraid that you might come to some harm. She was very perturbed to realize that he was right, but she had slept peacefully with no defenses at all. She was a little embarrassed and blushed. To cover up, she said, What time is it? Seven o'clock, replied Aiden. He stood up and parted the curtains, allowing the morning sunlight to flood into the room. He went on, You should wash up. I'll take you to breakfast when you're done. After breakfast, you should probably stay here quietly, and after the competition, we'll get started on helping you find your people. Poppy shook her head firmly. She said, I won't stay here by myself. I want to go with you to the competition. You did say that the kidnappers are likely to be connected to the New York City Medical Association, 
so there's a good chance they'll be at the competition venue. I might be able to question them about what happened to my people. Aiden was reluctant, but seeing how determined she was, he finally agreed. He warned, But you have to behave yourself. You can't go getting up to any tricks. Especially don't think you can get away with using any of your poisonous fog shenanigans. It would be terrible to have innocent people get caught up in anything like that, and they could be badly hurt. Poppy said, All right, all right, I know, and poked her tongue out at him. There was a knock at the door. Vice Chairman, are you up yet? We came to call you downstairs for breakfast, called the voice. It sounded to Aiden like Garrett Slater. When he opened the door, he saw he was with Tyson Stiller, Jenna Shu, and Anita Grayson. When the four of them saw Poppy waiting there in her little black dress, they were all very surprised. Garrett said, Who is this? When they last saw Aiden in his room, he was quite alone, but now he seemed to have made a new acquaintance. All four looked in confusion at Poppy. Aiden looked a little sheepish and began to explain. It's, um, it's a long story. He paused, searching for the right story. Poppy walked to the door confidently. She said, Hi, everyone. I'm Aiden's cousin. You can call me Poppy. I have lived in New York City since I was a baby. When I heard Aiden was coming to abundance, I thought I should try to spend some time with him. And here I am. Her sweet appearance, gentle voice, and confidence made Jenna Shu's eyes glisten. Oh, Aiden, your cousin is very sweet. How come we've never heard you talk about her before? She pinched Poppy's cheeks as if she was a doll. Aiden watched Poppy tell her fabricated story without a blush or any hint of hesitation or shame and had no choice but to back her up. He stuttered. I, I, <clears throat> I hadn't really expected that she would come. I was planning to tell you guys about her later. Tyson and Garrett nodded agreeably when Poppy told them her story. They had no reason to think otherwise. Anita was somewhat less swayed. She looked hard at Poppy as if she was trying to recall where she might have seen her before. Suddenly, she remembered that she had seen a portrait somewhere in town. Her eyes narrowed and she cried. Oh, wait! Aiden quickly caught her eye and shook his head almost imperceptibly. Fortunately, Anita saw him and stopped short of blurting out where she had recognized Poppy from but it was too difficult for her to completely cover up her excitement. Anita, what's wrong? Asked Tyson. Are you getting nervous about the contest? Anita shook her head and forced herself not to look at Poppy. She squeezed out a smile and said, No, no, I'm fine. Tyson wanted to press her a little more, but Aiden said breezily, Let's go eat, then we can go to the venue. The competition venue was in a square on the west side of the town. It was the biggest square in abundance and the only place in the town that could host large-scale competitions. Aiden and his companions had a hasty breakfast at the hotel and headed to the square. Although it was not much past 8 o'clock, abundance was quite lively, as everyone in town had long been anticipating the busiest day of the year. All the elite doctors and medical researchers from all over the country would be gathering in one place with pharmacists, herbalists, chiropractors, neuropaths, and even quacks. Half the city was meeting in the square, hoping to see or even meet one of the practitioners. Security was very tight, and it was impossible to enter the square without the right credentials. The entry line was very long. Aiden and his members easily gained entry after they presented their certificates to the security guards, but Poppy, not having a certificate, was stopped from entering by an enthusiastic security team member. Oh, sir, she begged, please let me in. She dropped her head and began trembling. Her face took on a cast of abject misery and desperation. She wept. My parents are seriously ill and we can't afford the expense of looking after them. I'm only here to throw myself at the mercy of any of the kind-hearted doctors here who might be willing to come help save them. If you could just allow me this once, you would be saving their lives. I beg you. She looked so pitiful that the guards found her hard to resist. Everyone surrounding Poppy was moved by her story. Some even began to cry with her. Quite a few of them pleaded with the security guards to show some mercy toward her and asked that they let her in. One kind-hearted woman said, Oh, this poor child. Please let her in. It must be awfully difficult for someone as young as her to deal with such a burden. Overwhelmed by the support Poppy had swiftly garnered, the security guards looked at the long line of people waiting and quickly waved her in. There were too many people to argue with, and she looked so harmless. Oh, thank you so much, sirs, she sniffed. Bless you. Our family will be so grateful. Thank you, thank you. Entering the square, she made a small V with their fingers at Aiden and winked. Aiden and the others were astonished by her temerity and acting prowess. 
They were not delayed much by the kerfuffle at the entry gate and soon found the tent housing the Arkland City Medical Association. The square was packed with the colorful marquees of medical associations from all over the country. Willow Grove, Wilmington, New Hampshire, and even some very remote locations were all represented by the cream of their medical personnel. The square was filled to capacity with doctors dressed in their white embroidered lab coats. It promised to be the grandest conference seen for many years. At the center of the square was a roped off area that held just a small amount of equipment. Apart from a few chairs and tables, the main piece of equipment was housed in an electrical cabinet. Aiden recognized it at once. It was the virtual disease response simulator. His heart skipped a beat when it dawned on him that in just a short while, he would be preparing for this machine to decide the winner of this contest. The square was divided into three distinct areas. One was the competition area where doctors waited. Another was the activity and spectator viewing area. The area in the middle of the square was surrounded by tents, but above it were suspended four massive screens, each one about 30 feet high. Each faced in a different direction so the spectators could see all the activity, no matter where they happened to be in the square. At 8.30 a.m., the face of a young woman holding a microphone was suddenly projected onto the screens. The square fell silent in an instant. The conference was about to get underway. The woman was the host of the conference, and her clear voice filled the square over the PA system. She began, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be your host for this year's National Medical Association Conference. My name is... The introductions went on for some time, and finally, the cameras focused on five officials sitting on chairs. Each was wearing a distinctive white laboratory coat, and although it was hard to see them from so far away, it was easy to see that they were all people of great dignity, with much experience in their respective fields. The host continued, Next, please allow me to introduce our five judges. The first is... The camera panned across all five judges, then zoomed in on the first. She was a middle-aged woman wearing a pearl necklace. Her eyebrows were quite bushy, and she gave the spectators the impression that she was a no-nonsense operator who would not suffer fools gladly. The host was still introducing. As the president of the association is unwell today, he will be replaced by Pippa O'Connor, the chair of the New York City Medical Association. Pippa O'Connor rose to her feet and waved to the people in all corners of the square. She seemed to be smiling, but the curve of her mouth was flat and insincere, and her attempt at good humor was not matched by the cold expression in her eyes. Rather than inspire a warm response, it made people feel rather afraid of her. She made the same impact that a venomous snake would make if it bared its fangs at its intended victim from close range. Aiden picked up his teacup, lifted it up to his lips, but stopped short of taking a sip. He stared intently at the face of the woman on the screen. Pippa O'Connor, the chair of the New York City Medical Association, was Dr. Newt Winston's direct superior. Jonathan Shu had often discussed her fearsome reputation with Aiden. She was a skilled political operative and had extensive networks that helped her maintain her influence. She had no difficulty in switching allegiances or manipulating circumstances to help her achieve her aims. While Newt was an upfront personality with a brash, extroverted style, Pippa was more circumspect and strategic and often outmaneuvered her opponents and rivals with complex machinations. The two of them were a potent force in the East Coast medical establishment and complemented one another well. There were even rumors that Pippa had proposed that the general administration wing of the National Association would take over the recruitment processes of the state associations. Registration, admission, promotion, disqualification, and all other aspects of membership would then be taken out of the hands of the individual state medical associations. Her plan was to enlist the support of more progressive states and to become the next president of the National Association. Pippa was clearly pulling the strings. She wanted to show the strength of the New York City Medical Association and force the other state associations to back her proposal. The Arkland City Medical Association had embarrassed Newt and was subsequently very wary of Pippa's plans and fully expected her to place obstacles in their way during the competition. It wasn't long before Aiden's foresight was confirmed. The host announced, Our next judge is Chair Brendan Neal of the Providence Medical Association, and our third judge is Simon Regan, the president of the Augusta Medical Association. Aiden became more concerned when the camera showed an old man with white hair and a long beard. Brendan Neal and Simon Regan were clearly progressive thinkers. When their influence was combined with Pippa's, they formed a powerful radical bloc who were passionate about seizing more power. Some people, like Jonathan Shu, 
were politically neutral and focused on medical matters. But many others held conservative positions, and they naturally resisted the progressive push for more power at a national level. Jonathan and other like-minded leaders performed a constant balancing act and had tried to suggest and maintain compromises between the two opposing forces for many years. The judging panel was usually made up of a balance between those with a conservative approach and those who sought change, plus one neutral figure. The president's illness allowed the radical faction to change the balance of power. It looked as though the conservative and neutral thinkers were going to be outnumbered. Jenna Shu and Garrett Slater did not seem to think too much about the strategizing that was going on and looked at the big screen with interest. But Tyler Stiller recognized what was happening and frowned in consternation. Anita Grayson was in no mood to worry herself about politics and instead kept her eyes on Poppy Hansen. Poppy kept looking all around, trying to find any signs of her people, both inside and outside the tent. The host continued, The fourth judge is the chair of the Chicago Medical Association, Sailor Benteen. When Aiden saw the camera focus on the fourth judge, he was so overtaken by surprise that he spurted the mouthful of tea he had just taken into the air in an explosive spray. Ventilation capacity ability increased by one following tea choke. Current progress, one out of ten. Current level, beginner level. He made no move to wipe up the tea that dripped from his chin and nose. He stared in utter surprise at Sailor's face on the massive screen. Aiden was extremely surprised to discover that Sailor, the impetuous young man that he had only met the day before, was actually the chair of the Chicago Medicine Association. It suddenly made perfect sense to him that Sailor would have had access to something as valuable as Mike Corson. He wondered about the status and true identity of his companions, Caleb Richter and Deb Tailby. He looked expectantly at the huge screen, waiting for the next bombshell. The members of his association looked at him oddly after they saw his reaction to Sailor being announced as a judge. They had no inkling of the events of the night before. The host's voice rang out over the square. The fifth judge is the chair of the Burlington Medical Association, Deb Tailby. Although Aiden had been mentally preparing himself for another unexpected announcement, he still stared open-mouthed at the display screen. His two recent acquaintances had turned out to be the leaders of their respective medical associations, and both were conservative-leaning organizations. He suddenly understood their reactions when he had told them the previous night that he was going to participate in the contest. While it was a surprise, it wouldn't bring any particular advantage for him. They would naturally support their own subordinates and team members, rather than him. After the host finished introducing the judges, she explained the rules of the competition. There would be three rounds, appraisal, worth 20 points, pulse inspection, worth 30 points, and quake disease, worth 50 points, making a possible maximum total of 100 points. The judges could also award a further 10 points at their own discretion during the final round. The team with the most points would be declared the champions. The prizes were a rare ancient medical dictionary provided by the medicine general, three perfect prescriptions, the right to research a range of free medicinal herbs for an entire year, a number of rare medicinal herbs to use as the winning association saw fit, as well as a personal meeting with the president. It was a very valuable reward and was much coveted. The host finally got the competition underway, calling, I hereby announce that the first round will begin now. A simulator had been placed in each tent, and they all hummed into life as the power was switched on. Aiden and his team eagerly read the question that was displayed on the simulator's screen. At the same time, a countdown timer began ticking in the upper right corner. It showed that the teams had 20 minutes to finish the task. Garrett said, It looks like we have to complete this prescription. It looks pretty simple. Let me answer this one. Aiden nodded, and Garrett began excitedly working at the keyboard. As soon as he finished adding to the prescription, another question appeared, adding to the complexity of the case. Hmm, said Garrett. We have to be careful how we amend this prescription so it remains appropriate for the case. As each question was completed, the following questions added a complication to the case that tested the practitioner's ability to maintain a satisfactory and effective prescription. It was a difficult test of the doctor's familiarity with the drugs and effects needed to ensure a cure. Most of the questions were not too difficult, and Garrett and the other doctors were able to enter the correct responses. Tyson took on the challenge of the more difficult questions, and everything was going well, until the last question appeared on the screen. When they read it, everyone was perplexed, and even Tyson stared blankly at the simulator for a long time. 
He seemed to be at a complete loss. He said, Vice Chair, I think you should take a look at this question. Aiden walked over to the screen and looked with great curiosity at the problematic challenge. The questions that the teams had to answer related to analyzing a medical case and then formulating a suitable prescription. Aiden was no stranger to this kind of challenge, as it was similar to the one he had worked on against Newt Winston a little while earlier back at their base. The current case caused him to think very hard. The virtual patient was described as suffering from excessive wind as well as acid reflux, which was an unusual combination of gastrointestinal anomalies. The patient also was suffering from imbalances in the circulatory and respiratory systems. It was frustrating that no age was given for the patient, so accurate diagnosis was even more difficult. It was a complex and challenging case. It was crucial that the prescription was completed within the time limit. Jenna looked in alarm at the timer. This is just impossible, she cried, blinking back tears. There were only three minutes left. The rest of the team were very downcast and lost a lot of hope. Tyson suggested, maybe we should pass on this question and see if we can make up some ground in the next challenge. I wonder if the other associations have questions as unusual as this one, said Garrett. Aiden looked sharply at him and reached for the keyboard. Meanwhile, in the New York City Medical Association's tent on the other side of the square, Newt Winston was leading his team of doctors in their first round challenge. They encountered little difficulty and comfortably answered all the questions. Newt's nephew, Marcus Gilpin, was a member of the team. Newt took Marcus to one side in a quiet corner of the tent and whispered, Is there any problem? With an evil chuckle, Marcus said, Don't worry, Uncle Newt. I was very careful to make sure I altered the program in a way that no one will be able to detect it. Aiden and his team will be besides themselves by now, that's for sure. Newt nodded in satisfaction. The last question is the one that has the most possible responses and the highest potential score. They simply must not be allowed to answer it correctly. Back in Aiden's tent, he was getting to work at the simulator. As soon as he began, he detected a very strong reaction. Triggering proficient level computing ability. Abnormal application algorithm detected. Program modification identified. His worst suspicions were confirmed. Garrett's hesitation and confusion had led him to investigate the program for tampering, and he found obvious signs of problems with the final question. Aiden guessed that the Arkland City Medical Association was the only one experiencing any kind of anomaly. He knew who was behind the corruption. Glancing at the timer on the screen, he knew he had no time to lose. He began typing quickly. Vice Chair, you don't think you'll be able to answer in time, do you? Asked Tyson. Intently, the entire membership watched him working, their eyes moving rapidly as his fingers danced across the keys. Triggering finger flexibility at proficient level. Writing speed automatically increased. Triggering medical arts grandmaster level. Automatically writing the optimum formula. Incredibly, in no time at all, a prescription was completed on the screen. Aiden kept writing. The complex case required a number of formulations to be applied. The onlookers took a little while to realize that Aiden had decided to create prescriptions for all possible combinations of effective treatments for patients of any age, as that vital information had been removed from the original challenge question. Only someone with profound medical knowledge would be able to understand what was required for all situations and complications. The doctor would need to have great confidence in his knowledge and understanding of how to apply the various herbs and drugs. Everyone gazed in awe at Aiden as he worked. All the spectators were filled with admiration at his unprecedented display of skill. Insight member worship. Charm plus one. Aiden finally exhaled and stopped working, with the timer showing there was one second to spare. It had been an extremely thrilling three minutes, and everyone watching also let out a long sigh of relief. A bell sounded, and the screen went black. Each terminal's answers would be sent to the main server, and results would be automatically calculated. The results would be announced immediately. It took a very short time, and the host was standing ready in front of the microphone. She said, now, let us review the results of the first round of the competition. The graphic on screen displayed the points scored for each team. In the New York City tent, Marcus and Newt looked confidently to the screen. Marcus predicted, I am sure we will be in first place. Just as he forecast, New York City received the maximum 20 points, and the result was received with a great deal of celebrating and cheering from both the association members and the other New York City supporters. Only Newt and Marcus looked less than pleased. Newt said, There are four teams that got full points. 
I had hoped that the first round would not have been so close. The other three top scoring associations were from the South, Wilmington, and Philadelphia. The host cried, let's congratulate the four top scoring teams. After the applause died away, she said, here is a message to the other teams. Don't forget there are still many points to be awarded, so don't be disheartened and try your best. The other two teams were very strong, so it was no surprise to see them in the lead, but Philadelphia had surpassed expectations to be up at the top of the leaderboard. Newton Marcus found it particularly hard to stomach, considering that they had conspired to make it almost impossible for Aiden's team to submit the correct responses. It seems like we may have underestimated Aiden, grumbled Newt. Are our people ready for the second round? Marcus replied, Yes, we're all ready. Don't worry, we will widen the gap this round. I am sure of it. There was a short rest period before the second round, which was called pulse analysis. The challenge was designed to test the doctor's ability to make accurate diagnoses by taking patients' pulses. Misjudging the rate and quality of a patient's pulse could lead to an inaccurate diagnosis and other problems, so pulse taking was regarded as one of the most important skills a doctor could develop. In the second round challenge, the audience was free to enter any tent, as the pulses that would be judged by the doctors would come from the spectators themselves. If an audience member was satisfied with the service they received, they could award a point to the association, up to a maximum of 30 points. The results of the second round would be decided solely by audience members. As soon as the rules were explained, spectators rushed into the central area. Many of those with health conditions tried to be seen first. Interestingly, about half of the audience tried to enter the New York City tent, while the other tents received a random scattering of people. Wow, cried Jenna. This looks a little like some kind of cheating. It must be a setup. Why would so many people be going to them otherwise? She was very resentful. Tyson said, don't be too worried. Remember, they can only see a maximum of 30 people. He pointed and said, look, here comes someone. I bet they're looking for us. Garrett Slater began taking the boy's pulse and looked very thoughtful. He said quietly, hmm, your stomach is showing signs of inflammation. You should avoid eating fried foods. It's very important. The young man scoffed and pulled his hand away. He stood up and whined. Who are you, my mother? Life wouldn't be much fun if I couldn't eat some fried food now and then. It doesn't hurt me or anyone I know. You're talking nonsense. He began to leave the tent, looking most disappointed. Everyone shook their heads in dismay. It seemed like they had just had their second failure. Just before the boy reached the entrance, a strong, clear voice called after him. Have you been experiencing a sore throat lately, as if your throat was burning? The boy stopped suddenly, and a look of disbelief crossed his face. He turned around slowly to find himself looking into the face of a handsome young man. He hadn't taken much notice of him while he had been sitting in the examination chair. He seemed to command the respect of all the doctors in the tent, and the young boy assumed he was probably the man in charge. Aiden went on, and I think you would have been noticing that your acne has flared up. The boy looked as though he had just seen a ghost and said, How do you know that? Not even my roommates have noticed that. I noticed, said Aiden, walking over to him. I also noticed that recently, you've been eating a lot of certain types of cake that has chili peppers as one of its main ingredients. Hot pepper pancakes, said the boy, breaking into a grin. They sell them near the school gates. They're amazing and really delicious. How did you know? The others in the tent were just as incredulous as the young boy. They couldn't believe that Aiden could know so much just by looking at a patient. He had truly formidable diagnostic skills. It's not so difficult when you know what to look for, he said, clasping his hands confidently behind his back. The pepper is produced in New Mexico, where the soil there makes it irresistibly sweet and not too hot. They go mad for it in New York City. It's incredibly popular. It's okay to eat some of it occasionally, but as you heard Dr. Slater tell you, when you eat it too much along with too much other fried food, it can cause your skin to produce a surplus of sebaceous oil, and pimples and acne are the results. Looking hard at the boy's face, he said, I know that you think it's worth it to enjoy life and eat as much oily food as you like, but you only get one face, and yours could be permanently disfigured by scarring it if you don't take care of yourself. The youth turned pale. Aiden's message had hit home. As a typical teenager, he set a lot of store by how he was judged by his peers. Just as many teenagers began to care more about their appearance at that age, he was highly self-conscious about being accepted into his friendship group. He felt his mouth go dry and looked at Aiden imploringly. 
He said, Doctor, you have to help me, please. Give me your hand, Aiden said reassuringly. The boy hurriedly placed his wrist into Aiden's palm. Aiden examined his pulse, listening intently for a moment. He took a pad from his pocket and briskly wrote out a prescription. Take this three times a day, he instructed. You should see a lot of improvement in about a week. There's no reason that your face won't recover fully, as long as you lay off the hot pepper pancakes and fries. Young boy thanked them profusely and rushed happily from the tent. He stopped at the entry and took a sticker from his pocket, and beaming back at Aiden, pasted it on the outside of the tent. It was the approval sticker of the spectators who were happy with their pulse examinations. The Philadelphia Medical Association had finally obtained their first point of the second round. A resounding cheer rose from the tent, and from the New York City tent, some distance away, Dr. Newt Winston and Marcus Gilpin looked darkly toward the sounds of Philadelphian joy. Jenna looked in the direction Tyson was pointing. A woman in her 50s walked briskly over to the doctor's area. Tyson greeted her with a smile. He said, Would you like to have your pulse examined? The woman said, Yes, I would. Doctor, I would like it if you could tell me something about my health. I would like to know if there's anything wrong. Please, take a seat, said Tyson. He took her wrist in his hand and began checking. He was very experienced and acted quickly and professionally. He said solicitously, Your pulse is quite stable, but I can detect a small issue with your liver and your lymph nodes. It's nothing to worry about. You must be sure to get plenty of rest and not overexert yourself. Quite unexpectedly, the woman looked at him with distaste. She said, What kind of nonsense is that? Do you think you can tell all that about me from holding my wrist? Garrett Slater leapt to Tyson's defense. He said, The doctor is telling you the truth. You're quite okay, but we don't want you to become any sicker. What are you talking about? You're all quacks, just quacks, she cried. She leapt to her feet and ran from the tent, crying out as she went. Don't bother coming into this tent, everyone. It's full of con artists and quacks. They have no idea. Garrett tried to run after her to explain, but she was too quick and soon was lost in the crowd. Hey, you're just spreading false rumors, he cried after her. Aiden grabbed his arm and stopped him from following the woman into the crowd. Don't you see, he said. They're just trying to make things difficult for us. He had watched the whole episode from the sidelines and had seen that the woman was obviously insincere and determined to lie to cause them trouble. It was clear that she had been paid to behave irrationally. Vice Chair, are you saying someone is messing with our association? Asked Garrett, as the realization also dawned upon him. Aiden picked up his teacup to take a sip, but there was a steely determination in his eyes. As time went on, the New York City Association reached their limit of 30 people and stopped accepting newcomers. The people who had not been accepted there gradually began to visit other tents. Sadly, the woman who complained had spread her message very effectively, and no one entered the Arkland City tent at all. Jenna and Anita were very bored and went outside to find Poppy, who was looking around gloomily. A pedestrian who was hurrying past stopped suddenly and stared at the two young women. He was quite young and showed traces of acne on his adolescent complexion. He stared hard at them for a little while and lingered at the entrance. Anita said, Please, would you like us to take your pulse? He seemed quite shy and didn't make eye contact with either of them, but agreed to let them take him inside. Anita and Jenna were very pleased that someone had ventured near their entryway and quickly brought him into the tent. They took him over to Garrett, who prepared to take his pulse. When the boy saw that he was going to be examined by a young man, he hesitated, and pointing to Jenna and Anita, he said, But I thought they were going to be the ones examining me. Jenna smiled and said, This is our resident doctor. He is way more experienced than I am. You will receive a more accurate result if he examines you. The young boy shouted, Expert my butt! and tried to leave. Garrett quickly grabbed his wrist and held on tightly. The boy shook with fury. He said, You're a monster! You can't take someone's pulse by force! Garrett said, It's not up to you anymore! Still holding the boy's wrist firmly, he turned his attention to examining his pulse. When the indignant middle-aged woman had first run from the Philadelphia tent shouting her disapproval, Newt had been very pleased with Marcus. Huh, whoever you chose played her part perfectly, Marcus, he had said. I think that should do the trick. They had both thought that Aiden's team would fare very badly in the second round. Suddenly, Newt noticed Poppy Hansen standing near the entrance to the Philadelphia tent. Hmm, he said. She looks familiar. I wonder where I've seen her before. She was a long way away, and it was too difficult for him to be sure. Where? asked Marcus, peering toward the tent entrance. While he couldn't see who Newt was referring to, 
He did notice the teenager entered the tent at Jenna and Anita's invitation. They looked for a long time, but they didn't see the boy come out. Finally, they saw him leave the tent smiling and place a sticker on the entryway. They became downcast. Don't worry, it's only one point, said Marcus. They consoled themselves by looking at the lines of people waiting to have their pulses checked by the New York City doctors. As they surveyed the situation, the schoolboy rushed over to some other boys waiting in the New York City queue. Hey, he greeted them. Don't wait there, guys. Come with me. Quick, Frankie, Lofty, Philip, come on. He tugged at their arms trying to get them to follow him. Damien, what is the matter with you? We're almost at the front of the line, said Lofty. We aren't going to get the chance to be examined by the deputy chairman of the New York City Medical Association any other time in our whole lives. He's their best guy. I really want him to be the one that checks me out. Hey, listen, replied Damien. What do you mean? Newt Winston, that old freak? I've just found a doctor who's way smarter than him. If you don't get to him soon, it might be too late. Better than Dr. Winston? Asked Philip. I don't believe it. Damien assured him. No, he's great. If I'm wrong, I'll buy you those sneakers you've been saving up for. I'll get you all a pair. They looked back and forth at each other, and finally the promise of a new pair of the latest sneakers was too much. They ran from the New York City line and lined up at the Arkland City tent. Newt and Marcus watched them leaving with dismay. Marcus tried to make light of it, saying, It's okay, it's just three or four people missing from our line. Damien's dubious young classmates were dragged into the Philadelphia tent. They found Aiden still in charge. He examined each boy's pulse and told them about some of the things they needed to do to remain strong and healthy. He gave them prescriptions to help them solve any medical issues he discovered. It wasn't long before his direct manner and professional confidence assured them that they should award him their points. They happily placed their scores next to Damien's. Not without a little relief, Damien said, See, I wasn't lying, was I? No sneakers for you. Sure, Damien, you did good, said Lofty. He even told me things that were wrong with my family's genes. Amazing. Philip agreed. I thought this place was full of quacks. I didn't expect them to actually know all about me. We should get Daisy and the others over here before it all ends, Damien suggested. Oh, so it's Daisy you're trying to impress, is it? Teased Frankie. Weren't you also sweet on Andrea as well, from the same dorm? Sure, Frankie, sure, Damien replied, a little embarrassed. Whatever. We better send them a message before they miss out because the round ends. It took no time at all before the message spread. Rumors of the talented doctor in the Arkland City tent reached around the square, and very soon, the tent was tightly packed with people waiting to see Aiden and receive the benefit of his medical knowledge. The staff struggled to make sure that everyone stayed in line patiently, and soon, the line stretched out of the entrance and into the area outside. With only a limited number of spectators allowed in the square for the second round, having so many of them lining up in the tent of the Philadelphia Medical Association meant that other tents had very few visitors. Even the usually very popular New York City Medical Association was affected, and numbers there were way lower than they would have expected. A few people lined up there had heard about the expert in the Philadelphia tent and left to try their luck. Newt tried desperately to persuade them to stay, but they couldn't be convinced. He and Marcus began to appear very worried while they watched their queue get shorter and shorter. Even when the limit of 30 patients had been reached, Aiden told his team to keep checking pulses until the bell to end the second round rang out. Those who had missed out left very reluctantly, and a great many tried to get Aiden's contact details so they could ask for a private consultation after the competition. Aiden didn't think it was ethical to collect patients' details, so he refused all similar requests. When the last person had been examined, Everyone sat back and massaged their sore wrists and hands, except for Aiden, who seemed to feel no aches, and Poppy Hansen, who had been outside. The doctors had examined many more than 30 people and helped most of them. They had also learned a great deal under Aiden's guidance, which was part of the reason Jonathan Shu had assembled the team in the first place. The host returned to face the camera. She said, And now the results of the second round. All eyes lifted to look at the massive screens over the square. At the top of the list, it was impossible to miss the Arkland City Medical Association's perfect score. The host's voice rang out. Congratulations, Arkland City! Its team leads after a second perfect round, the only team to score two perfect rounds in succession. A huge round of applause filled the square. It seemed that the young boys had done an effective job of spreading the word about the Philadelphia team's good reputation and skills. 
It was devastating for the New York City team that so many of the people lining up to be examined had transferred to the Philadelphia tent. It was quite a humiliating experience for Newt to have his team trailing Aidens at this stage of the contest. In the meantime, the judging panel were discussing the results. Deb Tailby from Burlington looked hard at Pippa O'Connor from New York City. She remarked, I've always respected Philadelphia's strength, but I never regarded them as being particularly aligned to any factions. She was making a subtle point to Pippa regarding the slide down the rankings that New York City was undergoing. It wasn't often that they were not the winner or at least near the top of the associations. Deb privately marveled at Aiden's powers. Sailor Ben Tyne didn't hold back. A member of the conservative group, he mocked. Gee, New York City doesn't appear to be doing so well in this year's contest. The radical group didn't let his antagonism go unanswered. Brendan Neal of Providence and Simon Regan from Augusta joined forces to return insults. The amount of tension in the judging area rose noticeably. Pippa showed little emotion and said, I would have thought that with your team so low on the list, you wouldn't have had enough breath to waste arguing here. How about you try doing something to get some more points for your team? She made her point, and the judges stopped arguing. Sailor and Deb looked quite embarrassed. As Pippa had pointed out, their teams were not performing very well so far, and without a big improvement in the final round, they would finish near last. Seeing that the mockery and conversation had stopped, Pippa said, Excuse me, everyone, I need to take a rest break. I won't be away very long. At the end of the second round, all the teams were allowed a 20-minute rest break. Instead of making her way to the restrooms, Pippa O'Connor went to a quiet corner of the square and made a phone call. Her face was set in a grim frown as she spoke harshly into the handset. You'd better win today, Newt Winston, she hissed, or I'll see to it that you end up as the herbalist in the meanest one-horse town I could find. She cut off the call and glanced around the square with her hawk-like gaze. I'll win this contest today and get control of the admissions, she thought, if it's the last thing I do. In his tent... Newt had broken out into a cold sweat. Marcus approached him nervously and asked, Uncle Newt, what did the chair have to say? Newt tugged at his collar and dabbed at the sweat on his forehead. There's no way around it, he said. I didn't want to have to bring out Rex, but I can't think of anything else to do. Go and arrange everything right now. Yes, sir, said Marcus and scurried away. Before the third round got underway, two unexpected guests appeared at the Arkland City Medical Association's tent. When the two influential figures turned up uninvited, several of the leaders were quite surprised. Garrett and the others recognized Marcus, but they had no idea that he was related to Newt. They wondered what they were doing together. Newt said, Everyone, allow me to introduce my nephew, Marcus Gilpin. He wore an odd smile as if he was expecting some kind of reaction. Marcus greeted everyone, saying, Hello, we meet again. Garrett and the others immediately looked more warily at Newt and Marcus and wondered what they were up to. Noticing their change in demeanor, Newt felt a little more powerful and was proud that he seemed to be achieving his aim of disrupting the Philadelphia team's morale. The only one who was not the least intimidated was Aiden. He remained calm. He had already been speculating about the relationship between Newt and Marcus ever since he had first seen Marcus earlier. He resolved to keep intimidating Newt, as Marcus was relatively ineffective without his uncle's support. However, it seemed that Newt had decided that he had nothing to lose. Aiden shot a glance at Marcus and said easily, I see you got yourself clear of the rear guard team. I didn't think they would let you go so easily. They must really want you to appear in this competition. If I didn't know better, I would have guessed that the two of you have some kind of cozy thing going on with Captain Norman Ledger. If it's true, I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion with the authorities. I've heard that colluding with the rear guard patrol in the carrying out of their duties is a serious crime. Aiden's casual, conversive tone made Newt and Marcus turn ashen and begin protesting. You'll see, Aiden. This time, Arkland City will lose. Just wait, cried Newt. Shut up, you! You! cried Marcus as Newt dragged him away. Newt thought it was best that they got out of the tent before Aiden decided to say too much more. When everyone saw the uncle and his nephew become so rattled after they had entered so arrogantly, they lost all traces of being intimidated and began to laugh heartily, releasing all remaining tension in the tent. It wasn't long before the third round, called Quake Disease, began. It was a competition based in practical work. The aim was to diagnose and cure a chronic disease. It would test a doctor's experience as well as their performance. According to the rules, a patient would be randomly selected for each team, as it happened, 
there would be no ordinary patients examined in the third round. The patients and their diseases were drawn from the case records of the New York City Medical Association and consisted of the most difficult and stubborn in their files. The scoring process of the third round was very special. The score would be given by the patient. If a doctor was not able to cure the patient's illness, clearly they would not score well. Luck also played an important part as the allocation of patients was completely random. Patient numbers began to slide across the screen. Each patient held a number in their hands, and they waited at the edge of the square, looking up hopefully as the numbers were allocated to the teams. For some, it was their last hope of finding a cure. Watching the numbers, Aiden frowned. He had detected another anomaly. Without seeming to think, he opened the computing ability. Activating proficient level computing ability. Analyzing. Anomaly detected in randomization program. The anomaly repeated, and then... As quickly as they began moving, the numbers stopped. Aiden barely had time to curse when he saw that his team had been allocated patient number one. Even though Aiden hadn't set his eyes on his patient, he knew that it would be a most difficult and challenging case. Once he actually saw the patient, he realized that he had underestimated the depths to which the New York City team would sink. Four strong men carried the patient in a bed to the stage. He was covered by blankets and his face could not be clearly seen. From the bulk that the blanket seemed to be shrouding, it was possible to tell that the patient was well over six feet tall and very large framed. The bed itself was an extra long model. Everyone watching felt as though it was going to be a hopeless task. With the score for the team being completely dependent on the patient's satisfaction, it was impossible to see how he could award any points after being carried unconscious. Even if a cure was attempted, there was no way of telling how successful it might be. If the patient didn't recover in the time allowed, the score would still be too hard to award if they were still asleep. Garrett Slater was beside himself with anger and frustration. This has to be some kind of joke, he spluttered. We're being harassed. He wanted to talk to the organizers immediately. Wait, cried Aiden. He held out his hand to Garrett. He looked at the figure in the bed and became lost in thought. Anita and Poppy cried out at the same time. In the judging area, Sailor and Deb were very angry as they watched the scene unfold on the screen. Sailor said, What's the meaning of this? How can the organizers allocate such a patient? It's clear that there's been some kind of collusion. The Arkland City team has no realistic way of collecting any points. Even the progressives, Simon Regan and Brandon Neal, were shifting in their seats with embarrassment. They weren't sure how to proceed, or what they should say. Finally, Brendan said, Well, all the patients are randomly selected by the system, remember? Arkland City seems to have drawn the short straw this time. They tried to insinuate that it was merely luck that any of the teams could have been allocated this patient, even New York City. Pippa O'Connor smiled, but her toes tapped apprehensively under the table. Sailor and Deb fell silent and watched with their hearts in their mouths. The leader of the four men who had carried the patient in said to Aiden, Professor, Doctor, please, we are from East Rook. Please do whatever you can for our friend, Andrew. As soon as they laid the bed down, they began imploring Aiden to help them. They appeared for all the world to be simple, uncomplicated people from a rural background. But Aiden could tell that the men were in disguise, and he knew that instantly from what he could see on the bed. He focused on nothing but the patient, blocked out all noise and voices, and quietly, carefully lifted the blanket. The rest of the group followed Aiden to inspect the young man's body. As expected... No one could tell that he had been poisoned by the neurotoxin apart from Aiden. The four men from the New York City Medical Association let out a sigh of relief when they noticed the rest of the team's confused frowns. Looks like you guys have no way to treat Rex, one of them said. Let's find another doctor. As they faked their disappointment, they got ready to carry the bed away. Hold on, said Aiden while pressing one hand on the bed. No matter how hard the four of them tried to move the bed, they couldn't make it budge. Their faces turned red as they realized they were trapped. Who said we had no way to treat him? Aiden continued. He smiled at the horrified expressions on the other doctor's faces and ordered, Get my equipment! Jenna immediately left to get what he needed while Tyson and Garrett's eyes lit up. They had heard about Aiden's skills with energy point manipulation, and they were excited to finally have the chance to see him in action. After getting ready, Aiden used the miraculous recovery method on the man's head. As he worked the pressure point massage technique around Rex's face, the blood in the young man's eyes faded away, and his restless body gradually calmed down. When they saw his state was improving, 
the four men started to panic. They knew that if Aiden managed to treat Rex, he would reveal what they had done, and the entire New York City Medical Association would face an unprecedented disaster. They tried to sneak out to report to Dr. Winston and the others, but a small figure suddenly stopped them at the entrance of the tent and stared at them. The four men fiercely glared at Poppy, and one of them quietly said, Get out of the way, little brat! Her face revealed a wicked smile as she said, You all deserve to die. She then blew a stream of green dust onto their faces. They started screaming, What is it? It's so itchy! The four of them rolled on the ground, scratching their faces. Tyson and the others were shocked by what had happened and didn't understand what was going on. Poppy was usually so lovely and calm, they couldn't believe she was capable of doing such a thing. There's no need to panic, Aiden called to them, still focused on performing his treatment. He didn't turn his head, but seemed to know what had happened at the door. His voice calmed Tyson and the others, but they couldn't stop shooting fearful glances Poppy's way. She looked down at the men on the ground and demanded, Whose orders are you all following? If you tell me, I'll give you the antidote. The four of them shouted, Dr. Winston, he's the one responsible. Poppy nodded. She had thought Dr. Winston looked familiar to her. Now she was certain he was one of the horrible doctors who had invaded her home terrain. Quick, give us the antidote, shouted one of the men. It's so itchy. Poppy smiled evilly. I'll give you the antidote when he's cured, she said while pointing at Rex on the bed. You've made him suffer, so you owe him your patience. But I'll have more to collect from Dr. Winston when all this is done. All four of them felt desperate. If Aiden can't cure that man, will we feel itchy for the rest of our lives? They wondered. Suddenly, Jenna, who had been checking on the progress of the treatment, happily shouted, He's awake! Lifting the blanket revealed a burly figure. He was over six and a half feet tall with long, scraggly hair and a beard. The whole tent gasped. Jenna, Garrett, and the rest of the younger ones couldn't look away. The poor young man looked miserable. His four limbs were secured down to the bed with iron rings. His muscles were constantly twitching, and his eyes were red. He opened his mouth, which was full of blood, and let out a loud roar, saliva flowing out of his mouth. He looked like an animal that had been tied up. Tears began to stream down Anita's face before she even realized she was crying. Poppy stood with her fists clenched, shaking head to toe. Aiden lightly patted both women's shoulders to comfort them both. Poppy stared at the man on the bed and begged Aiden, Please, save him! Aiden nodded calmly. Leave it to me. This was obviously Rex, the man Poppy had been trying to find. Watching him lying on the bed, Aiden understood straight away that those four men had been lying about this man being from Eastrook. In fact, he'd already guessed who they were. Who else could they be other than members of the New York Association of Medicine, he realized. They're the ones who went up the mountain to kidnap Poppy's people. However, the four of them didn't seem to notice that their identities had been exposed, so they continued to act as normal. A few days ago, Rex got down to work, and I don't know why, but he started to convulse in the fields, one of them said. We were all scared. We tried to find doctors, another one added. But they've all said he couldn't be cured. Can you save him, doctor? The third man asked. Aiden noticed that although they spoke as if they were anxious, overall they seemed pretty relaxed. The association must have secretly done something to Rex to get him like this, creating a condition in him that they assumed Aiden would not be able to cure. He had to prove them wrong. Aiden proudly smiled at them and replied, Of course it can be cured. All four of them looked shocked as they shouted, What? How is that possible? They realized their mistake and one added calmly, What we mean is, how do you plan on treating him, doctor? Aiden smirked and looked down at the young man's body. Activating Grandmaster Level Medical Arts. Analyzing the physical condition of the target. Analysis completed. Target's illness area brain nerve. According to the analysis, the nerves in the brain are affected by neurotoxins, causing the mind to go crazy and the body to go out of control. Neurotoxins. Of course, thought Aiden. Among all types of toxins, neurotoxins were especially dangerous. Being poisoned by neurotoxins would not only damage the surface of the body, but also the root of the nerve. The resulting sensation was vicious and painful. It would cause a huge uproar in the medical world if people knew that the New York City Medical Association had used a neurotoxin on an innocent man. Aiden realized the association members had only done something so heinous because they were so confident that they wouldn't be caught. 
neurotoxins were notoriously difficult to detect. For most doctors, they would take expensive and invasive methods to find the toxin in the body. This was why many people referred to it as an invisible illness. Healing of incurable disease. Medical skill, plus one. Poison identification, plus one. Current progress, 99 out of 100. Current level, proficient level. The moment Rex opened his eyes, his muscles bulged and grunting, he shattered the sturdy iron rings binding him to the bed. Aiden suddenly felt the same strange power he had felt from Poppy's fellow mountain dwellers. It didn't feel quite accurate to call Rex a martial arts master. He was definitely a martial artist of some kind, but the way his energy circulated through his body was puzzling to Aiden. Usually, the energy of a fighter came from the center and was transmitted to every part of the body through the meridians. However, this young man's energy seemed to be circulating on a separate track in his body entirely. After he broke free from his bindings, he looked at Aiden, who was just next to him, and glared ferociously at his lab coat. You're one of those doctors, he growled, his eyes filled with killing intent. Retreat, shouted Aiden as he sensed something was wrong. He pushed Jenna and the others away, trying to get them to safety. But Rex was focused solely on Aiden. I'm going to kill you. He grabbed at Aiden's neck with both hands. Next to Rex, Aiden looked as small as a child. Rex bore down on him like a ferocious bear. Nobody had expected his reaction, and they all froze, horrified by Rex's actions. But Aiden faced Rex without any fear. He merely stretched out a palm and slapped the top of the young man's head. It only appeared to be a casual, even light slap, but it drove Rex to the ground. His knees dented the floor as he fell, proving the power behind the palm strike. But Rex didn't seem to be finished. He clenched his jaw and was about to stand up. However, he felt a sudden pain in his back as if he was being weighed down by boulders. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't stand up. Let me check something, said Aiden. He pushed Rex all the way down to the ground and placed a foot on his back. Energy shot out the bottom of his foot and entered Rex's body as he activated his discerning ability. Activating proficient level discerning ability. Target specialty, not enough data in the database. Unable to analyze it. Combat style, insufficient data in the database. Temporarily unable to analyze it. Threat level, low. Target weakness, slow movement. What on earth is this? Aiden thought as he noticed the meridians in the young man's body. It's happening again, an independent circulatory track. He discovered that the young man's aura was flowing through this independent track. However, this wasn't what he was most concerned about. Rex's pattern of energy circulation looked disturbingly similar to the one he had found in Aunt River's body. Could they be related? He wondered. Aiden felt confused. He recalled the words of his grandfather. Promise me one thing, Aiden. If you find anything strange about your aunt one day, don't forget that she'll always be part of our family. He felt a headache coming on as he realized that his family wasn't as simple as it looked. They all seemed to be covered in mystery. Should I keep investigating? He thought. Aiden was so puzzled that he forgot to keep the pressure of his foot on the man's back. Rex sensed that he had an opportunity to throw Aiden off and escape, but the others noticed in time. In the middle of the group screaming, Poppy, who was at the door, suddenly shouted, Rex, stop! Rex froze as he looked at Poppy in disbelief. He said uncertain, Princess, how did they catch you? Poppy walked around the four men she had incapacitated before, who were still laying on the ground scratching themselves. She looked up at Aiden and said, Let go of him. You wouldn't dare mess around with me. Aiden gently lifted his foot up. She bent down and helped Rex get up. As she supported him, she sighed and said, The others and I are fine. Don't worry. I wasn't captured. I came to save you. She pointed at Aiden and said, He's our savior, not an enemy. You misunderstood. Savior? Rex questioned, looking at Aiden in confusion. Aiden... This is Rex. I'm sorry about his behavior. He didn't know, Poppy calmly told him. She then looked at Rex and said irritated, If it wasn't for him, you'd still be poisoned. You need to thank him. Poisoned? Rex asked. He then realized what had happened. I remember now. That group of jealous men in white coats injected me with something. I can't remember anything after that. Aiden nodded. That explained why Rex had become so angry when he had spotted Aiden's lab coat. Rex suddenly took a deep breath and kneeled again. His huge knees hit the ground and shook the entire tent. I'm really sorry. 
please accept my apology, he said. Aiden looked at him, not knowing whether to laugh or cry. Rex had instantly transformed from a killing machine to a remorseful kid. Aiden took Rex's arm and helped him stand. Rex raised his eyebrows. He knew his own size and weight well, and he knew how difficult he was to move around. Yet not only had Aiden easily stopped his attack before, but now he was helping him stand as if he weighed nothing. Rex looked surprised as he said, You've got some serious skills. Aiden raised one finger to his lips, shushing him. He then whispered, We don't need to talk about that right now. Rex sealed his lips and nodded a few times. Everyone else in the tent was startled. Both men had kept their voices low so that nobody could hear their conversation. But as much as the others wanted to ask what was going on, they knew it was probably best to leave it alone. All that mattered was that Rex had been saved. During all this, Pippa had been monitoring the security cameras to keep an eye on each team's progress in the final round of the competition. She squinted at the screens in confusion. What is going on with Arkland City Medical Association? Pippa thought. She called to her staff. Ask the security team to bring people over to check on the Arkland City team. It only took a few minutes for the team to reach the tent. Aiden smirked when he recognized the security team's leader. Captain Ledger, long time no see. It was, of course, the captain of the team, Norman Ledger, who had taken Marcus Gilpin and Tommy away in town. But now Aiden was certain that he was really working for Dr. Winston. The moment he entered the tent, his eyes scanned the area. When he noticed Rex standing in the corner, he looked shocked. The four men who were still on the ground all hugged the captain's trousers and begged, Please save us! Aiden pretended to be surprised by their reactions. He turned to Norman with his eyebrows raised high. So, you know these men? Norman's expression changed. He bitterly replied, Who told you that? I don't know who they are! He kicked them away and didn't even glance back as he stormed away to find Dr. Winston. When he reached the New York City tent, he snapped, Something happened. How did Rex wake up? Dr. Winston, who was treating a patient, dropped everything when he heard the captain's words. He walked out of the tent with Marcus, who was also shocked. As soon as the two of them came out, they spotted Aiden standing in front of his tent's entrance, which was opposite to theirs. They also noticed the muscular man standing right beside him who glared at them with hatred in his eyes. They both felt uncomfortable as they stared at Aiden and Rex from the entrance of their own tent. Dr. Winston muttered, that nerve toxin is our finest. How did he wake up? It must be Aiden's doing, Uncle Newt, replied Marcus. They both looked fearfully at Aiden, who still had a proud smile on his face. Don't worry, it's still the chairman's decision, Marcus said to his uncle. He said it as if he was trying to reassure Dr. Winston. But really, he was trying to make himself feel better, and he didn't sound confident at all. Rex's recovery had messed up all their plans. He didn't know how they were going to turn the situation around. Aiden had defeated them yet again. If time could be reversed, Marcus would definitely not have chosen to provoke him. An announcement rang out across the conference space. The third round of the competition has ended. The results will be announced now. On the big screen, the results for each team were displayed again. As each team had within it some of the most skilled doctors in the country, every association had done quite well. A high number of patients had been cured. Consequently, there were also quite a number of teams who had obtained full marks in the third round. Providence, Burlington, and Wilmington were all qualified. The Arkland City Medical Association naturally scored well after curing Rex, which, adding to the results of the first two rounds, kept them at the top of the list. Because Dr. Winston had abandoned his patient halfway through their treatment when he had become distracted by Aiden's progress, he did not receive full marks. As a result, the New York City Medical Association fell behind Arkland City by 25 points, but this wasn't the final result. Next, the five judges will add points to their favorite team. According to the rules of the competition, each judge had 10 points, which could be freely given to the group they thought performed best. This was also the team's last chance to earn enough points to win the competition. Everyone, please be fair, Pippa said. In the past, judges usually gave the points to their own associations. She looked at Brendan and Simon and then wrote down her vote, so she didn't notice the look that Sailor and Deb discreetly gave each other. The five judges lowered their heads and wrote down their decisions on their boards. Once they put their pens down, the host excitedly clapped his hands and faced the crowd. Now we will announce the final results! A table of results appeared on the big screen, and loud gasps could be heard everywhere. 
No one had expected Pippa, Brendan, and Simon to all vote for the New York City Medical Association. What was even more surprising, though, was that Sailor and Deb had also chosen to vote for the same organization, which was the Arkland City Medical Association. After counting the votes, the New Yorkers had gained 30 points, and although Arkland City had only gotten 20, they were still ahead by 15 points. If nothing else changed, it was clear who the champions would be. Hippa, Brandon, and Simon were displeased with the results and shot up from their seats with bewildered looks on their faces. Brendan and Simon glared at Sailor and Deb. How could you both vote for the same association? Deb sneered and retorted sarcastically. Didn't the three of you vote for New York City? And since we're asking questions, I want to know something too. Why didn't you and Simon vote for your own associations? The color drained slightly from Brendan and Simon's faces, but they quickly recovered and became defensive. I have a perfectly good reason for my vote. Our association scores are too low. It made more sense to give our points to New York City. And what about you two? Why did you give your points to Arkland City? Sailor snorted, his eyes blazing with pride. Our reasoning was the same. He and Deb looked at each other, trying not to grin. Both of their associations were also on the lower end of the scale, and even if they had given them the 10 points, they would still have had no chance of winning. Their friendship with Aiden, coupled with their dissatisfaction with Pippa, also influenced their decision to give their points to Arkland City. As long as the radical New Yorkers didn't win the competition, they were happy. No matter how much Pippa had schemed, she hadn't expected Sailor and Deb to do such a thing to affect the final result. She stared at the two of them, clenching her teeth so tightly that her jaw began to crack. Good, 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 she hissed, hitting the table with her fist. Her hair looked like it was sticking up, and she had a murderous look on her face. The host was frightened by her expression and trembled. Chairwoman O'Connor, do you want to announce the results? He asked nervously. Of course not, she roared. Sailor and Deb looked up in shock and anger and met Pippa's cold eyes. I have evidence to prove that the Arkland City Medical Association's third round result is invalid, she said slowly and menacingly. Sailor and Deb were stunned. What evidence? Pippa revealed a chilling smile. We have evidence that patient number one is not sick at all, she said quietly. That means that the Arkland City Medical Association treated a person who was not sick. This round of results is therefore inconclusive. What do you mean the patient wasn't sick? Sailor asked. How could you say that? Pippa stared and glared at Sailor. Someone call Vice Chairman Winston over, she said coldly. Soon, Newt appeared in front of the judges. Vice Chairman Winston, Pippa asked quietly. Let me ask you, is patient number one really sick? Newt shook his head vigorously. No, Chairwoman, patient number one is quite healthy. If that's the case, why was a healthy person in the ward? Deb shouted. Newt wasn't afraid, though. He simply smiled and replied. Because there was a problem with the database, Chairwoman Tailby, it appears that the patient was transferred to the ward by mistake. You? Sailor's face was red as he glared at Newt. Then why didn't you tell the Arkland City team before the competition? Why are you only saying something now? Let's not waste any more time arguing about the past, Pippa interrupted. To solve this issue, we will give Arkland City some compensation. But we must also follow the rules of the competition, so their results in the third round are indeed invalid. She smiled and continued. Therefore, the winner of this competition will be the New York City Medical Association. Announce the results, she commanded the host. She refused to give Sailor and Deb any chance to continue defending Arkland City, and they were silenced by the host, who cleared his throat as he picked up the microphone and prepared to share the news with the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests and participants, according to the final results, the winner of this year's National Ancient Medicine Exchange Conference is the new... Wait! A booming voice spread across the square, attracting the attention of the spectators and cameras. They all turned to see an old man walking toward the judges' table. His tanned skin and thinning hair made him look like an ordinary man from the countryside, but he had an authoritative presence that made everyone silent. Everyone, except for Sailor and Deb, looked at him in shock. Even the security guards were amazed, and they didn't stop him from going on stage. He quickly walked to the host and snatched the microphone out of his hand. Then he stood in front of Pippa, uttering an earth-shattering roar that made the hair stand up on the back of her neck. Pippa, you should be ashamed of yourself. His voice echoed across the square, 
its power shaking the ground and making everyone uneasy. Who is this man? They whispered among themselves. How dare he insult the chairwoman to her face like that? Who does he think he is? What puzzled everyone even more than the man's identity, though, was that Pippa showed no signs of anger at all. Instead, she lowered her head nervously like a guilty child in front of an adult. D Dean? Aren't you sick? She stuttered. Did she just call him Dean? A member of the crowd whispered. There was only one person that Pippa would call Dean, and that was the head of the Eastern Medical Authority, the highest ranking medical professional in the region. Aiden looked at the familiar face and smiled. Caleb. He shook his head and scoffed. Caleb. What a sly old man. It really was Caleb. The same Caleb who had taken Sailor Deb and Aiden up the mountain. As it turned out, he was actually the president of the Eastern Medical Authority. It was no wonder that Caleb was able to find Aiden so quickly in the city. He definitely had eyes and ears all over abundance. It also explained why Sailor and Deb showed him so much respect. As Caleb held such a high position in the medical world, he had no attachment to material things, which was why he could give Aiden the Rainbow Blossom as a reward without any regret. He had many medicinal herbs at his disposal. Sailor and Deb weren't surprised and greeted him with a smile. Brendan and Simon, on the other hand, looked sick. The moment Caleb appeared, their faces turned pale, and they watched him fearfully as he glared at Pippa. What a disappointment, he said coldly. This was a test for you. I wanted to see whether or not you could take on and handle this big responsibility. I didn't expect that you would put on such a good show. He pointed at Pippa and Newt, whose faces were ashen, and shouted angrily, You! And you! Both of you are doctors, and yet you poisoned innocent people for your own selfish desires. You worked together to suppress the other associations, and you didn't even hesitate to cheat just so you could win. You are shameless and not worthy to be doctors. Pippa and Newt, who had been thinking of various excuses to try and regain Caleb's favor, were speechless. It was clear that he already knew everything. Pippa, your actions are not befitting the position of the next chairperson of this conference. The silence in the square was deafening. Caleb might as well have exiled Pippa from the country. He had definitely ruined a reputation in the presence of tens of thousands of people. Everything that happened at the conference would quickly spread throughout the region and then through the entire country. Pippa was destroyed, and there was no telling how her career as a doctor would survive once everyone learned what she had done. All her years of dedicated work meant nothing now, and her credibility had disappeared in the blink of an eye. Her vision blurred, and she suddenly felt dizzy. In the end, she succumbed to the shocking blow and fainted on the stage. Newt followed suit. His limp body sprawled across the ground. His dull eyes stared blankly at the sky, and he kept repeating, It's over. It's over. It's over. Brendan and Simon were numb with fright. Before Caleb could speak, Brendan rushed forward to say, Dean, we didn't know about any of this. No, sir, we didn't, Simon chimed in. We only did our jobs. Our decision to vote for the New York City Medical Association was fair. Caleb coldly glanced at them and grunted. I'll deal with you two later. Then he handed the microphone back to the host and said, in response to his blank face, You don't need me to tell you what to say, do you? The host instantly came back to his senses and nodded incessantly. Of course, sir, of course. And the winner of the National Medical Association Conference is the Arkland City Medical Association. The applause was thunderous, and the entire crowd burst into cheers. At the host's invitation, the group from Arkland City stepped onto the podium. The entire moment felt surreal, with the flashing cameras and loud screams and clapping. They couldn't believe how quickly things had changed and that they had won the competition. They all looked at each other with eyes full of excitement and respect. If it hadn't been for Aiden, they wouldn't have been able to achieve such a brilliant result. Amidst waves of applause, Caleb gave them their awards, smiling and shaking their hands. While handing the prizes to everyone, he lowered his voice and whispered to Aiden, Don't leave just yet. Wait for me in the tent. The competition finally came to an end. The Arkland City Medical Association, an organization that was quite unknown in the medical world, had defeated all the strong teams in one fell swoop and won the competition. It was a result that no one had expected in the beginning. Most had been certain that the New York City Medical Association, led by the top doctors with unmatched medical skills, would win. However, the group from Arkland City had dominated, and after the award ceremony ended, 
many doctors from the other associations came to the tent, eager to befriend Aiden and his team. Aiden didn't turn down the friendly interactions, and soon enough he had exchanged information with many famous and successful doctors. It would be good for him to be in contact with such elite professionals, as they could help him improve his skills and become a better doctor in the future. It was yet another benefit of his trip to New Jersey. All the doctors he had met were shocked at how young he was, especially since he possessed such profound knowledge. In the end, they felt they had greatly benefited from meeting him. Jenna and the others also took advantage of the opportunity, forming their own connections and listening to Aiden's conversations, too. Learn from excellent doctors in the medical field, plus one for networking skills. After a friendly exchange, the doctors took their leave, though they weren't planning on leaving abundance immediately. Even though the competition was over, the conference would continue for three more days. During this time, the various associations would come together and share information and advice. It would also allow ambitious doctors to find an association they liked and submit an application for any positions. If they were lucky, they would have the chance to be chosen to become the intern at their chosen association. This was exactly what had happened with Jerry, who had been introduced to Nude at a similar social gathering. The conference was also helpful for patients, many of whom came from thousands of miles away to look for doctors that could treat them. When the doctors had left, Aiden and the others looked at their prizes. The team had received a rare medical dictionary, three prescriptions for illnesses, and several rare herbs provided by the dean. The dictionary had been written by a famous doctor many years ago. He had recorded many ancient medical techniques that had long been lost. Aiden flipped through it and knew that it was a rare treasure. The prescriptions didn't interest him as much, though. Although they would be helpful, the corresponding illnesses were mild, so the prescriptions weren't as valuable as the rare herbs. The herbs were the best prizes. As an added bonus, Caleb had also thrown in a formulation decoder. As Aiden and the others were already aware of how expensive it was to use one even for just a year, this prize was the most exciting. The group was grateful to Aiden and decided to give him all the prizes. Their win had all been because of Aiden's performance, and he had helped them on many occasions. Giving him their prizes was the best way they could thank him, and they refused to take them back, even when he told them multiple times that he couldn't accept the gifts. He was humbled, and his heart swelled as he watched them congratulate each other. As soon as the white mist entered Caleb's, Sailor's, and Deb's bodies, streams of red mist emerged from the tops of their heads. Aiden smelled the red mist and knew it was the strange poison Poppy had inflicted on them during their time in the Verdant Plains. The white mist was the antidote to the red mist. After the red mist had been removed, the three of them returned to their usual expressions. Caleb shook his head and sighed. He then said, Starting tomorrow, all medical association members will be banned from the Verdant Plains. Sailor and Deb nodded, looking at Poppy fearfully. They were not in a hurry to visit the Verdant Plains ever again. Sailor asked, What about the green mist? Caleb looked at Poppy nervously, but she said, Don't worry. Since the place has become so popular, we don't intend to stay there anymore. When we leave the Verdant Plains, the green mist will disappear. Caleb and the others were relieved. The town of abundance would be safe. Aiden was a little surprised when he heard this. He hadn't expected Poppy and the others to leave. He wondered whether the people of Little Nook who had protected the mountain folk would also move. Anita Grayson was also stunned. Clearly, she didn't know what to think either. Caleb's voice interrupted Aiden's thoughts. Aiden, I hope you won't mind if I don't introduce myself again, but I will apologize for not being totally honest with you before. Pippa's become rather arrogant, and I had to deal with the matter by laying low. She had started to organize factions and private businesses. She no longer took me seriously as the dean of the organization. That's why I was working with Sailor and Deb to deal with her. They helped me secretly gather information on her crimes. Aiden made a gesture of approval. Saying that he didn't mind, the three of them relaxed a little. Caleb went on. I have something else to tell you. You all should know that medical practitioners in Wilmington and the Gulf Coast are much better than anywhere else. In the past, they considered this kind of competition beneath them. I put out some valuable prizes this year, but I don't think that what I offered was really enough to tempt them. I found the fact that they even bothered to show up very suspicious, so I sent private investigators to watch them. Although I don't have much recent information, I discovered that both teams have spies. Coincidentally, Aiden had enemies from the Gulf Coast and Wilmington, and enemies from both places had appeared in abundance. He assumed that he was their target. Caleb continued, 
I suspect they might have something planned. You should stay away from them for the next few days. Please, just don't go near them. He shared this information just to be friendly, but he had no idea how important it was to Aiden. After Caleb and the others left, Poppy and Rex mentioned another matter to Aiden. That Pippa and the others had a powerful ally. Everyone stop, he said exasperated. You helped me during the competition. You provided so much information. You should keep something. Tyson was too stunned to speak as Aiden forced a prescription into his hand. You all should keep something, Aiden continued. You guys have worked so hard. At least take some of the prescriptions and herbs and split them among yourselves. He pushed the formulation decoder back to them. And the association should keep this. We can't do that, Aiden. What's he saying? You did everything. Why would you give us the prizes? Aiden smiled and raised the medical dictionary. This is all I need. He had no shortage of medicinal herbs, and he could write prescriptions himself. He also wasn't worried about having to pay for any other resources he would need. The only thing that was useful to him was the rare medical dictionary. After insisting, the others finally took their prizes back. The awards might not have meant a lot to Aiden, but to them, they were a great gain. After all, it was the first time they had participated in the competition. To win and get prizes was a huge achievement. Later that evening, Caleb entered the tent. He was followed by Deb and Sailor. When they arrived, everyone except Aiden and Poppy stood up to greet them. Panic flashed across Tyson's and the others' faces, and they stood awkwardly and silently as they waited for further instructions. My friends, Caleb eventually said, I have some private matters to discuss with your Mr. Dale. Could you please go outside and give us some privacy? Tyson and the others were all flattered by Caleb's kindness. Tyson spoke up on behalf of the group, saying, Of course, sir. You are welcome here. We're going to walk around the town and leave you two to talk. They tactfully left the tent, though not before shooting confused glances in Aiden's direction. Once they were out of earshot, they tried to figure out what was going on. Did you all notice how nice the dean was toward Aiden? It didn't feel quite official, did it? Not only that, but I also noticed that Chairman Bentine and Chairman Tailby looked at Aiden strangely, too. It's like they were familiar with him. They seem to have known each other for a long time. Forget it. Stop guessing. This is Aiden we're talking about. It's normal for something strange to happen to him. Let's just move on. The conversation continued, though. Poppy and that big guy are still inside. What do you think that's about? Not long after Tyson and the others left, Caleb's dignified face became tense and he collapsed. Poppy, Rex is safe. Can you remove the poison from us now? He looked at Poppy and smiled, trying to mask his grimace. At the same time, Sailor and Deb also showed what they thought were charming smiles. It was unbelievable how three such important people had become entirely submissive to such a young child. If anyone were to witness their behavior, the medical industry on the East Coast would explode. Poppy grunted. Seeing that you have punished the New York City Medical Association, I will undo it for you, she said. Caleb had done well getting rid of Pippa and Newt. Now the chair and vice chair of the New York City Medical Association would be replaced, and the entire association would undergo a major reconstruction. Caleb had also seen that the captain, who had colluded with Newt and Norman, had been caught, and they were all locked up together. When the time was right, they would hand them over to the local police along with the evidence they had collected. Poppy breathed a small sigh of relief and then stood in front of Caleb, Deb, and Sailor. She raised her small hand and waved it in front of them, and a white mist rose to cover their faces. Aiden had assumed Pippa and Dr. Winston wouldn't cause any more trouble after they had been defeated. He was surprised to hear that Poppy and Rex still had concerns about them. Poppy recalled, We weren't unprepared when they invaded the Verdant Plains that day. With Rex and everyone's combat strength, a bunch of doctors are usually no match for us. She went on. But on their side, there was a crazy old man who was incredibly strong. All of my people fought him at the same time, but they were no match for him. If it hadn't been for Rex, they might have kidnapped me. But instead, they captured him. Crazy old man. Aiden was a little puzzled. He wondered what kind of crazy old man could have taken on so many strong fighters like Rex. My friend, that old man must be a martial arts master too. Rex's words made Aiden's heart skip a beat. If Pippa had a martial arts master on her side, then maybe he did still need to worry about her. Rex continued, But that old man seems to be a loose cannon. Hopefully you can use this information if you encounter him. 
A lunatic going off the rails is more dangerous than anyone else, even though he's not all there. Aiden scowled and said decisively, This won't do. We need Caleb's intelligence network to help us find this crazy old man. That night, Aiden received an urgent message from the Shield. Boss, Tamsin Dupree is moving. She just bought a plane ticket from Lincoln to New York City. Aiden groaned as he read the message. Tamsin was coming to New York. Even if she hadn't come to New York City specifically to target Aiden, he had no doubt she would be a nuisance to him anyway. Meanwhile, a storm was about to hit the town of Abundance. Late at night, on the east side of Abundance, in a deserted house covered in spiderwebs, an unkempt old man rolled around on the ground, holding his head and howling. He had a tall and sturdy body. His musculature made him look much younger than he actually was. When he rolled around, the entire house shook. It hurts, the old man roared. An invisible shockwave rushed toward the house. The old wooden residents could not withstand the force of the storm. The wooden beams collapsed and tiles and broken glass flew everywhere. But the old man was unscathed. As the house fell into ruins, the man continued to hold his head and howl. He only paused when he heard footsteps approaching. In a frenzy, he looked up and saw a figure wearing white slowly approaching. Medicine! Quick, give me medicine! The old man groveled at the person's feet. Tisk, tisk, tisk. The great Buster Sawyer who dominated the martial arts world has actually come to this. If I didn't have the medicine you're asking for, I would never have dared to come. Marcus Gilpin emotionlessly looked down at the old man at his feet. He put a pill in the old man's mouth. Then he explained, Listen carefully. This pill can only delay your pain for 24 hours. Within that time, I want you to help me kill someone. His name is Aiden Dale, and he's currently in Abundance, New Jersey. Remember, I want you to hold nothing back, and don't let him go like last time. After swallowing the pill, the old man finally stopped rolling around in pain. Panting heavily, he nodded without saying a word. His bloodshot eyes flashed with murderous intent. Marcus nodded grimly. He muttered under his breath, I'm doing this for you, uncle. I'll get revenge on Aiden for you. It was the middle of the night, and Aiden was about to go to sleep. With Caleb's help, Poppy finally had her own place to stay. It troubled Aiden that she didn't plan to return to the mountains immediately. Instead, she had stayed with Rex in the town. They wouldn't feel safe as long as that crazy old man was on the loose. On the other hand, Aiden could finally go to sleep. But before he could close his eyes, someone knocked on the door. Aiden groaned in frustration. Who is it? He wondered who was bothering him in the middle of the night. He opened the door and found himself face to face with the owner of the inn. The innkeeper passed a piece of paper to him and said, Sir, someone asked me to give this to you. Aiden took the paper and opened it. A light flashed in his eyes and he skimmed over the text. Okay, thank you, sir. After sending the owner away, he sat down on the bed and read the note again properly. It said, Please come to Wild Grass Park on the east side of Abundance as soon as possible, and bring any important information for the FBI. After thinking it over, Aiden changed his clothes and left the inn. He ran all the way to the park. Wild Grass Park had originally been a medicinal herb farm, but due to excessive mining, the soil had degraded and herbs had stopped growing there. The farm had been abandoned and become overgrown with wild grass, so the locals had started calling it Wild Grass Park. Marcus was walking back to the town with Buster when he saw a figure rushing toward the park. He easily recognized who it was. It's Aiden! Marcus gritted his teeth and ordered the crazy old man to follow him. The two of them followed far behind Aiden as he rushed toward the park. Aiden cut through the tall wild grass all the way into the park, but he didn't see any intelligence officers. A loud explosion came from the park entrance. A boulder came crashing down, blocking the narrow entrance. A large portion of the park was lit up with bright lighting. Aiden turned around and noticed a large group of people at the entrance. They were divided into two groups. On the left side, there were a dozen men and women wearing strange vests decorated with colorful pearls and feathers. There was only one group who dressed like that, and that was the feral poisoners of the Gulf Coast. There were more than a dozen people on the right, and most of them were wearing martial arts attire. The four leaders were all wearing masks, but they looked familiar. Both groups had people wearing lab coats. Are these the Gulf Coast and Wilmington Medical Associations? Aiden thought. He approached the two groups and waved the paper in his hands. 
You guys called me out in the middle of the night? Is there something you want to confess? Nobody from the government was there. It was clearly a trap. Aiden's suspicion was accurate. He was the target of these two associations. Aiden, you're so eloquent. One of the four masked men on the right sneered. It's a pity you won't be able to speak after tonight. The four men at the front of the Wilmington group took off their masks, revealing familiar faces. Aiden narrowed his eyes and said, So, it's the Duncan family. It was the Duncan family bodyguards. In particular, it was the four bodyguards who had accompanied Philo Duncan, one of the young heirs to the Duncan family, on his trip to visit the Parker family. Aiden had helped ruin the party celebrating Philo and Isidore's engagement, which had led to the entire wedding being canceled. Philo had been humiliated, and Aiden had gone to the extra effort of beating his bodyguards black and blue. After Louis Lonely brought them back to Wilmington, Aiden had never heard from them again. He certainly hadn't expected them in New Jersey. One of the guards said, Although I don't know how you got the Woodward family involved, they got Mr. Duncan locked up. Even though he can't leave Wilmington, he can still have your head. Then another said, We're here to take you down once and for all. Aiden looked at the four of them dubiously. It's not that I don't believe you, but what makes you guys think you can take me on this time? You still look just as weak as before. Aiden, don't be arrogant, another bodyguard said. We know you didn't bring any of your cronies with you, so today is the day you die. Aiden shrugged. Then you can all go down together. I could take you all out with one hand tied behind my back. You? The bodyguards were so angry that they couldn't think of a comeback. The silent group on the left suddenly spoke up. What about us? Their leader was a middle-aged woman who didn't look happy. She glared at Aiden and coldly said, I only want to ask one thing. Are our fellows from the feral poisoners still alive or not? Aiden was puzzled. He had captured the eight feral poisoners the woman was referring to in a different altercation with the Mortar family. But the feral poisoners and the Duncan family had nothing to do with each other. He was curious as to why they were working together and who had told them about his participation in the conference. He imagined an invisible hand guiding the two powers together. They're fine, Aiden said, smiling to conceal his discomfort. They're keeping my dogs company. They're good little babysitters. It wasn't a lie. The feral poisoners he had captured were at the shield base, currently being guarded by six ferocious mastiffs. The feral poisoners looked furious. We'll finish you before anybody else gets a chance, one of them cried out. Then more than a dozen of them surrounded Aiden. Their footwork was unique, and their eyes were sinister. They were full of energy and far more intense than the eight whom Aiden had captured. It seemed like these were elite members of the feral poisoners. The four bodyguards were taken aback for a moment. Then, they appeared satisfied. Anyone who takes Aiden out will be thanked. Go ahead and waste him. Then one of the feral poisoners said, We have already laid the trap. There is no exit. He couldn't escape even if he had wings. Today, we pay you back for what you did to the boss. Indifferently, Aiden asked, Do you really think I didn't notice your invitation was a trap? So, you want to catch lightning in a bottle? I dare you to try. You'll see who needs to escape, Aiden yelled with a ferocious look in his eyes. Without waiting for the feral poisoners to get any closer, he charged at them. How arrogant! Show him the power of the feral poisoners! The older woman who was commanding them was surprised that Aiden didn't retreat. With an evil grin, she said, Set up the seven poison formation and poison him to death! They pulled transparent boxes out of their pockets. Under the bright park lights, Aiden could tell that the boxes were full of poison. Seven poisonous creatures appeared in their hands. Snakes, toads, centipedes, and scorpions, along with a few others. They were uglier than ordinary poisonous animals. They had a special kind of poison covering their bodies that made them look deadly. These creatures were the source of the feral poisoner's power. The poisoners opened the containers and released all of the creatures. They took out short flutes and started playing them. The music was ear-piercing, but it seemed to have a magical power over the creatures. They didn't just run around. Instead, they circled around Aiden to prevent any escape. As he was wondering what they were doing, streams of colorful mist spewed out of their mouths. The mist rose and surrounded Aiden. The woman said, The Seven Poisons formation uses the seven sacred poisonous beasts. When used, the poisons intertwine and can even melt solid stone. Now, 
Repent for offending us before you die. She laughed hysterically and prepared to watch the colorful poisonous fog melt Aiden. But he remained totally calm as he examined the fog. Detecting mutated scorpion poison. Poison identification ability, plus one. Discovered mutated snake poison. Poison identification ability, plus one. Poison identification ability leveled up. Current level, Grandmaster level. Obtained Grandmaster level effect. Thousand poison purification. All poison within a certain range is ineffective against the host. Aiden smiled. Everyone else laughed. They thought he was crazy, until they saw him immerse himself in the colorful poisonous fog. Not only did he not express pain, but he also looked content. It was as if he was bathing in the poisonous fog. This... how is this possible? When the poison didn't work on Aiden, the feral poisoners lost their confidence. Is something wrong with the animals? One of them wondered. Then he grabbed the scorpion and it stung his hand. He immediately fell to the ground, foaming at the mouth. Apparently, there was nothing wrong with the poison, but none of them could explain what they were seeing. Watching Aiden walk out of the fog with a smile on his face, the feral poisoners were demoralized. Don't panic! Unleash all the poison in your bodies! Don't let him get close! Their leader was stunned, but her team regrouped quickly. In the spur of the moment, they switched from attack to defense. They couldn't defeat Aiden, so they focused on how to stop his approach. The feral poisoners had never been united like this before. They threw countless poisonous insects, liquids, pills, and bombs at Aiden. But it was useless. No poison could stop his attack. He knocked them to the ground one by one. When only their leader was left standing, Aiden casually walked up to her and said, What do you have to say for yourself now? The woman knelt down without hesitation and bitterly said, Spare, spare me! We'll forget about those eight other members. From now on, you won't be targeted. Are you negotiating terms with me or threatening me? Aiden asked calmly. Either way, you aren't qualified. Aiden didn't waste any more time talking to her. He suddenly lunged at her face and said, Bang! The middle-aged woman flinched and turned to run, but she tripped over herself and landed awkwardly. Her entire group was done for. The group from Wilmington was completely astounded. The entire fight had only lasted a few moments, but so much had happened within that time. Many on the Wilmington side were still cheering, but when they noticed the poison was beginning to affect people in their own ranks, they saw Aiden's cold eyes and instinctively stepped back in fear. The bodyguards took a fierce stance, although they were trembling. One of them said, Don't, don't be afraid! The feral poisoners had taken their best shot, but in the end, they had all shot blanks. The bodyguards tried to muster the courage to face Aiden. One of them yelled out, We're the best in the business, and our boss pays us well, right? It's impossible for us to be afraid of a kid. That's right, Aiden is clearly immune to all poisons, but what about his martial arts skills? To their knowledge, Aiden was only still an ordinary martial artist, and he didn't have any backup from the shield this time. They let out a war cry and launched a ferocious attack. The four attacked at the same time, and the rest of the martial artists from the Wilmington side joined them. Gusts from their movements made the wild grass sway. But they had miscalculated. The last time they had fought Aiden, he had indeed been an ordinary martial artist. Not much time had passed, so they had not been aware of his transformation. But since their last meeting, Aiden had become a martial arts master. The difference was like night and day. The sound of flesh hitting flesh rang out. It was the sound of Aiden beating them up. Use Blade Rich Sword Attack. Martial Arts Ability, plus one. The Blade Rich Sword Attack does not require a sword. Aiden had learned how to become a human sword. He could now strike with the force of a tornado. When they attacked, he toppled them all like a circle of dominoes. The four bodyguards were scared out of their wits as they glared at the death machine before them. Oh my god, he's like a martial arts master. But he's so young, how is that possible? None of them could touch Aiden. Every time they rushed forward, he knocked them all back. In the blink of an eye, everyone from Wilmington was lying on the ground with various injuries. The only people left standing in the whole park were the doctors, who were hiding. Aiden approached the four bodyguards and, without emotion, asked, Who exactly leaked my whereabouts to you, and who ordered you to join forces with the feral poisoners? The pupils of the four bodyguards contracted in horror. They did not see a human being walking toward them, but a fiend. But Aiden took a careful note of their body language. 
Apart from their nervousness, they had an inexplicable anticipation in their eyes, as if they were expecting something. Aiden became alarmed and stopped in his tracks. Except for the occasional sound of wind, Wild Grass Park was silent. Aiden sensed that something was wrong, and his heart started beating faster. He glanced up, then he glanced down and suddenly leaped backward. A black trident spiked the ground right where he had just been standing. Once this weapon pierced someone, its hooks and grooves would tear open the wound and cause more bleeding. Damage caused by this vicious weapon was extremely difficult to repair. It was a favorite weapon of assassins everywhere due to its high rate of success. Of course, it was rare for anyone to possess this kind of extraordinary weapon. Such a weapon would only be owned by an experienced assassin. This alone wouldn't be a problem for Aiden, but this assassin was hiding in the grass like a snake. Aiden had barely noticed the impending attack. His instincts had saved him in the nick of time. If he had moved half a second later, his feet would have been immobilized by the trident. The mysterious stalker had yet to reveal themselves, but they were clearly a martial arts master on the same level as Aiden. It was even more unsettling that this bushwhacker was a strong martial artist. Assassins were already difficult to deal with, but dealing with an assassin who was also a martial artist was even worse. The trident had missed, but was quickly retracted. Aiden's heart shook, and he concentrated on his feet as he tried to sense where the next strike would come from. The four bodyguards chose this moment to regroup, but they kept their distance. They began to taunt Aiden. You didn't expect this, did you? We have a powerful ally. Fortunately, our boss is wise. In case there was an unexpected trouble, he splurged to hire the famous assassin Stinger. <laughs> Although we didn't expect you to be a martial arts master, we have Stinger, another master, but one who has been famous for a long time. Aiden, today you die. The only thing left is for Stinger to torture you first. What a pity. The four bodyguards kept taunting Aiden. Although he wasn't focusing on them, he heard every word they said. Information about the assassin Stinger quickly flashed through his mind. Stinger was a killer of legendary status. It was said that they rarely took jobs and that they only worked for the highest rate of pay. No ordinary person could afford to hire them. The price was high because their success rate was almost 100%. The true appearance of Stinger was unknown as no one had ever seen them. Even their gender, age, and background was completely unknown. However, the legends of their deeds had spread far and wide. The influence and power of this person was clear. The park fell silent again. Stinger had attacked like lightning, but hadn't succeeded. After that, it was as if they had retreated. But Ada knew that this person must still be hiding in the grass, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. Everyone's attention turned to the entrance to see an old man climb the boulder and hop down into the park. In his arms was a man dressed in a lab coat. Aiden's eyes widened as he looked at the familiar figure. Marcus Gilpin? He thought. He was right. The doctor that the old man set down was Dr. Winston's nephew, Marcus Gilpin. After Pippa O'Connor and Dr. Winston had been arrested, Marcus had mysteriously disappeared. Aiden hadn't expected him to reappear that night. But Aiden was more interested in the old man beside him. His messy hair, greasy and moldy coat, strong body, and the crazed look in his bloodshot eyes reminded Aiden of the crazy old man Poppy and Rex had described. Activating proficient level discerning ability. The target's realm is high enough to see all details. Oh my god, what a coincidence, Aiden thought. It was indeed another martial arts master. The troublesome Stinger was still hiding in the darkness, and another master had appeared and made the situation worse. Marcus saw Aiden right away and smiled ferociously. He said, Aiden, I didn't expect you to come to such a place in the middle of the night when you could just stay in town. This is excellent. It will be more convenient for me to annihilate you here. Buster Sawyer, destroy him, he ordered. The crazy old man approached Aiden. His eyes looked murderous. The four bodyguards had been afraid when they had first seen Marcus and Buster come in. They were relieved to see that the pair was after Aiden, too. I really admire your ability to make enemies, one of the bodyguards said. Why is everyone in the world trying to kill you? Knock it off, Aiden snapped. The four bodyguards shut their mouths. Then one of them muttered, Whatever, go ahead and be arrogant for a while longer. The four calmly sat down, eager to watch Aiden get killed by the two martial arts masters. Aiden looked at the crazy old man who was getting closer, but his mind was on what Marcus Gilpin had called the man. Buster Sawyer? Aiden thought. 
He thought he had heard the name before, but he could not think of where he would have heard it. Buster didn't give him the chance to think. With a ferocious roar, he launched an attack. He stopped two holes in the ground and, like a rocket, shot toward Aiden with lightning speed. Buster Sawyer's fists were like two missiles that were ready to explode. Aiden observed his boxing style and thought, is this fire-based martial arts? Thinking of this, he rotated his palms in a circle and used the Universal Pride water style to counter the attack. When Buster's fist met Aiden's palm, Aiden discovered that his enemy was not only using the element of fire, but also metal. The man's fists were like two drills with indomitable momentum as Aiden continued to slap them away with his palm strikes. The intensity and speed of the collisions ripped up both fighters' sleeves. The confrontation was incredibly fierce. In the heat of the battle, Aiden finally recalled what he had heard about Buster. Once, back in the Temple of the Five Elements, he had asked Jesse Evans how many martial arts masters there were in the world. Although Jesse could not give a specific number, he had mentioned an old man who had given him a lot of trouble, Buster Sawyer. In lingering fear, Jesse had said, that guy was a lunatic. He practiced all different styles of martial arts and wanted to fight everyone he saw. He didn't care about his own health and safety at all. He only had one thing on his mind, fighting. He was always either fighting or preparing for a fight. Jesse had been challenged by Buster many times. He was clearly a worthy opponent, well-versed in the martial arts. Back in the present, Aiden frowned as he focused on the fight at hand. Within one moment, Buster had thrown more than five different types of punches at Aiden, along with palm strikes and kicks. He kept changing his method of attack and using old-fashioned techniques to keep Aiden off guard. The attack was dazzling and overwhelming, but Aiden was able to deduce that his enemy's mind wasn't in the right place. Even when Buster saw Aiden make a mistake, he wasn't able to capitalize on it in time. Aiden's pupils shrink as he thinks about what might be wrong with the man. He pushed his palms forward and used the force of the recoil to retreat from Buster's flurry. Then suddenly, the trident reappeared. Stinger was still lurking out there somewhere. Taking advantage of the distraction, Stinger attacked a second time. But this time, Aiden noticed an important clue. So, you're a master of the earth element, Aiden called out into the dark. A martial arts master of the earth element would have rough skin and thick flesh. Few people would think to use the earth element for fighting purposes. There was a better use for it, to help someone camouflage themselves. Some legends claimed martial artists skilled in the earth element could literally move through the ground, like fish swimming in water. Stinger didn't answer Aiden's question. They retracted the trident and dove back into the grass. Then Buster roared and came at Aiden again. You guys are so annoying, Aiden groaned. Although he could handle the danger that his two enemies posed, he didn't want to entertain Marcus or the four bodyguards any longer. He made up his mind to end the battle and let out a breath of cloudy air. Aiden's audience suddenly felt a wave of heat. The five of them realized what it was when they saw him reach toward the sky, and two flames appeared in his hands at the same time. The flames formed into bestial shapes on Aiden's fists. His left hand turned into a dragon, and his right hand became a tiger. The dragon and tiger flames illuminated Aiden's face. It was as if a fire god had come into the world. The Book of Life? How do you know that? A surprised voice blurted out from a spot in the grass. This voice was garbled. It sounded like someone speaking with their mouth full. Although it was vague, Aiden could tell what the voice had asked. The Book of Life that he had taken a few days to study had finally come in handy. It contained instructions on how to use fire in the martial arts. Practitioners of the style paid special attention to tempering their bodies constantly. About a hundred rounds of tempering helped them turn themselves into steel. While the dragon fire tempered the body, the tiger fire tempered the soul. Only by cultivating both animal styles would one be fully able to comprehend the fighting style. Then Aiden felt as if his entire body was wrapped in flames. The flames burned his mind, body, and soul overcoming him completely. Comprehending the Book of Life. Element of Fire Comprehension Ability, plus one. Martial Arts Comprehension Ability, plus one. Aiden opened his eyes and they were full of rage. He warned, Stinger, since you won't come out, I'll burn you out. The flames on his fists flared out and struck the ground. Everyone present was shaken by a huge tremor and lost their balance. After Aiden's fiery beasts landed on the ground, the two flames lit up the grass immediately. Watch out! Someone shouted. Everyone watched the rapidly spreading flames and began to panic. 
In an ordinary park, it might not have been so bad, but this was Wild Grass Park. There were weeds growing everywhere. One spark could set the whole area ablaze, and Aiden had thrown two big flames into the grass. The flames spread out in every direction in no time and devoured one area after another. Many of the feral poisoners and fighters from Wilmington were accidentally burned as well. Amidst the screams, they scattered and fled in all directions. But Wild Grass Park was full of tall grass. Running only stoked the fire. Some tried to push the boulder at the entrance of the park out of the way, but it didn't budge at all. They had blocked the entrance on purpose, thinking they could defeat Aiden if he were trapped. They hadn't expected it to become their own trap. This seemed to confirm what had been said about Aiden earlier, that he wouldn't be able to escape even if he had wings. But now this applied to everyone in the park. Flames rose to the sky, and the entire park turned into a sea of fire. Many who were there cried out in agony and rolled on the ground. The park had become hell on Earth. The four bodyguards were so frightened that they clung tightly to the trees and wet themselves. Marcus had already passed out from inhaling the thick smoke. Most of the grass had been incinerated, and the soil was smoldering. The mysterious stinger finally could not take any more heat. They rose up out of the ashes. Through clouds of thick smoke, Aiden saw a thin figure wearing tight yellow clothes. Their entire body was tightly wrapped, revealing only a pair of cold eyes. It was impossible to determine whether this individual was a man or a woman. But Aiden only needed to know this was Stinger. He shot forward at the assassin like lightning. After all the harassment Aiden had endured, he was ready to face this jerk head on. But just then, someone with a robust physique pounced at Aiden from the side. Aiden felt very helpless and more than a little annoyed. The person who had rushed out of the fire was Buster Sawyer. While the flames would have slowed down most other martial arts fighters, they had no effect on Buster. Stinger turned to give Aiden a last look. Without the slightest hesitation, in a series of mighty leaps, they vaulted the huge rock blocking the park entrance and disappeared into the valley. How annoying, grumbled Aiden, glaring at Buster as he watched Stinger bound away. He addressed Buster. You crazy old man, when are you going to get with the program? Once Stinger was gone, Aiden no longer held back and used his full strength. Grandmaster level arm strength triggered. Grandmaster level martial arts ability activated. Proficient level multitasking ability triggered. Grandmaster level martial arts ability strengthening effect triggered. As his ability continued to strengthen, Aiden became more and more ferocious as he fought. Grandmaster level martial arts ability super positioning effect triggered. He no longer retreated at all, but engaged Buster fiercely, and the flaming wild grass park was covered in damage from their battle. Buster was a ferocious opponent, but he was no match for Aiden in his advanced skills development. Taking advantage of a moment Buster took to recover from one of his blows, Aiden struck him heavily on the back of the head, and Buster staggered forward a few steps. Rather than give chase, Aiden stepped nimbly behind Buster and placed his hand on the place he had made contact with. A surge of his aura flowed with the force of a mighty river into Buster's body, coursing along his meridians and energizing him in a strange, uncontrollable fashion. He stiffened, and his eyes stared oddly into space, as though he was trying very hard to understand something difficult. For a few seconds, Aiden and Buster stood locked frozen in position. The flames kept at bay by the force of the energy Aiden was using to analyze Buster's abnormal physical condition. Activating medical arts of Grandmaster level ability. Analyzing the condition of the target. Analysis complete. Target's weakness. Brainstem. Analysis reveals the presence of neurotoxins, causing insanity and lack of physical control. Aiden had suspected that Buster had been behaving in an unexpected fashion due to some external influence. He had taken the opportunity to perform a rapid examination for poisons. As he thought, Buster was affected by the same neurotoxin that had blighted Rex. However, the neurotoxin present in Buster's cortex was of a higher grade. It neither caused him to lose his rationality completely, nor did it isolate his ability, but kept his condition in a half-lucid state that simulated a type of madness. Buster was not only in the grip of the neurotoxin, with most of his abilities intact, but he was also being controlled by the person who had administered the poison. The only person that could be was Marcus Gilpin. Aiden thought very quickly, he used the energy coursing through his hand to remove the neurotoxin quite easily. Buster's eyes soon assumed their usual clarity, and he stopped fuming. He closed his eyes for a few seconds, and when he reopened them, he was his usual self once again. Not a crazed madman who only knew how to kill. His aura shone brightly. 
Buster looked hard at Aiden and said, Boy, I owe you a favor. Tell me something I can do for you. Just at that moment, the four bodyguards dragged the unconscious Marcus Gilpin out of the sea of fire and slapped him awake. One said to him sternly, Hey, wake up! Something doesn't seem right anymore with your guys! When they had seen Stinger give up at the fight and run away, they had become very angry and started cursing and grumbling. But being unwilling to lose, they had decided to join forces with Marcus instead. As soon as they had seen Buster stop moving, they had decided it was time to revive Marcus. Marcus Gilpin's face was smoke-blackened, and he looked as if he had just emerged from a shift at the bottom of a coal mine. It took a few slaps for him to wake up and begin to recover from the smoke he had inhaled. He looked around in confusion, hearing the shouting and swearing of the four bodyguards, who had dragged him from the flames. Groggily, he looked in the direction they were pointing to see Aiden and Buster seemingly engaged in an intense discussion a short distance away, against a backdrop of raging flames. Marcus struggled to his feet. He anxiously called to Buster. Come on, kill him! What are you waiting for? If you don't get on with it, no one will be able to remove the neurotoxin from your system. Buster returned his gaze with an icy glare that seemed to overpower the heat of the flames. He looked at the group surrounding Marcus and called. Is it them you want me to kill? To a man, the hair stood up on the backs of their necks, and they each felt a frightening chill, despite the towering flames. They couldn't understand what had happened to make Buster act as if he was at Aiden's beck and call. Only a short while earlier, they had been at each other's throats. The realization dawned on Marcus that Buster was in debt to Aiden for something. Incredulously, he said, Has your neurotoxin already been removed? Aiden said to Buster, looking contemptuously at Marcus and the bodyguards, No, let's not waste our time on these insects. He looked along the valley and continued, When you were not your true self, Stinger escaped. I want you to recapture them. Can you do that for me? Buster looked a little sheepish. Although he had not been in control of himself, he knew that he had been the cause of Stinger's escape and felt embarrassed at a vague memory he summoned of the time he was out of his mind. He held his hand to his face, as if to hide his embarrassment, and said decisively, Don't worry. No matter how slippery he is, I will help you catch him and am prepared to give my own life to do so. He turned and made to leave. Wait! Aiden called. Are you going right away? How will you find out where he is? Do you know? Buster replied, I have my ways. He winked at Aiden reassuringly, leapt the boulder in a single bound, and set off on his quest. While Aiden was watching him go, he heard the sirens of the fire engines entering the park to put out the fire. It wasn't long before their powerful pumps and hoses had dampened the flames. The fire is out! Everyone, run! cried one of the four bodyguards, rushing toward the boulder at the entrance. Once they could safely approach the mechanism they had set up beforehand with no danger from the wildfire, they were in a hurry to activate it. As soon as the first bodyguard reached the mechanism, he pressed the button, and the huge rock rolled to one side, revealing a path. Each of the bodyguards cried a threat or insult directed toward Aiden as they ran from the park. Aiden, when we meet again, you will die, cried the last as he followed his comrades. They didn't wait for the feral poisoners or anyone else. Marcus, seeing that Buster had regained his usual consciousness, lost all trace of his arrogance and ran after them, crying, Wait! Wait for me! Everyone else remaining in the park rushed toward the entrance. Aiden watched all the activity with detached amusement. He sensed a familiar situation developing. As everyone left the park, they found another group waiting for them, apart from the firefighters who were still mopping up the last of the flames. The four bodyguards cringed when they recognized the uniforms of the people standing outside the park. They tried to return to the park, but Aiden was blocking their way. He folded his arms and sneered at their terror. Trapped at the front and the rear, they had no way to escape. Aiden issued a single bold command. Men, take these bodyguards down! The uniformed group rushed up quickly and surrounded the four bodyguards, who quickly gave up any thought of escape or resistance and dejectedly surrendered. When they saw the bodyguards give up, no one else chose to struggle. There were few forces on the East Coast that could force the four bodyguards to stop resisting, but the National Security Branch of the FBI was one of them. Their leader was someone Aiden had not seen for a very long time. Aiden embraced Director Nathan Harris in a massive bear hug. He asked with a smile, What are you doing here? He had not seen Nathan since he had left Wilmington. Nathan had been left very busy with the Westing office's business back in Wilmington. Apart from the major players, 
many smaller organizations and opportunists had taken the chance to cause their own kinds of nuisance, which gave the National Security Branch a great deal to contend with. Gesturing to the four bodyguards, Nathan said, Did you know that these guys came out from Wilmington? We got a tip off and have been following them for a while. On the way here, we ran into a mysterious person on the road. We lost some time when he destroyed our vehicle. Aiden frowned. From the description, it sounded like Nathan had already encountered Stinger. I didn't expect to find you here, said Nathan. Although I should have realized you were the only one who could cause such a big commotion. I never asked to be targeted, said Aiden, shrugging. But if I am, then I'm not going to sit back and watch, am I? What are you saying? They're after you this time? Nathan asked, and his expression turned very solemn. Aiden told the director what had been happening in the park and emphasized that he thought someone was secretly controlling the forces of the feral poisoners in the Duncan family. Aiden, let me take these guys back to Wilmington, said Nathan, pointing at the bodyguards. What's the plan? asked Aiden, seeing how happy Nathan was to have them in his custody. Well, it's all thanks to you that things have turned out the way they have, said Nathan. You helped Grover Hemingway's grandson Tyler and the leader of the Carpenter family, Suzanne, right? Yes, the Carpenter family betrayed some of the old family ties, but things are quite different now. The Duncan family is completely allied with the old families. They proposed building a new HQ in Wilmington and are trying to forge new bonds with old money families from all over the country by inviting them to set up presences there. If their plans succeed, they will become the most powerful force in Wilmington. Aiden had never dreamed that his deeds would have such far-reaching, unintentional consequences. But if he had to do things over, he would still have taken the same course of action. Nathan went on. But now we're at a turning point. He gestured at the four bodyguards. The old families in the Westing office are fighting openly now, as well as covertly. But there used to be a line that nobody dared cross. The Duncan family actually sent agents to murder Aiden Dale, special consultant to the Westing office. They've crossed a line. If Grover Hemingway makes this information known, the Duncan family will lose all of its prestige. None of the old families will be interested in going to Wilmington. When the four bodyguards heard this, their faces turned deathly pale. It wasn't until that moment that the four bodyguards fully comprehended the kind of disaster they had helped bring upon the Duncan family. They had thought that they were acting with allies, but now saw that they had been badly let down. Aiden was more interested in the motivations behind the Duncan family's maneuvering. He said as much to Nathan, Let me know what you need. I know you will keep me posted. By the way, there are some people down there that have had some terrible luck. You could help take them back. He was referring to the staff of the Gulf Coast and Wilmington Medical Associations who had been infiltrated by the four bodyguards and the feral poisoners. He thought that if they were all taken back to Wilmington together the security forces might be able to get some new information. Security Director Nathan Harris had no objections and arranged transport for all his charges. Once the fire had been completely extinguished, Wild Grass Park returned to its peaceful existence. Only the charred and smoking ground bore witness to the raging fire that had engulfed it just a short time before. Later that night, on a mountaintop about three miles north of Abundance, New Jersey, somewhere northeast of Wildgrass Park, two figures confronted one another in a howling gale. One was a skinny figure in yellow clothing, and the other was an old man who was as strong as a bear and boasted a full head of white hair. It was Stinger and Buster Sawyer. Buster, you know that we are both old hands at this game, and you won't be able to catch me in the end. So why keep trying? said Stinger. Why not let me be on my way? What could Aiden have done for you to keep you chasing after me? Stinger's voice was hoarse and rasped across Buster's eardrums like metal grating against metal. It gave him an earache. He detoxified my system, and that kindness was worth more than merely saving my life, replied Buster. I don't expect someone like you who lives in the half-light like a snake chasing rodents to understand what it means to have kindness extended to you. Stinger's eyes flashed with the brittle light of cold anger, and they hissed. What do you know? Forty years ago, a great calamity descended, and one day, something much like it will return. There will be another bloody storm, you can mark my words. Even experienced martial arts practitioners like us will not be spared. We will need to give ourselves over to the darkness and struggle with all of our wiles and might if we are to survive the great calamity. 
Buster shivered a little with fear. He said, Are you talking about the disaster that was caused by the Four Masters? Bah! groaned Stinger. I am not going to school you in the details. Just know that they will return once more. Do you still want to fight me now? Of course, returned Buster. There are many more things in this world that are more important than my life. You're a madman, cried Stinger. They stabbed out with their trident repeatedly. Come on, then, said Buster. His face contorted as he concentrated on his wild opponent. I finally get my wish of taking on the most feared of assassins. He shouted angrily and gestured to Stinger to come at him. Back and forth, they fought on the mountaintop. The energy the battle released destroyed acres of forest, and the difference between their skills became more apparent as the night wore on. Finally, after an uncountable number of blows, Buster landed a powerful strike directly on Stinger's face. As Buster's blow landed, a gust of wind blew Stinger's hood away. The face revealed by the wind was very old and quite wrinkled. Buster stopped dead for a moment and realized he was looking at the face of a very old woman who still bore the traces of her once unrivaled beauty. He imagined her face having the kind of loveliness that could topple nations and cause empires to fall. He cried, Even if you are a woman, I will capture you and hand you over to Aiden. He didn't stare in wonder for very long. Go to hell, cried Stinger, and stabbed her trident at Buster's heart. He dodged to one side and lashed out with both fists. They moved so fast that they whistled through the air with a piercing sound. His fist struck out with a kind of divine fury. With a loud crack, his fist cracked the trident into pieces. The force of the blow was so strong that the trident barely slowed its momentum, and Buster's punch struck Stinger in the chest. A thick spray of blood blasted from Stinger's mouth in a terrifying red mist which blocked Buster's vision for a few seconds. Oh no, her blood is toxic, gasped Buster. I should have expected that from a top assassin like her. As quickly as he could, he leapt backwards to avoid the deadly mist. Before he could recover, he saw that Stinger had jumped to the bottom of the mountain in one tremendous leap. He saw her leaping from side to side on the canyon walls, and she disappeared quickly into the darkness. Damn it, he said. She got away. He slapped at the ground so angrily that he excavated a huge hole. His strength was excellent, but he was not as quick thinking as Stinger. How will I explain this to the kid? He wondered. I shouldn't have bragged so much before. After sending director Nathan Harris away, Aiden returned to the hotel at abundance. The fire at Wild Grass Park seemed to have only caused a short-lived commotion, and everything was quiet. No one seemed to notice his return to town. After his night of frantic action and activity, he was wide awake and full of energy. It had been his first time using the skills he had gained from the Book of Life, and its effects were remarkable. He was able to gain a clearer understanding of his own strength after battling with Stinger and Buster. While he didn't think he would yet be able to match Billy Barton or Jesse Evans, he was aware of the distinction in their strength and ability. He felt as though, with practice, he could defeat Buster and Stinger, but he acknowledged that Buster's strength would have increased since he returned to his usual level of consciousness. In silence, Aiden replayed the battle in his mind. The scenes quickly flashed through his memory. Activating memory ability at proficient level. Activating analytical ability of beginner level martial artist. Overlaying battle replay with martial arts moves. Aiden's eyes were closed, but his hands and feet were moving rapidly from left to right as he recreated the battle for his analysis. Buster would have been astonished to watch Aiden replicate his moves in the battle with perfect accuracy. Aiden wanted to recreate and analyze the moves so he would be able to explore their techniques from the participants' own perspectives. Great skills comprehension speed insufficient. Replication capacity proficiency insufficient. Replication not currently achievable. He stopped gesturing and slowly exhaled. He felt like he was still forcing the effort, but he was encouraged by his progress. As soon as he could observe Buster and Stinger a few more times, he was confident that he would be able to comprehend both of their styles eventually. Poppy's temper exploded. Barbarians? You're the barbarian! Your whole family are barbarians! She shouted, her hands planted firmly on her hips. 
She roared with fury, like an enraged lion. Rex clenched his fist and squared up to Buster. He said, I might not beat you, but I'm prepared to die trying. Aiden quickly stepped in between them. He said soothingly, There's something you don't know about the Verdant Plains incident. Buster here didn't do it on purpose. He then explained about the neurotoxin. Poppy was still very unhappy, although she calmed down somewhat. Maybe so, she said, but he still hurt my people and caused Rex to be captured. That's true, replied Aiden, turning to look at Buster. I want to add another condition, he said. You have to apologize to Poppy and the rest of the mountain people. Buster leapt to his feet, his eyes opened wide. He cried, That's not fair! You can't just add conditions anytime you feel like it! Aiden said lazily, Okay then, if you don't agree, you can always go and catch Stinger- I apologize! shouted Buster before Aiden had even finished. He pursed his lips and walked over to Poppy and Rex. He bowed deeply and said, I was poisoned by my stupidity and went crazy. I'm very sorry. Rex scratched his head and whispered in Poppy's ear, Princess, this old man seems to be sincerely apologizing. What should we do? I can see that, Rex, replied Poppy. She was very conflicted. Buster was far too strong for them if it came to a fight. When they saw how sincerely sorry he was, they weren't sure what to do. Well, Poppy said haughtily, I see that Rex is happy to accept your apology, so we forgive you. Thank you, said Buster graciously. He looked at Aiden in gratitude. Aiden had known that Buster was embarrassed and wanted to apologize, but hadn't worked up the courage to do so. Buster was pleased that Aiden had smoothed the way for him. At last, the business with Buster was settled, and the New York City Medical Association doctors who had trespassed on Verdant Plains had also been dealt with. Poppy's business at the bottom of the mountain was complete, and she told Aiden that she would be returning soon. When everyone received the news that Poppy would be leaving, they were quite sad. They had thought of her as Aiden's cousin and would miss her lively presence. In the short time they had known her, she had come to occupy a special place in their affections. Jenna Shu was particularly taken with her charms and insisted on taking Poppy shopping for gifts that she could take home with her. Poppy agreed to stay for the morning and to return home in the afternoon. Jenna convinced Anita to go with them, and the men stayed in the hotel room. Aiden wanted to try to get some sleep, but the hotel owner came to the room. He said, Dr. Dale, please help me save my business. Aiden looked at him, quite perplexed about what he was saying. The owner pulled him over to the window and pointed down the street. A long line of people was snaking from the entrance and around the corner. They've been waiting here since before dawn. They're all here to see you. They say if I don't let them see you, they'll tear the place apart. It wasn't until almost sunrise that Aiden finally stopped thinking about cultivating his martial arts abilities and lay down to sleep. He had hardly closed his eyes when he was suddenly on high alert again. Activating proficient level sound discourse ability. Powerful target approaching. Aiden sat up in the bed and stared at his window. Five seconds later, he saw Buster Sawyer land on the sill and try to enter the room. It was a narrow windowsill, and he wasted a great deal of energy trying to arrange his limbs so he could go through it. He tried using his back while he kept his balance with his arms. Looking up at one point, he saw Aiden quietly watching his clumsy efforts. He was so shocked he almost fell from the sill. Hey, don't just sit there, he said when he noticed Aiden watching him as if he was performing a slapstick show. Give me a hand. Aiden shook his head and pulled Buster into the room. Buster sat on the ground, his big eyes searching the room and trying to find the right words for something he wanted to say. Hmm, this, you see... Aiden stopped him by saying, You failed, didn't you? Well, said Buster, trying to save face. Technically, I wouldn't call it a failure. Stinger is good at running away as well as being quite treacherous and cunning. I was careless and fell into her trap. But don't worry, I hurt her badly. She won't be causing you any trouble for a little while. Aiden did not say a word. He just looked at Buster expressionlessly for a long time. All right, I guess I failed, cried Buster, 
not able to bear Aiden's reproachful stare any longer. Apart from catching Stinger, tell me something else I could do for you. Aiden rubbed his chin thoughtfully and said, Well, old man, I guess you can be my bodyguard for the next ten years. What? cried Buster, feeling his hair stand on end. You want me to be your bodyguard for the next ten years? I won't do it. He became quite angry. Then go and catch Stinger, Aiden said, staring fearlessly at him. They glared at each other for a few more minutes. Finally, Buster sat on the ground and looked very downcast. Ten years as your bodyguard, he muttered. Ten years as your bodyguard. Oh, why did I have to end up owing you a favor? Okay, but I'm going to make it very clear. I will only guard you, not be your hired killer. Don't worry, old timer, Aiden said. I still have a sense of propriety. He smiled with satisfaction at having convinced Buster to do as he asked. Buster muttered, How come I feel I am stuck on some kind of pirate ship? I don't think this is such a good deal for me. Suddenly, the two men looked at the door, their senses on high alert. A second or two later, there was a small knock and a voice called excitedly. Aiden, Rex and I found out something about the crazy old man. It was Poppy Hansen. Aiden threw a sideways glance at Buster and opened the door. Poppy stood there next to Rex, who towered above her. She squeezed into the room and began chattering. Aiden, I have to tell you, we found an abandoned old house on the east side of Abundance. People were living there. A crazy old man. Ah! She let out a cry of surprise when she noticed Buster sitting on the floor. Rex saw him too and stepped in front of Poppy to protect her. Buster looked hard at them and said, Now where have I seen you guys before? That's right, I remember now. You're the barbarians from Verdant Plains. Hearing themselves described as barbarians made Poppy and Rex absolutely furious. The person who had reached out to stop Garrett from walking to the head of the line was an angry-looking young man. Aiden walked over to Garrett to hear the young man say, No way can you cut in. Go back to the end of the line. Aiden saw that the young man thought they were trying to cut in line. Before they could say anything in their defense, the angry young man continued berating them. You're breaking the rules already and you haven't even become apprentices yet? Unbelievable! Garrett looked at Aiden and they understood right away that the line was for people wanting to register as apprentices. In the registration system, it was first necessary to register as an apprentice. While it was a minor credential in itself, it didn't guarantee any further registration or recognition. The young man noticed their confusion and said, What's wrong? Aren't you wanting to register as an apprentice? Garrett coughed politely and said, <clears throat> We're doctors. We're here to check our credentials. The young man was quite embarrassed and reached out to smooth Garrett's clothes where he had grabbed him. He said, Oh, please excuse me. It seems I've made a mistake by not recognizing you. I hope this won't count against me. The other people standing in the line looked at Aiden and Garrett enviously. Thousands of people signed up to become apprentices, but only around one in every hundred would go on to become a qualified doctor. It was then that the true medical learning would begin. Becoming a junior doctor provided the opportunity to begin studying and learning the vast amount of knowledge that was required to be successful. Aiden and Garrett had not been certified, but they were well on the way already, and the would-be apprentices looked upon them with admiration. Many of them would never make it that far. As soon as they learned that they were in the wrong line, Aiden and Garrett went up to a different counter. Garrett said, Aiden, do you want to come with me to the junior doctor line, or do you want to check on the senior doctors? You have the knowledge and strength to do that. The people overhearing him began to view the two doctors not with envy, but with disdain. They regarded them as behaving rather arrogantly and showing off their superiority. Aiden said, It doesn't matter to me. I don't care what level I operate at. This remark made the onlookers sniff at what they had perceived as his overly proud and offhand manner. There were far fewer people in the new line, so they did not have to wait very long before they were ready to take their turn at the counter. However, just as they were about to be called forward, someone rushed up from behind them. Get out of the way! Dr. Regan is here, said a large, officious-looking man, pushing Garrett to one side. If Aiden hadn't clutched his arm, Garrett would have been pushed to the ground. Garrett looked very angry, and Aiden frowned in frustration. 
After the big man had cleared the way, he smiled ingratiatingly as he welcomed a young man to the counter. The newcomer looked to be about the same age as Aiden. He was tall and thin and looked around him with a proud expression. Aiden looked in the direction that the hotel owner was pointing. A long line of people was waiting at the door. In addition to a large number of white-coated doctors, there were many members of the public in the line. When they saw Aiden looking down, they became very excited, and all began calling out to him. There he is, cried one woman. A serious-looking doctor called up. Dr. Dale, I am Ken Norton of the Huntsville Medical Association in Alabama. I wish to initiate an exchange of medical information with you. I am sure it will be mutually beneficial. Another man, eating a donut and drinking coffee from a paper cup, smiled up and cried. I was here first. I am here on behalf of my superior, who is a well-known professor, James Mason, who I am sure you have heard of. He asked me to invite you to his office for a meeting. Two men, who appeared to have joined the line on their way home from a late-night bar, began arguing. One said, You can all get lost. I need to see the doctor about a problem with my kidneys. His buddy said, Even I can see from your face that your kidneys are no good. You don't need a doctor to examine you for that. Oh yeah? said the first. Is that so? Why don't you come over here and I'll let you know what I think of you? Sure, pal, the buddy said, staggering toward his former friend. I ain't afraid of you. Aiden sighed and turned away from the window. He had merely shown his face, and already chaos was breaking out in the line. Ever since the Arklands Medical Association had won the championship, word had got out that Aiden was the most highly skilled doctor in town. It was also no secret that he was staying at the hotel, so everyone went to find him there in the hope of getting his help. There were doctors who wanted to work with him, pharmacists who sought his endorsement, and patients of all kinds. The streets were full, and traffic was at a standstill. There were also many people who just wanted to be part of the fun, carnival-like atmosphere. Aiden had always disliked this part of his life and sought to always keep a low profile. He sighed and closed the curtain. Dr. Dale, why don't you go out and meet them? Said the hotel owner, looking a little shamefaced. I would be very grateful if you could do some promotions for the hotel. Aiden felt great disappointment. He said, No way am I going to advertise your business for you. I think you should pray that this crowd doesn't do some damage. He patted the owner on the shoulder and left the room. Aiden went to visit Garrett Slater and Tyson Stiller in their room to try to get some peace. When Garrett heard about all the attention, he got an idea. Deputy Chairman, we should go to verify all our doctors' identities and credentials at their headquarters. It will give us a chance to hide from all these people who are after you while we're at it. The National Association was based in abundance. Aiden was not very interested, but Garrett was so excited about his plan that he ended up following him out of the door. Tyson refused the offer to join them, as he preferred to remain in his room and study. Garrett and Aiden slipped out of a back door without attracting any attention and walked north. In about 10 minutes, they arrived at the National Association HQ. Located in the northeastern corner of town, it was the tallest building at around 10 stories high. From the outside, it looked like a standard office building, but when they entered, they found a different world of activity, bright lighting and equipment. There was a row of counters on the first floor, manned by many staff members, all attending to the needs of long lines of people at each counter. Some lines were very long indeed, with up to a hundred people, while others only had a few people waiting. They couldn't find any attendant to guide them, so Aiden and Garrett decided to join one of the longest lines to see what was going on. Garrett said, I'll go up to the front of the line to see what's happening. He started to walk past the people queuing, but before he had gone very far, he was dragged back by a very strong hand. Stop, came the command. The young man raised his head high and with an arrogant expression walked past Garrett to the counter. Garrett stood in front of him and said angrily, We were here first. What do you think you're doing cutting in line? Why? Asked the big man who had pushed Garrett aside, laughing as he had just heard the funniest joke of all time. Well, boy, he is the son of Chairman Simon Regan. Garrett said, Chairman? Chairman of what? The big man said, The chairman of the Augusta Medical Association. Garrett stiffened with the insult, 
and everyone in the hall seemed to inhale sharply at the same time. One of the onlookers said, You mean the genius son of Simon Regan, Shane Regan? I have heard that he isn't even 18 years old, but he is already favored as a true prodigy of the chairman. Another said, He must have come to verify himself as a junior doctor of the association, but I heard he has been recognized as being at intermediate level. Am I right? Shane was enjoying hearing everyone whispering his praises. He said to Garrett, Get lost! I'm in a hurry. Garrett was dumbfounded at the way he was being treated. Aiden tapped him on the shoulder and motioned for him to stand behind him. Aiden looked straight at Shane. He said casually, Actually, we're in a hurry. Why don't you get lost? The man behind them said to his companion, Wow, he's being impudent. What right does he have to compare himself to an esteemed physician? He glared fiercely at Aiden. Another person in line said, This ought to be good. Some kid is standing up to Shane Regan. There should be some fireworks. Like many others watching on, he looked forward to seeing Aiden receive a humiliating takedown. In the world of medicine, everyone is equal, said Aiden calmly. He remained undeniably dignified. His measured tone escaped nobody's attention, and everyone fell into a somewhat uncomfortable silence. All of you, stop arguing, intervened the woman behind the counter. She tapped her pen impatiently on the counter and said to Aiden, You two wait patiently and let the doctor be certified first. Aiden turned to her and raised his voice unexpectedly. You can't tell me to do that, he shouted. You can't ignore the rules and push us aside. People are asked to line up in an orderly way for a good reason. You would have chaos here if people could just charge up to your counter whenever they felt like it. The woman didn't expect to hear Aiden be so blunt with her. After all, she was a member of the National Association, and she felt she deserved respect. No one had ever been so rude to her before. After her initial shock, she reacted angrily to herself. She said, You are making a fool of yourself! Not wanting to be outdone, Aiden replied, And you are derelict in your duty! Shane noticed that the atmosphere had become quite tense, and, eager to see Aiden and Garrett fail their certification, said, Okay, let them go first. I can't wait to see them fail. As she had been instructed by Shane, the receptionist tossed two forms to Aiden and Garrett. She said impatiently, Fill these in and take them to the identification room on the second floor for verification. Aiden had a quick look at the forms and noted the documentation they required. Under the interested gazes of a great many bystanders, he and Garrett walked up the stairs to the second floor, where the identification room stood isolated from the other offices. It was a very simple process. All they had to do was use the self-service verification machine in the room, and they would be certified. Aiden watched Garrett walk into the identification room with his documents. For some reason, he didn't follow him into the room, but remained outside, watching the stairs intently. As he expected, it wasn't long before he saw Shane Regan striding up to the second floor. When he saw Aiden waiting at the door, he sniffed. What's wrong? Are you afraid to enter in case you fail the verification? You're just trash. I don't see that a spoiled brat from an old entitled family who traded off his old man's fame and fortune has any right to call anyone else trash. Aiden replied sarcastically. We'll see, answered Shane. I'll settle with you when I'm finished with my verification. He opened the door and entered one of the booths. Shortly afterwards, Garrett emerged from the booth he had disappeared into earlier. He was holding a bronze pentagram and was looking very pleased with himself. On the East Coast, verified doctors were certified into various grades according to their ability, knowledge, and experience. The grades were Junior Doctor, represented by a bronze five-pointed star, Intermediate Doctor, who received two silver pentagrams, Senior Doctor, with three golden pentagrams, and the most prestigious, the Specialist, whose status was indicated by four purple stars. Nationally, there were said to be fewer than ten specialists. When Aiden saw Garrett's beaming smile and the bronze pentagram in his hand, he knew that he had passed the first stage of verification, which he had anticipated he would do easily. He was very talented and had been working with Aiden for some time, so his medical skills were improving all the time. It was to be expected that he would be certified at the junior level. 
Soon, Shane walked out of the room smiling. The smile disappeared from his face when he saw that Garrett was also holding a bronze star. He said, I don't know how you could be at the same level as me, kid. Care to compete with me again? What do you mean? said Garrett. How could we compete with each other? It's simple, replied Shane. Let's both try the next level. Do you dare take me on at the intermediate level? Garrett was at a loss for words. He had just scraped by at the junior level and knew he wouldn't pass the intermediate certification challenge. Suddenly, Aiden broke in. I'll compete with you, he said. You? said Shane, eyeing them both suspiciously. Sure, okay, why not? It makes no difference to me. With that, the three young men returned to the hall on the first floor. There was a ripple of admiring murmuring when the people who were waiting in the line saw Garrett's bronze star. The admiration turned to puzzlement when they saw Aiden and Shane approaching the counter for intermediate certification. The puzzlement turned quickly into an uproar. What? exclaimed a young woman at the junior counter. Don't tell me they're going to attempt intermediate certification. I would expect Shane to do okay, but I don't know about that other kid. The few people lining up at the intermediate counter quickly stood to one side to allow Shane to rudely grab his form from the receptionist and stride toward the third floor, where the intermediate verification process took place. At the intermediate level, the automatic process was accompanied by a manual certification challenge. I'll show you, Shane said to Aiden as he stomped up the stairs. Once he had disappeared up the first flight, Aiden didn't follow him to the intermediate counter. Instead, he approached the counter to its right-hand side. It was the counter for the certification of specialists, and in utter amazement, the entire hall watched him step up confidently to the clerk. The staff at the hall had never witnessed anything like that before. Aiden strode directly to the specialist certification counter accompanied by a cry of outrage and confusion. Some thought he was simply mistaken, while others thought he was attempting some kind of deflection. One onlooker said, he knows he won't be any sort of match for Shane Regan, so he's trying some kind of other face-saving shenanigans. He is bound to fail, so he will use that as his excuse. What a cheek! The staff member at the specialist counter was a middle-aged man who usually had very little to do. His expression was that of a bored and lazy office worker who wished that he could be somewhere else. He had almost forgotten what his role was. He had seen the two young men competing and said, Young man... I advise you to look elsewhere. You should leave and find a more suitable counter before you lose all of your credibility and self-respect. This is no place for the likes of you. My name is Aiden Dale. I am the vice chairman of the Arkland City Medical Association, said Aiden in a low, confident voice. Arkland City? said the clerk. Wait, did you say you're from Arkland City? His eyes widened as he recalled that he had heard a great deal about the vice chairman of the Arkland City Medical Association in recent days. He and his colleagues had spoken of little else but the association's triumph over the major associations at the National Conference. He had even heard that Caleb Richter, the dean of the Eastern Medical Authority, was personally acquainted with Aiden and had called on him personally. The man began to sweat nervously. Aiden said, Give me the form, please. The man felt a little more confident about handing the form over and said, The verification room is on the fifth floor. The onlookers were even more confused. They had not been able to hear the conversation, but they saw the clerk hand Aiden the form and watched as he walked off to the fifth floor. Some wanted to follow him and find out what was happening, but others scolded them and told them to stop snooping. Aiden made his way up the winding stairs to the fifth floor, which he found very quiet and occupied by only a single office. The room seemed very empty, although there were five large screens suspended from the ceiling in front of a single chair. There was no staff member to greet him, only an artificial electronic voice that crackled from the speakers on the screens. The specialist verification is conducted by five specialist doctors simultaneously. Please sit and await the remote connection. Aiden understood how the certification was going to be conducted and sat down. With the examination needing to be conducted by specialists who were located in all parts of the world, the process had to occur during an online meeting. Aiden would have to wait until the examiners could attend from their isolated locations. He sat patiently, waiting for the first examiner to appear on screen. 
It wasn't long before the center screen flickered to life, and Aiden saw the face on it was very familiar. Both he and the man on the screen exclaimed the same thing at the same time. What? Aiden saw the specialist on the screen was none other than Caleb Richter. Caleb was just as stunned as Aiden. He said, I thought I was here to verify a potential new specialist, but it turns out to be you. If that's the case, I don't think we need to verify any longer. I already have personal experience of your strength. To be honest, I think the title of specialist doesn't describe your amazing ability very accurately at all. Aiden was genuinely surprised by Caleb's declaration. Caleb noticed his expression and said, Don't think I am exaggerating. The fact that I am the first face you see on the screen confirms that I am a specialist myself. But even I have to admit that you are better than me. If I were you, I would feel that this process is unjust and unfair to you. Speaking of which, I haven't been in office for too long. Why don't you think about becoming the next president? He suggested. He intended it to be a lighthearted suggestion, but the more he thought about it, the more feasible it seemed. With Aiden's youth, strength, and practical attitude, if he was in charge of the general administration of the National Association, real change might finally be effected in the East Coast Medical Establishment. Although Aiden was taken aback by Caleb's confidence in him, he put his pleasant surprise to one side and waved his hand, saying, We can talk about that later. I still want to be verified today. If he was honest, he didn't want to take on any more roles, as he had many important functions to fulfill already and barely had any spare time. He was focused on becoming certified as a specialist to prove his point to Shane and support his friend Garrett. Caleb was left with no option but to continue the verification process. It wasn't long before the other four screens displayed the faces of four other respected specialist doctors. Each was at least 70 years old, although the oldest appeared to be at least 90. His face was very wrinkled, and he seemed to be incapable of doing anything other than lying back on a bed and looking at the screen. The others all greeted him very respectfully. Caleb looked quite concerned when he saw him and said, Hans Rennick, it's good to see you, but I'm worried that you might tire yourself out. Let me arrange for another specialist to come and take your place. The old man waved Caleb's concerns away. He looked weak and old in some respects, but his eyes were sharp and focused. I am perfectly all right, he said. I have heard that finally, after all this time, a doctor has come seeking specialist certification. I want to see what kind of genius he is. He peered at Aiden's face on the monitor. He said, isn't he a little too young? The furrows on his wrinkled brow deepened. The other three specialists also looked at Aiden oddly when they saw that he was at least 50 years younger than they were. It was most unusual. Aiden was unconcerned and waited calmly in his seat. Very well, we will begin, said Caleb. Aiden, let me introduce you. To your left is Howard Leith, who is well known for his spirit-restoring injections. To your right is Brian Latrobe, the developer of the five meridian transplant techniques now used in hospitals all around the world. I would like to make a special mention of Dr. Hans Rennick, our first president. He has cured thousands of patients and his reputation is impeccable. He is as well regarded as he is well loved. Dr. Hans Rennick, connection level plus one. After the introductions, Caleb smiled and said, please try to disregard Aiden's youth. I have personally witnessed his medical skills and I can assure you mine are inferior to his. The other doctors knew Caleb's reputation and professional expertise, and they knew that he would not exaggerate if it was unwarranted. Their interest was obviously piqued when they heard his recommendation. Dr. Hans Rennick said, We have always focused on practice that is based on sound theory. He looked fixedly at Aiden, and despite the barrier of the screens, Aiden felt the old man's gaze penetrate his soul. The old doctor announced, Well, young man, let us see your abilities. The electronic voice confirmed the assessment had commenced by announcing, The specialist applicant's identity has been approved. The certification process is underway. The first round will commence immediately. The tiles in front of Aiden's chair folded back with a metallic creak, and a virtual disease response simulator rose from a cavity under the floor. Aiden was a little worried when he saw that the screen was completely covered in densely typed questions about prescriptions and drug formulas. He felt as though he was once again participating in the competition that had just been completed, 
but the set of questions he was confronted with were far more complex and difficult. Medical Arts Grandmaster level activated. The host has been provided with the closest responses. Despite the extreme difficulty of the assignment, the automated process nevertheless had to be prepared for all possibilities that applicants might try to cheat. The five specialists were astounded at the scene that then unfolded on their screens. Aiden composed himself at the keyboard and began working. He typed rapidly, and to the astonishment of the doctors, he finished the entire set of questions in just a few minutes, without even stopping to rest. He sat back when he was finished, showing no signs of fatigue or distress. The electronic voice intoned, Comparing results with applicants' responses. Authorization complete. First round result, full marks. Completion time, 3 minutes and 59 seconds. Ranking history updated. Current result, shortest time on record. As the voice gave the results, a list of the 10 quickest times were displayed on the screen. Aiden's score was at the top of the list. He saw the familiar names of the men in front of him occupying some of the other nine places. Caleb's name appeared in 10th place at 4 hours, 39 minutes, and 6 seconds. In second place was the name of Hans Rennick at 20 minutes and 30 seconds. Aiden's result overtook the long-standing record. He had performed exceedingly well. The five specialist doctors smiled awkwardly. Caleb said, Perhaps we can now dispense with the display of the record times, gentlemen? What do you say? There was a general murmuring of agreement. Brian said, We have now seen how well you have performed at the theoretical level. We may have misjudged you initially. Please forgive us. All of the doctors now looked at Aiden with a newfound respect. His achievement in the first round of the assessment led them to regard him as much more their equal, at least with respect to his academic understanding. Hans regarded him somberly through the camera lens and said, Don't celebrate your success too soon. The next round is the most important part. The other specialists leaned forward in their seats, looking forward to the next part of the certification. The disembodied voice announced, The second round of specialist verification will begin shortly. From an opening in the floor next to the virtual disease response simulator, another machine rose and rested in front of Aiden's chair. It looked remarkably human, but was made of a silicone-like material that was incredibly realistic. It was possible to see veins through its translucent skin, and there were other markings such as acupuncture needle points and meridian markers printed faintly over the surface. Neural connections and other reference points to internal organs connected to each other in a complex web of colored lines that all led to an external data point at the heel. A cable extended from the heel of the model to the simulator, and a display port was connected to the large overhead monitors. According to the electronic voice that had been droning the rules and conditions for the assessment, every virtual action or operation that Aiden conducted on the mannequin would be recorded by the simulator and be displayed on the screens. The examiners could follow his procedures and ask questions as they felt it was necessary. Not only did Aiden have to respond to the challenges of the round, but he would need to justify and explain his actions as he made his decisions. The machine's display kept flashing random text until at last, the letters coalesced into a single task. It read, Diagnose and cure all diseases present in the patient. As soon as the assignment was presented, the appearance of the mannequin began to alter as the disease and conditions manifested themselves according to the challenge requirements. Some of the changes were quite obvious and profound, while others would have been difficult or impossible to detect with the naked eye. Aiden had to use all of his medical knowledge to detect each symptom that had been placed into the dummy and then propose cures and treatments. He would be provided with any other medical equipment he deemed necessary, such as scalpels or stethoscopes. He did not waste any time. He quietly sat down besides the silicone dummy and began carefully feeling its limbs and torso. It was really a cleverly made model and was very lifelike. As Aiden's aura entered its system, he noticed the same reaction as if he was examining a real person. Activation of Grandmaster Level Medical Arts Ability. Analyzing target conditions. Analysis complete. Principal diseases detected. Malaria, respiratory disease, lung poisoning, kidney stones, and congenital heart failure. Secondary disease detected. Anemia, general malaise, and hypothermia. Hidden disease, heavy metal toxicity. Aiden suppressed a smile. If the model had been a real person, 
they would have died long ago. Although there were a large number of serious illnesses in the test body, it was necessary that a specialist medical practitioner be able to detect any type of illness. He would need to accurately diagnose a large number of possibly misleading symptoms. There was an excellent reason that there were so few people able to reach this level of skill. The observing doctors permitted themselves a small smile as they recollected how they felt at their own certification examinations. They had already been surprised once by Aiden's temperament, and over the years, they had also witnessed many candidates curse and break down at this point in the assessment. It usually took some time for the would-be specialists to make their determinations, so the doctors settled back and thought about enjoying a cup of tea while they waited. However, no one had been able to so much as stand up from their seat before Aiden declared, All right, I'm ready. The five specialists were amazed. Are you finished already? asked Caleb. Aiden nodded. Caleb pressed him. Are you sure you have finished diagnosing everything? Aiden nodded again. Even Caleb, who had the utmost confidence in Aiden, had a look of disbelief on his face. Aiden shrugged and set about applying the miraculous recovery method to the test body. The doctors all stared open-mouthed in amazement at the technique he was using. Howard Leth gasped. Why, I haven't seen that technique for a generation, not since electrostimulation became commonplace. I think that looks like the kind of method practiced by Jonathan Shu for treating low-energy patients. How could Aiden have had a relationship with him, I wonder? Maybe he picked it up from working with the Snow family in Wilmington. This is incredible. I wonder what else this kid knows. Aiden worked with his eyes closed but his hands fluttered deftly across the body, adjusting and twisting the energy from his aura flowed so it flowed smoothly around its circulatory system. Soon, the interplay of his fingers, aura, and energy flow were all pulsing rhythmically around the body, and the display was gently pulsating with harmonized colors representing a healthy flow of fluids and life. The restoration of regular blood and oxygen flow meant that the major illnesses would soon be cured completely, and the minor matters that he had diagnosed would be easily treated. This young man is truly gifted, exclaimed old Dr. Rennick. He has combined massage techniques to alter the energy flows and administer his treatment with a unique amalgam of modern methods and traditional healing. It is genuinely the most creative and admirable. Aiden opened his eyes and slowly let out a breath. All right, I'm done, he said. He clapped his hands and stood up with a slight smile on his face. Healing test. Medical ability. Plus one. The experiment machine also began to verify the results. The results have been confirmed. All diseases in the experimental body have been fully recovered. The results of the test subject have been verified. Full marks. Past time, 19 minutes and 32 seconds. This is the shortest time on record. The record time has been updated. The five medical association representatives were in shock. Aiden hadn't lied. He had really cured the experimentation test body loaded with illness in such a short time. If they had been in Aiden's shoes, they never could have done it so perfectly and efficiently. They were in a great mood, as Aiden had impressed them once again. Data appeared on the five specialist screens. It was the recorded data that gave them a more in-depth look at the treatment Aiden had just performed. The five started asking questions. Aiden, can you tell me what the purpose of this treatment is? Aiden, is it true that this treatment can cure the patient's lung disease and energy deficiency at the same time? Wonderful! Aiden, let me ask you, what is the biggest problem you face when performing this kind of energy transfer? They went on and on. The five specialists seemed to have forgotten they were the examiners. Instead, they were discussing medical skills with Aiden. They went from curiosity to sharing advice and they were even asking for advice. Aiden also seized this rare opportunity and learned a lot from them. Participating in the top medical exchange meet, medical skills, plus one. Sunlight from the window got in Aiden's eyes. He looked up and frowned. How is it already so late, he thought. He was having a wonderful chat with the five big shots, but before he knew it, it was almost noon. Although he didn't want to pass up this opportunity, Aiden knew Garrett was still waiting for him downstairs. Also, he had to send Poppy and the others off that afternoon. Seeing Aiden's sudden change of behavior, the five specialists also realized that they had allowed time to slip away. They smiled and shook their heads, sorry that the conversation had to end. One of them sighed and said, 
It has been a long time since I had such a hearty discussion about medicine. Today's meeting was certainly not in vain. The senior doctor looked Aiden deep in the eye. A smile finally bloomed on his stony face. With your help, there is hope for the advancement of medicine on the East Coast. There is hope. He showered Aiden with praise and ended the meeting looking satisfied. The other specialists said goodbye to Aiden, one after another. When only Caleb Richter was left, still on the screen, Aiden asked, So, did I pass the certification? Caleb rolled his eyes and asked, What do you think? Then he nodded his head and sighed. As the youngest qualified specialist in history, who isn't even 20 years old, your status is truly enviable. Then he cut off the video connection. The machine said, Congratulations, Aiden, for passing all specialist tests. Please bring this certificate to the sixth floor to receive your exclusive specialist stars. Aiden took the certificate that the machine had printed and headed to the sixth floor. In the hallway on the first floor, Shane Regan proudly waved two silver stars in front of Garrett. You degenerate, do you see this? This says I'm better than you. A crowd in the hallway surrounded Shane Regan and jealously admired the five-pointed stars in his hand. Silver stars were the symbol of an intermediate medical association doctor. Shane had successfully passed the intermediate test. He had become a mid-level medical association doctor. Achieving such a status at such a young age meant his future was limitless. Many apprentices surrounded him to congratulate him. They had only hoped that he would take one last look at them before he moved on. He looked at Garrett with a mocking expression and asked, Where is your shameless companion? I haven't seen him for so long. Did he run away with his tail between his legs? Garrett clenched his fists tightly and said, He went to get verified as a specialist. Huh? Shane was stunned for a moment, but then he burst into uncontrollable laughter. <laughs> him? A specialist? He laughed so hard that tears came to his eyes. If he's a specialist... I'll eat my lab coat. On the top floor of the tower, the old bell that hadn't rung in ages rang out loudly. The sound was like thunder as it rolled across the sky above the entire town of abundance. Everyone in the town looked up, confused. Shane's laughter stopped abruptly. He wasn't happy to be interrupted. He frowned and asked, Where did that come from? Shut up! The staff member behind the specialist's counter roared angrily and reprimanded him. You don't know anything! That bell only rings when a new specialist is inducted into the association. Shane looked down and muttered to himself, No way, is this really happening? The staff member didn't seem to be joking. He left the counter and ran upstairs. When the people in the hallway heard what he said, they were stunned and started to chatter. A new specialist? Is it really that kid? No, it can't be, right? How could that kid be a specialist? Impossible. Shane shook his head and chuckled in disbelief. Then the sound of footsteps came from the second floor, interrupting his dry laughter. He looked up, and the staff member who had just gone upstairs was welcoming and fawning over someone who was on their way downstairs. It was none other than Aiden, whom Shane had previously been looking down on. After Aiden came downstairs, he walked right up to Shane. Everyone's eyes, including Shane's, were focused on the four stars on Aiden's chest. They were ordinary shapes, but their color was especially brilliant. They were more spectacular than Shane's silver stars and even more noble than the association's golden stars. Only specialists were awarded purple stars. The crowd erupted with discussion. He passed the specialist certification? Oh my God, so he's the new specialist? Most of those present had never seen a specialist in person before. They were amazed at how young he was. Garrett joined Aiden and gave him an enthusiastic thumbs up. He couldn't find the words to express his excitement and worship. Don't be a bully and don't look down on people, Aiden advised Shane expressionlessly. Shane glared at the four purple stars on Aiden's chest, but he couldn't accept what he was seeing. He couldn't look up to someone he had always mocked. This can't be true, he said. Then his eyes turned red as he roared. Where did you get these stars? The staff member who had greeted Aiden shook his head and sneered. Doctor, you have lost your mind. Then he explained. Each specialist's five-pointed stars are customized on the sixth floor. They have exclusive markings. If you don't believe me, you can take a closer look. Everyone squinted to see the four identical markings on each of the stars on Aiden's chest. 
the purple stars indeed bore exclusive markings, proving he was a specialist. The engraving was a one-of-a-kind made with an inimitable technique. After confirming that the stars were genuine, the crowd in the hallway burst into an even more enthusiastic uproar. Those who had congratulated Shane went over to Aiden, praising him and even asking for autographs. Shane nearly blacked out from shock. Then he overheard someone whisper from the crowd, A moment ago, I heard someone say that he would eat his lab coat if this happened. He became even more embarrassed and angry. He still couldn't believe this was really happening. Two different things offended him at once. Aiden becoming the center of attention, and everyone around Shane deserting him. He looked embarrassed. Then, an aged and dignified figure entered the hallway. Dad? Shane's eyes lit up when he saw his father, the chairman of the Augusta Medical Association. The beautiful receptionist whom Aiden had reprimanded was still angry and embarrassed about their argument. To get even with him, she had privately summoned the chairman. Shane's father was a leader of the medical community. In terms of status, he wasn't much lower than a specialist. In fact, he had more power than specialists in some respects. Shane thought he might be able to save face with the help of his father. The crowd quieted down when they saw Simon. They assumed he was there for his son. He walked with a cane and went through the crowd, giving perfunctory nods as greetings. The expression of the staff member from earlier changed as he welcomed Simon. But before he could say a word, the chairman banged his walking stick on the ground forcefully. His expression turned cold as he said, I heard someone has a problem with my son Shane and is deliberately making things difficult for him. Simon shouted at the staff member, Who exactly is this guy messing with my son? Call him here so I can see him. I'm sorry, said the staff member. I can't do it. Why? Ahem, <clears throat> because he is... Before he could finish his sentence, Aiden was already standing in front of Simon. Because you're talking about me, Aiden said, smiling meaningfully. Chairman, we have met again. When Simon saw Aiden's face, his pupils contracted. Then he saw the purple stars on Aiden's chest and he almost dropped his walking stick. So you're the new specialist? He took a deep breath. Are you surprised? Aiden asked. Is it strange to see someone succeed despite your interference? Seeing the coldness in Aiden's eyes sent a chill down Simon's spine. In the conference, he and Chairman Brendan Neal from Providence had voted against their will because they had been bribed by Pippa O'Connor and the chairman from New York. He had already offended Aiden once. Aiden's friendship with Caleb Richter, along with his new specialist status, meant that if Aiden wanted to settle the score, Simon would definitely be in big trouble. If Aiden told Caleb about what happened today, he would not be happy either. And to make matters worse, Shane had also offended Aiden. Simon gritted his teeth and hit his son with his cane. You insubordinate numbskull! I'll put you in your place, he yelled. The sudden pain shocked Shane. He held his ribs and shouted at his father. He's just a specialist, why are you so scared? Dummy, you still dare to provoke me? Shaking in anger, Simon pointed at Aiden and said, he is a deputy chairman of the Arkland City Medical Association and can be considered your superior. You don't even have the slightest bit of respect for your own father. Have you learned nothing from me? Clearly, he is gifted with divine talent, but you turn a blind eye to it. As your father, I'm going to do something I should have done a long time ago. He raised his cane again threateningly. Shane retreated from his angry father, wailing in pain. The crowd was curious about what Simon had just said about Aiden's rank in the association. They started to chatter. Is Dr. Dale really the vice chairman of the Arkland City Medical Association? The team who won the medical competition? I heard their vice chairman's name is Dale. When they realized Aiden was both a vice chairman and a specialist, they admired him even more. Those who had just laughed at Aiden with Shane were so ashamed that they wanted to crawl into a hole. The receptionist who had alerted Simon to the ruckus in the hallway hid behind the counter. She knew she had made a terrible mistake and was afraid Aiden would have her fired. Aiden looked at the father and son and shook his head. Then he turned to his friend and said, Garrett, you know something? Two wrongs don't make a right. Let's get out of here. The father and son had lost all face at the hospital. Garrett, who looked relieved, had left with Aiden. Garrett had witnessed Aiden in action and his respect for him rose to another level. He was especially excited that Aiden had passed the specialist's test. 
Ever since the Arkland City Medical Association had been established, there had never been a doctor of this level. Other associations had always looked down on them for this reason. But now that Aiden had become a specialist, the Arkland City Medical Association could finally hold their heads high. Garrett couldn't wait to tell them about this. They arrived at the west exit of the town. Poppy Hansen and the others had been waiting to meet them there for a while. Seeing Aiden and Garrett arrive late, Jenna Shu pouted and asked, What did you two do wrong? Ahem. Garrett proudly pointed at the bronze star on his chest and said, Look at this. Huh? You guys went to get certified as medical doctors? Jenna was surprised at first, but then she instinctively looked at Aiden's chest. When she saw the four luxurious purple five-pointed stars, she screamed excitedly. A specialist? She ran to Aiden and touched the stars. She carefully felt their texture and looked intoxicated as she asked, I'm not dreaming, am I? Do we really have a specialist on our team? Anita's eyes lit up as she looked at Aiden with admiration. Garrett froze and his jaw dropped after everyone's attention shifted from him to Aiden. Then, he shamefully said, I shouldn't have stood next to Aiden. Poppy saw Aiden and the others enjoying themselves and felt content. Then, she sighed and admitted, I really envy their lives. Rex said in a deep voice, Princess, don't forget what kind of responsibility we bear. Do I need you to remind me? Of course I know that. I'm just envious. Hmm. Poppy rolled her eyes at Rex and his forehead broke out in a cold sweat. Then a young man in strange leather armor ran into the town as fast as a leopard. Aiden looked at the young man and a light bulb went off in his head. Only people from Little Nook dressed like this. Aiden was vaguely aware that someone had been secretly protecting Poppy for the last few days, but he had no conflict with them, so he wasn't concerned. He thought this guy in leather must be someone who was protecting her. Anita seemed to recognize him and asked, Spencer? Spencer only glanced at Anita before he went up to Poppy anxiously. Panting, he said, Princess, someone broke into Little Nook and captured a bunch of people to interrogate them about your whereabouts. Please, please find a safe place to hide. What? She couldn't believe her ears. Poppy, Rex, and Anita's expressions turned to panic. Rex grabbed the young man and asked, How many bandits are there? What exactly is their background? Did they ask for help from the people of the Verdant Plains? I don't dare to get too close. I'm afraid I'll be discovered. I won't even be able to warn anyone, Spencer said, shedding tears. From a distance, I saw the mayor and everyone else had been tied up by the bandits. I also saw them send people to the Verdant Plains. I'm afraid... He couldn't continue, as he kept crying. Poppy and the others all had bitter expressions. The criminals had taken over Little Nook so quickly, and they still had the strength to suppress the Verdant Plains. Clearly, they had come prepared. Did you see who their leader was? Aiden asked. Spencer replied, I didn't see her face. I only saw that she's a tall woman who was dressed in black. Black clothes, a woman, Aiden thought. His heart skipped a beat. He wondered if it could be who he thought. What a coincidence that would be. Spencer continued. Also, I saw a doctor with her, and he didn't look like he was being coerced. Do you know who the doctor was? Aiden asked. Jerry Henderson, and he's from our town, Spencer answered. Aiden remembered this name. When the New York City Medical Association had come to Arkland City to challenge them, Jerry had been working as Dr. Winston's apprentice. He had tried to get Anita to betray them, using their shared background. Anita's face turned pale and she uttered, The town is heavily guarded, and their technology is advanced. Only people who live in that town know about it. She suspected that Little Nook wouldn't have fallen so easily unless there had been a spy in the town. At least they had figured out who the spy was. Jerry had clearly betrayed them. What should I do? Poppy anxiously paced back and forth with a worried expression, while Anita trembled in fear. Just when the two women seemed to be completely overwhelmed, a voice boomed out beside them. I'll come back to the town with you to investigate the situation. It was Aiden. Stunned, Poppy and Anita at the same time shook their heads and said, No, this has nothing to do with you. They didn't want to let Aiden get involved in a dangerous situation that had nothing to do with him. Don't speak so quickly. Maybe it does have something to do with me, Aiden said, and smiled as though he knew something they didn't. Poppy gritted her teeth and said, But even you wouldn't be able to help. No, princess. I think he's the only one who can help us. Even with me and the other profound fighters in the mountains, we need all the help we can get, Rex said. 
He rarely refuted Poppy. He inclined his head to Aiden and said, My friend, please help us. I'll never forget your great kindness. Poppy was still conflicted. She didn't know Aiden's strength like Rex did. She had never personally seen Aiden in action. Did you forget that I have a friend? Aiden asked with a smile. Poppy's eyes lit up. She finally agreed. If that old man is willing to help, we can try. Don't worry, he'll definitely listen to me, Aiden said confidently. In that case, there's no time to lose. Spencer, lead the way, Poppy ordered. Although Spencer didn't understand why he had to return to the danger zone, seeing that Poppy had made up her mind, he was willing to face death for her. Poppy, Rex, and Anita didn't hesitate to follow Spencer. Garrett and Jenna were stunned by the situation, so Aiden had them return to the town to wait. Then he followed the others. They didn't have time to rent a car, so they ran to the west. Aiden was the fastest among them. He was light-footed and used to running. Spencer and Rex followed closely behind but couldn't believe how fast Aiden was. There was no way they could keep up with him. Poppy and Anita fell way behind, panting as they tried to keep up, but they fell further and further behind the more they tried. Then Aiden saw them struggling. He doubled back to pick them both up and started running again. Amazingly, his speed wasn't affected. His adrenaline was flowing, and he ran faster and faster. By the time Aiden set Poppy and Anita down at the entrance of the verdant plains, his face was red with exertion. Anita was also blushing, but for very different reasons. Once again, she found herself impressed with Aiden's strength. After a few minutes, Rex and Spencer arrived, panting. They looked at Aiden like he was a monster, and Spencer said with a look of worship, Seeing your terrifying speed, I think our town can be saved. Seeing that everyone had arrived, Aiden ordered them. When we get there, all of you stay behind me and do what I say. They nodded enthusiastically. Aiden took a deep breath. Then they went down the path and carefully observed their surroundings. The entire town of Little Nook was silent because everyone living there had been captured and brought to the town square. Everyone, regardless of age or gender, had been tied up with strong ropes and tied to pillars. A group of roughly 30 people in black was guarding them carefully. Similar to Poppy's friends in the Verdant Plains, these strong men were far taller than the average person. Their leader was a tall woman, and her appearance was extraordinary. She wore simple black clothes, but they couldn't cover her expressive body language. Her slender fingers gently played with a long strand of hair, and there was an impatient look in her eyes. Aiden would definitely be able to recognize her. It was Tamsin Dupree, who had eluded him several times, and the chubby young man beside her was Jerry. Despite their situation, the people of Little Nook weren't panicking. Instead, they were cursing their captors nonstop, particularly Jerry. Jerry, you traitor! Jerry, this is your birthplace! You wouldn't be alive without this town! Is this how you repay us? Jerry, you sabotaged your own hometown! You sold out your friends and family to the enemy. You can go to hell. Indifferently, Jerry allowed them to berate him. He could tolerate it until a middle-aged woman angrily scolded him. Then his expression finally changed. Mom, don't blame me. It wasn't easy to become the apprentice of Dr. Winston, and then he had an accident. He tried to explain himself, but didn't dare to look at his mother's eyes. He gritted his teeth and looked away. Is that why you betrayed the town? Asked the mayor of Little Nook. He was the well-built middle-aged man Aiden had met before. Jerry's words had angered him. Our top priority for generations has been to protect the princess and the mountain folk. For your own selfish ambitions, you not only betrayed the princess, but also betrayed the entire town of Little Nook. Before your father died, when he helped you get into medical school, he hoped you would become an indomitable hero. But look at yourself now. What happened to you? Jerry's face turned pale green from the mayor's words, and he was ashamed of himself. Brooks, Jerry made the right choice, Tamsin Dupree said. She yawned and smiled at the mayor. As the saying goes, a wise man knows the time. Why would you risk your life to protect that kid? Speaking of the princess, am I not a princess? Then Jerry said, and speaking of the mountain folk, aren't these guys behind me mountain people? Shut up, you traitorous low-hanging branch! said Mayor Brooks Grayson. Then he spat on the ground and asked, If it wasn't for you, traitors, how could we end up like this? What do you mean? What low branch? Jerry's face turned pale. He looked at Tamsin with confusion in his eyes. 
Idiot. You don't even know when you're being used by someone, Brooks yelled. Then he looked at Jerry with disdain and started to spell it out for him. What is a branch? What do people use a tree to represent? Tamsin wasn't angry at all. She said casually, I won't mention what happened. I just want to say the tree you speak of has become stronger now. With a 17-year-old kid in charge, the best that the family can do is to hide in the verdant plains and struggle to survive. Times change. If we represent the tree, what can you do to me? Brooks shouted righteously. If your reputation is no good, then your word is no good. No matter what you do, you can't erase the brand of a traitor that you carry in the depth of your soul. Pedantic! Ridiculous! Tamsin waved at the burly men behind her. She said, Since you guys aren't willing to tell me where the princess is, I'll destroy your town and burn up your verdant plains. Let's see how long she can hide. Seeing the men light up torches, the people from Little Nook finally began to panic. You can only watch as the things you hold dear burn to ashes, Tamsin yelled. Then she turned and ordered, Do it! The mountain men obediently threw the torches at the wooden houses in the town. If they caught fire, the consequences would be serious. But just as the villagers' eyes were bugging out of their heads in fear, a wild wind came out from nowhere, forcing them to squint. The torches that were flying in the air were actually blown back from the sky by the demonic wind. On top of that, a water column rose out of the well at the entrance of the town. The water exploded into the air like a dragon, extinguishing the torches. The villagers saw what happened and muttered to themselves, Is... is this a miracle? Tamsin and the brawny men were angry when they saw this. Then an emotionless voice said, Anyone who acts rashly will die. Along with this cold voice, someone slowly approached from the town entrance. At that moment, all eyes in the town were on the young man at the entrance. Aiden! Tamsin was so angry that she gnashed her teeth. Are you here to ruin my plans again? He had used a combination of the Blade Ridge and Universal Pride styles to extinguish the torches. He shrugged and said, It's impolite not to reciprocate. I'm just here to pay you back for what you did at the Temple of the Five Elements. Tamsin angrily asked again, Why are you really here? Aiden replied in the same frivolous tone, Maybe I sensed that a witch had come back to stir up trouble again. He had expected trouble with her ever since the shield had informed him that Tamsin was moving to New York, and he had prepared. At first, he had suspected that she would come after him, but then he could see her target was Little Nook and the surrounding mountains. But no matter whether she was after Poppy and Anita or wanted to settle a grudge against Aiden, he could not ignore the threat Tamsin posed. The people of Little Nook were dumbfounded. Many of them had seen Aiden, and some had even mistreated him. They would never have expected him to be the one who would save them. Then a few others appeared behind Aiden. The captives shouted excitedly when they saw Poppy and the others. Princess! And Spencer? Anita? Tamsin's attention turned to Poppy the moment she appeared. Fifth princess, we finally meet. Tamsin's way of addressing Poppy stunned Aiden. He wondered if Poppy's name could be Fifth Princess, or if Tamsin was addressing the Fifth Princess. He wondered if this could be a title she wanted to claim. Poppy carried herself with the kind of dignity that no other girl her age typically possessed. Standing up straight, she said, Tamsin, this branch of yours has already been expelled from the family by my father. It no longer has anything to do with the family. Why did you come to hurt my people and invade our territory? Aiden paid close attention and tried to remember all of the information in their conversation. He realized he had accidentally gotten involved in what appeared to be a very tangled family affair. Hmm, you know the answer, Tamsin coldly said. Give me that thing and I'll let them go. That thing is the symbol of the family. I can't give it to a traitor like you, Poppy fearlessly replied. Tamsin gritted her teeth and hesitantly looked at Aiden. If he hadn't been there, she would have ordered someone to take the item from Poppy by force. But she didn't have the confidence to fight Aiden, even if there were 30 people behind her. And those men could sense something was wrong. They clenched their fist and prepared to defend their leader. But she hurriedly stopped them. Don't be impulsive. You can't match him. She had seen Aiden's terrifying martial arts skills at the Temple of the Five Elements. She knew that even though her men were strong, they were still no match for him. Boss, we can feel his strength, said one of the big men. He looked sad but determined. But 
Even if we die here, we have to protect you and bring you to safety. Tamsin stared at Poppy for a long time and finally said, Fifth Princess, I've already sent people up the mountain. The people there are your loyal guards. If you don't want anything to happen to them, give that thing to me. Poppy's face turned pale as she worriedly looked in the direction of the mountain and saw a huge object rolling down the path. A big man dressed in black rolled down the mountain like a ball. He howled in pain after he stopped rolling. Tamsin and her people were surprised when they saw who the man was. What happened on the mountain? Tamsin asked in a panic. She had sent him to the top. There is... Before he could finish, several of his comrades also tumbled down the mountain path. Every one of them seemed to have been kicked. They were bruised and swollen. Then, an old man as strong as a bear jumped down from the path. When he landed, his feet stomped a big hole in the ground. Crazy old man! Poppy excitedly greeted the strong old man. Tamsin, on the other hand, looked at him in shock. Martial arts expert Buster Sawyer? Why do you want to help Fifth Princess? She knew that her men had been thwarted by Buster. Ha ha ha! With a smile, Buster touched Poppy's nose and said, I happen to owe her a favor. I'm here to pay her back. When Buster arrived, other tall men ran over from the path to protect Poppy. They were her mountain friends. Facing just Aiden was already enough to make Tamsin feel helpless. But with the appearance of Buster Sawyer, followed by Poppy's guards, despair rose in her heart. Still, she didn't want to pass up this great opportunity. Tamsin said, Buster, you have paid back your favor. Why don't we talk about business? Help me deal with Aiden. You can name the reward. I heard that you like martial arts books. Well, I have several lost martial arts manuals in my collection. Buster's eyes lit up at first. Then, he made a sad face and said, Miss, it's too bad you're late. I'm Aiden's bodyguard now. And bodyguards don't fight their bosses. A bodyguard? Tamsin was so shocked that she almost bit her tongue. She looked at Aiden. She had no idea how he had convinced the legendary Buster Sawyer to become his bodyguard. With Buster's response, the hope in Tamsin's heart turned to dust. She finally realized that as long as Aiden was around, she couldn't accomplish anything. If anyone was her nemesis, it was him. Attack! Cover the boss and retreat! A strong man beside Tamsin roared and led a group of people to charge at Aiden and the others without fear of death. At the same time, a small group of them pulled Tamsin aside and hurriedly retreated. Aiden narrowed his eyes and waved his hand. He executed a Blade Ridge attack and created a strong wind that blew away the men in black. They were scattered and, with Aiden's help, it was easy for Poppy's people to take them down one by one. When Aiden looked more closely using his discerning ability, he could see that these men were very similar to Rex and used roughly the same fighting style. What did Rex call himself before? They must be the so-called profound fighters, he thought, observing them carefully. Unlike other martial artists, these warriors were able to selectively send their energy to certain parts of their bodies. When they wanted to use their fists, they could send energy there and end up with enhanced fist strength. Similarly, if their feet were needed as weapons in a battle, they could direct power there. Anytime such reinforced body parts collided, the sound was deafening. It's not as elegant as the style of a martial artist, but it's certainly effective, Aiden concluded. Observing profound fighters' battle skills, gaining insight into skills, comprehension ability, plus one. Although he was curious about the profound fighters' combat style, he knew he didn't have the time to study them carefully just then. Once he saw that the situation was under control, he sighed with relief and turned to chase after Tamsin. Hey, I want to go too! Buster exclaimed with a smile. Aiden nodded, and they both headed off. The men who had taken off with Tamsin were heading west, and they had left behind a rear guard to deal with any pursuit attempts, but that didn't slow Aiden down for long. It only took him and Buster a few minutes to incapacitate their opponents and catch up with Tamsin's group. The men immediately surrounded her, but like their fellow fighters, they didn't stand much of a chance. When the last warrior had been dealt with, Tamsin was left standing alone. She stared at Aiden with a hostile expression, but it appeared like she had given up on running. I need to ask you something, Aiden said as he approached her slowly. All those years ago, did you have something to do with what happened to the Four Masters? After talking with Governor Moe, 
He had found out that Maya's grandfather, Val Moon, and Bailey's father, Will Regatta, had both been harmed by the same force that Tamsin often used in her missions. I need to know if she was involved, so I can tell Maya and Bailey, he thought, frowning. Before Tamsin had a chance to reply, alarm bells suddenly went off in his head, and he staggered backward as a wall of blackness rushed toward him. It was as if a flood of dark ink had been poured from the sky, and it was behaving as if it were alive. The ink transformed continuously, taking on the shape of different animals, including a wolf and a tiger. The tiger lunged toward Aiden's face as if to bite him, but he didn't panic in the face of the attack. Discovering water attribute, black ink brush, martial arts ability, plus one, comprehension ability, plus one. Realizing that ink was mostly water, he used his enhanced abilities to dissolve the ink beast with the smooth motion of his hands. As soon as the animals had disappeared, and he could see again, Aiden noticed an old man standing next to Tamsin. He was wearing a green coat, and his long white hair was being held back from his face by a black scarf. He was holding a large silver paintbrush in his right hand that was still dripping with black ink. So he's the one who attacked me just now, Aiden thought, examining the man closely. He looks quite elegant, and his clothing is impeccable. I wonder who he is. The old man put away the brush and gave Aiden a respectful nod. Nothing personal, young man, but I need to take her with me. He said in a deep voice as he grabbed Tamsin's hand and started running. He was very fast, covering hundreds of yards in a few seconds. Before she disappeared, Tamsin turned to look at Aiden and mouthed something he couldn't make out at first. Activating the beginner level lip reading ability. Reading. A long time to come. Aiden was confused. Rubbing his chin, he muttered, What does she mean by that? Aiden decided not to chase them. I have no idea who that old man is or how strong he might be, he reasoned. And besides, it may be a good thing to let Tamsin leave. The shield will keep an eye on her, and the next time she acts, I'll know about it in advance. I'll figure out her secrets sooner or later. While he was still pondering the events, Buster caught up to him and looked around thoughtfully. Was that who I think it was? He asked cryptically, having caught sight of the old man's retreating back. You recognized him? Aiden asked curiously, glancing at Buster. Yes, I fought him once before. He's called the Silver Painter, Buster replied. He's a self-taught cultivator who doesn't belong to any sect, but I heard that he died a few years ago. The Silver Painter? That title really fits him, Aiden replied. And he's quick on his feet. If I hadn't reacted as fast as I did, he would have tricked me with his attack. I'm not sure why he intervened, but he's obviously a martial arts master so I think I need to reevaluate Tamsin's connections and their strength. Buster nodded, and together they headed back to Little Nook, taking with them the men who had been guarding Tamsin. When they arrived, it was immediately clear that the townspeople had everything under control. The men in black were being held captive in the town square by a few guards who were heavily armed. Aiden handed over his prisoners, and they joined the rest of the group while he walked over to Poppy, who was standing at one side of the square next to a tall man. Right. That's the mayor, Aiden thought, taking in the man's official-looking suit. Well, what should we do with them? The man asked Poppy, and all the men in black turned their heads to look at her. Aiden noted their expressions, which were a mixture of dislike, respect, and sadness. Poppy sighed and replied, They're all connected to us, friends and relatives, so how can I punish them? They made some bad choices in the past, but hopefully today will be a lesson for them. Turning to the men in black, she said, Get out of here, all of you, and don't ever show your faces around here again. Everyone stared at her in surprise and disbelief. The man next to her wanted to say something, but she interrupted curtly. Look, they didn't bring any weapons, and they didn't hurt any of us. Aiden had also noticed the same thing. Although the men accompanying Tamsin had looked very fierce, their attack had been relatively nonviolent. They had scrupulously avoided excessive force, and neither side had suffered any casualties, despite the extent of the conflict. With a sigh, the tall man next to Poppy turned to the people standing guard and called out, Right, you heard what she said, so make way for these folks to leave. The crowd obediently parted and the guards reluctantly let the men in black go. Before they left, the men briefly waved to Poppy in a gesture of gratitude and then departed down the hill without a backward glance. Poppy's expression was conflicted as she watched them leave, but then, 
she noticed that another figure who had just waved to her was trying to follow the men in black. She opened her mouth to speak, but just then, the tall man next to her exclaimed, Jerry, you traitor! Where do you think you're going? Jerry stopped dead in his tracks at the sound of the man's voice and looked around nervously. When he saw a few rifles aimed at his chest, his face turned white as snow. Jerry was taken away in short order. What's going to happen to him? Aiden asked curiously. Judging from Jerry's pale face, he was not looking forward to whatever punishment awaited him. Oh, he'll be penalized according to the town charter, the tall man replied, adding, By the way, I'm Brooks Grayson, town mayor. Aiden shook the man's extended hand while wondering whether the mayor was related to Anita. As if on cue, Anita stormed over to the mayor and flung her arms around him, exclaiming, Oh, Daddy, that was such a tense situation. I'm so glad you're okay. Brooks looked at his daughter with a gentle smile and replied, Of course I'm okay. You know I've got the best luck in the world and nothing bad ever happens to me. Then, a look of confusion crossed his face and he asked, But why did you come back here in the first place? Anita wiped the tears from her eyes and pulled Brooks over toward Aiden. With a serious expression, she said, Aiden, this is my father, Mayor Grayson of Little Nook. And Dad, this is the friend whom I'd mentioned to you on the phone. Ah, so this is the guy, the mayor exclaimed with a laugh. I don't know how many times my daughter has sung your praises, young man. If she didn't keep on calling you her friend, I would have suspected that she had found a boyfriend. Anita's face turned bright red at his words, and she said with a roll of her eyes, Dad, if you keep saying stuff like this, I won't be calling you in the future. Brooks chuckled good-naturedly and replied, Oh yes, it's your old dad's fault. Then he turned to Aiden and said, If I had known you were the good friend that Anita keeps talking about, we wouldn't have had the misunderstanding that day. If you hadn't helped, the consequences would have been dire. Please allow me to express my gratitude on behalf of everyone in Little Nook. Aiden smiled and replied, Well, Tamsin and I have some unfinished business, so there might be similar situations in the future. We will take action no matter what. Then he turned to look at Poppy, who still seemed to be a bit upset, and said, I'm very curious about your relationship with Tamsin, fifth princess. Poppy returned his gaze evenly and replied, I can tell you all about it, but we need a quiet place to talk. Turning to Brooke, she asked, Mayor Grayson, can you find somewhere where we won't be disturbed? Yes, you can go to my office, he replied. Nobody will bother you there. It's right this way. He led them into a spacious office in a nearby building and closed the door. Aiden and Poppy sat down at a small table next to the mayor's desk and sipped on the coffee the mayor's assistant had brought in. After a few minutes, Poppy broke the silence by saying, So as you heard, my title is Fifth Princess, but I still prefer Poppy. Then I'll call you Poppy going forward, Aiden replied, taking in her uncomfortable expression. Then he added lightly, Anyway, a title is just another name. Poppy was surprised at his reaction and she smiled gratefully. Thank you, she said, turning to look out the window. Aiden could tell she was trying to figure out how much to tell him, so he waited while she made up her mind. Finally, she turned to face him again and began to tell her story. I'll try to keep it as short as possible, she began. My people, my family among the mountain people, are called the Fifth Family, and we originally lived in a place that was quite isolated. As a result, we developed our own internal system of governance, with hierarchies and leaders. Brooks and his family have worked for us for many years as guards and retainers. She took a breath before she continued. As for me, I'm the daughter of the family, which is why they call me the fifth princess. 